Lord of the Mysteries 2, Audiobook, Part 13 Chapter 301, Devil Criminal Pathway Lumian began to recall the contents of Aurora's grimoires. Sequence 9 criminal possessed a formidable physique, sharp senses, and a range of criminal skills. They were adept at wielding various weapons and could even kill their targets using something as mundane as a spoon. Sequence 8 cold-blooded were heartless and inhuman. Their bodies were further strengthened, and they gained mastery over spell-like abilities with a leaning towards the eviler domains. Different cold-blooded excelled in different aspects, making them challenging opponents to deal with with no one-size-fits-all solution. Sequence 7 serial killer was well-versed in devilish knowledge and rituals. They could summon projections of devils from the abyss and had a sick fascination with creating serial murders. Turning to Madame Magician with a thoughtful expression, Lumian inquired, what are the names of Sequence 6 and Sequence 5 on the criminal pathway? Sequence 6 is called Devil, and Sequence 5 is Desire Apostle, Madame Magician readily shared her knowledge. From worshipping the devil to becoming one, a fitting name for the devil pathway. And Desire Apostle sounds like a beyonder who would follow the mother tree of desire. It's a compatible match. They might as well rename it to Mother Tree of Desire Apostle. Lumian couldn't help but criticize as he analyzed the information. Madam Magician continued, the first major qualitative transformation of the criminal pathway is at sequence 6 devil. After the corresponding beyonder temporarily transforms into a devil, not only will their strength, speed, and defense improve, but they become immune to most poisons and acquire a certain resistance to curses and flames. More importantly, they possess malicious perception. If someone can cause fatal damage to them in a short period of time and begin to take steps to make it a reality, and both parties are within the range of their abilities, the devil beyonder can sense the source of danger in the perpetrator. This allows them to take targeted revenge in a counter-strike. So powerful. Lumian couldn't help but frown. If the Rose School of Thought's subsequent operations had members of the devil families involved, the situation would become exponentially more dangerous. Of course, the prisoner pathway's zombie and wraiths were also terrifying. Most importantly, at a certain sequence, beyonders of these two pathways boasted formidable defenses against flames. Damn it, pyromaniacs would be in for a rough time. Lumian made a self-deprecating comment, infected by Franca's and Jenna's vulgarities. After pondering for a moment, Lumian inquired, how short can the period of time be for the malicious perception to be effective? Madam Magician smiled and replied, the devil pathway is highly individualistic. Devils from various races each possess their distinct abilities. Even among devils originating from the same race, differences arise due to their individual nature. The reason behind this lies in the requirement of ostentatious malice, which varies from person to creature. Unique wills, distinct hearts, and a penchant for desires all amalgamate to form the diverse nature of devils. Now, to your query. Some devils can sense malice merely minutes before its occurrence, whereas others can foretell it hours or even more in advance. As they progress in sequence, this ability only grows stronger. The range of this ability's influence can span a few kilometers, an entire market district, or perhaps even encompass the whole of Trier. Furthermore, devils wield an array of spells involving flames, poison, and filth. The more Lumian listened, the more serious he grew. Devils were truly powerful, just like zombies countering pyromaniacs, who were experts in fire spells and close combat. After briefly explaining the Desire Apostle's abilities, Madame Magician comforted him with a smile, don't worry too much. Even if the Rose School of Thought takes action in the future, their target will most likely be Gardner Martin. You'll just be along for the ride. The Iron and Blood Cross Order, being a secret organization, has enough strength to resist the Rose School of Thought even if the Devil family sends someone to participate. If the Bliss Society and the Rose School of Thought share intelligence, you may become their primary target but they won't launch a fatal attack on you paradoxically. They fear releasing an inevitability angel like Termoboros. 
As long as you pay more attention to abnormalities and suspected conspiracies around you, you'll have enough time and opportunity to seek help. Upon hearing this, Lumian retorted, If the Rose School of Thought sends an angel to capture me, how will I have time to seek help? Madam Magician chuckled. Do you think Trier is a public washroom where an angel can descend and snatch someone away easily? If it weren't for the alternate space of the Tree of Shadow with the Permethal world enveloping it, that brainless abomination wouldn't have been able to descend its power. So, remember to avoid such places and live under the sun in Trier. Lumian heaved a sigh of relief and asked in confusion, Abomination? Could it be the power summoned by Susanna Mattis? Madam Magician's expression turned odd. Yes, Abomination, the child of the chained god whom the Mother Tree of Desire worshippers and the Rose School of Thought originally worshipped. He's a Sequence One angel and the current leader of the Rose School of Thought. I won't tell you his real name. This guy is covered in curses. If you say his real name often, you might become a frog that needs a prince's kiss to recover. Or worse. Why a prince? Lumian had read the Intis Fairy Tales collection published two years ago and remembered that the protagonist of the story was a princess. Why else would it be called a curse? Madam Magician wore a matter-of-fact expression. Lumian was speechless. He asked, the spawn of the Mother Tree of Desire are angels already roaming our world. And to descend, the child of the Great Mother requires a ritual. Is one more special than the other? They're equally special, said Madam Magician, her expression taking an odd turn once more. The crux of the matter is that it wasn't the Mother Tree of Desire who gave birth to the abomination, but a high-ranking existence in our world known as the Chained God. Lumian's heart filled with trauma as he immediately thought of Louis Lund, Administrator Beast, and his valets. Can the Mother Tree of Desire impregnate creatures of all races and genders through the barrier? Lumian asked with a hint of fear in his voice. Madam Magician shook her head. She doesn't have authority in that regard. That belongs to the Great Mother. However, if you're enticed by her and end up interacting with the power she has descended or the aura that seeped into our world, she has plenty of ways to impregnate you. Furthermore, the chain god pathway, the prisoner pathway, is rather special and has a close connection to the mother tree of desire. If it weren't for Mr. Fool's protection, the temperance faction members would have more or less been influenced by her in the past year or two. Lumian nodded, then brought up the issue of the Indulgence Faction and the Temperance Faction. I believe the Temperance Faction's philosophy is correct, but why can the Indulgence Faction still grow and possess such strength? Is it because there's no fear of losing control when they are already crazy? Madam Magician chuckled and responded, the Temperance Faction's philosophy is correct, but it doesn't mean that the Indulgence Faction's viewpoint is necessarily erroneous. You have to remember that acting based on the potion's name is like tarot cards. There's a difference between the upright and reversed position. And even if we act in the upright manner, the acting principles summarized by different people will vary according to their unique minds and experiences. After all, we're just acting. Our goal is to deceive the mental imprint left behind by that entity and digest the potion bit by bit. It would be troublesome if we were to completely align with him. Lumian nodded in understanding. So, the phrase remember that you're only acting not only prevents us from losing ourselves to avoid mental problems but also helps avoid such problems altogether? That's right, Madam Magician affirmed. Lumian then steered the conversation back to matters pertaining to the Mother Tree of Desire. Mr. Poet mentioned that there are multiple organizations that worship the Mother Tree of Desire. Poet. Madam Magician's lips curled up slightly. They're all relatively small organizations that haven't formed a large cult. They're far inferior to the Rose School of Thought and the few devil families, but they're relatively hidden. Currently, we are aware of three. One is the Bliss Society, the other is the Naturism Sect, and the third is the Tree Worship Sect. After pondering the matter for a while, Lumian finally brought up the idea of crafting a mystical item using the Shadow Branch. Madam, once I receive the reward from Mr. K, I'd like your help in finding a saint-level artisan to craft the item. Do you happen to know the price? Lumian inquired. Madam Magician grinned and replied, 
I haven't rewarded you yet for successfully joining the Iron and Blood Cross Order. How about using that reward to cover the cost? That sounds perfect, Lunian happily agreed. Receiving three rewards for a mission was truly a remarkable thing. Madam Magician nodded thoughtfully and said, A friend's relative knows a demigod level artisan. I'll check with them first. If it doesn't work out, I'll find another option. She then smiled and asked, With the gap between the lucky one and the potential reward from Mr. K, are you sure you want to use one of them to create a mystical item? Lumian responded with certainty, I won't have any regrets. His approach had always been to utilize available resources as swiftly as possible. It had to be known that the Padre was already a Sequence 5 bestowed when he left Cordu. He might have even taken a potion to boost his abilities. Dealing with him on one's own was akin to embracing death for Lumian. He needed to make use of every available resource to enhance his skills quickly and gather more allies to increase his chances of success. During his early days as a wanderer, Lumian once stumbled upon a wild apple tree laden with fruit. He intended to wait for the apples to grow larger and less sour before figuring out how to pluck them. However, to his surprise a few days later, someone else had managed to harvest all the small and sour apples. This incident left a profound mark on Lumian, significantly influencing his approach to handling things. Chapter 302, Mummy Ashes Madam Magician didn't say more and asked again, Do you want to return to Sal de Balbreeze now, or stay here until noon? Lumian had never left Entis, let alone come to the southern continent. Since he had nothing planned, he nodded and replied, I'd like to explore around a bit. Madam Magician gave a slight nod and vanished before him. Almost instantly, a bone-chilling wind swept through the crowd and struck Lumian. Having come from Trier in the summer, he couldn't help but shiver in the harsh Highlander winter. Accompanied by the cold breeze, the distant clamor of the market, a few hundred meters away, filled Lumian's ears, making him feel truly immersed in this world. Recalling how Madame Magician's arrival and disappearance had gone unnoticed by the surrounding people, Lumian quickly made a guess. Did she create a wall of spirituality or pull me into a separate alternate space? As these thoughts raced through Lumian's mind, he noticed that the passersby looked at him with weariness and puzzlement. He was only wearing a thin shirt, a black vest, and thin pants, which were hardly suitable for the harsh winter. What are you staring at? Haven't you seen someone acting cool? Lumian muttered. Relying on Am's monk's endurance, he nonchalantly ventured into the market. The smell of fresh livestock dung, the sweet aroma of corn, and the tantalizing scent of roasted meat with spices filled his nostrils. Lumian surveyed the area and spotted numerous stalls selling various food items made primarily from corn. There were boiled whole corn, roasted corn with red sauce, corn chunks served in thick soup, roasted corn wrapped in beef and mutton, onions, and potatoes, corn ground into a gooey paste and stuffed into various meat chunks, and corn spread into rough flatbread sprinkled with ingredients. After a moment of consideration, Lumian made his way through the cleared path among the marketers and arrived at a stall. The stall owner was a man in his thirties with dark and flushed skin, gaunt face, high cheekbones, and dark brown eyes. He had long greasy black hair and wore a black felt hat along with a dark red robe made of wool and other materials. Lumian pointed at the bubbling yellow corn paste and the iron-colored pot and asked in Intision, how much? He had noticed that some folks here understood Intision. The transactions were done using various metal currencies, including Verldor. The stall owner seemed scared, and he replied in non-fluent Intision with a hint of flattery, five copit for one cup. A lick, pretty cheap. Lumian glanced at the corn paste with mutton chunks and pulled out a brass coin with a Hornasis mountain range pattern on the front. The vendor breathed with relief and quickly produced a paper cup that didn't quite match the market style and technology. He filled it up generously, even adding a few extra meat chunks. As Lumian received the cup, warmth spread through his body. It was a wonderful experience to have something warm while enduring the biting wind. The even better experience was the warm corn paste flowing from his mouth into his esophagus and into his stomach, spreading warmth to every nook and cranny of his body. 
The corn paste, with its light sweetness and a hint of spiciness and pungency, perfectly complemented the beef and mutton cubes, neutralizing their gamey smell. It was peculiar and appetizing, a treat for his taste buds. Ignoring the cautious glances from the women and the fear and loathing from the man driving the cows and sheep, Lumian sipped his corn paste and made his way to the end of the market. Soon, he entered the city of White, Rapus. He spotted the golden eternal blazing sun cathedral and the god of steam and machinery cathedral adorned with various industrial components. The white buildings, shops selling leather and fabrics, the Highland Import and Export Corporation, and the Rapus Mining Federation signs were all visible. Carriages pulled by long-haired cows and medium-sized horses filled the streets, accompanied by locals in robes and a few foreigners in formal attire. Lumian picked a shop called Highland Mystic Potion and entered like a tourist. The owner, an intision in his forties, with typical black hair and blue eyes, wore a white shirt with floral patterns, thick cashmere clothes, and a dark blue coat with golden trim. Upon seeing Lumian, he greeted him warmly, Good morning, dear compatriot. The man checked out Lumian's attire and asked with concern, Did you encounter a bandit? I just arrived in Rapus. There was an accident on the way, Lumian replied, smiling with a trier accent. The proprietor of the mystic potion nodded in understanding. The southern continent isn't all it's cracked up to be, but it's a paradise for adventurers. I arrived in West Balham fifteen years ago in search of opportunities. Life only turned for the better when I found true opportunities in the city of White. By steam. With a sigh, he drew a triangular sacred emblem on his chest. By steam. Lumian responded with the same etiquette. The owner's smile grew warmer. Brother, would you like some mummy powder? Real mummy powder. Lumian looked around the small shop and smiled. Why don't you display the mummy in the window to prove its authenticity? The boss smiled sheepishly and said, that would upset the barbarians. Some buy mummy powder, but most can't accept mummies as commodities. Lumian deliberately said, when I left Trier, there was a shortage of mummy powder. The price skyrocketed. Ever thought of transporting mummies back to Trier for sale? Maritime trade is too risky, and the import-export companies give terrible prices, not to mention the taxes they charge. Those damned hyenas. The owner glanced at Lumian, testing the waters, if you're willing to take the risks, we can cooperate. How many mummies can you provide? Lumian feigned skepticism. The boss smiled. That depends on how many you want. I have the right connections. I can have as many as I want. Have you unearthed the grave of a nobleman from the Highlands Kingdom? Or will you find a corpse or even a living person to make one on the spot? Lumian engaged in a conversation with the owner of the Highland Mystic Potion and left the shop, pretending he needed time to consider the offer. After wandering for some time, Lumian came across a magnificent three-story white building by the roadside, bustling with locals swarming in. Curiosity got the better of him, and he followed the crowd inside, only to find into soldiers, clad in their distinctive black triangular hats and blue coats with gold threads, guarding the entrance in their white pants and black leather boots. Rapus, Lumian thought to himself, is truly an Intus colonial city. His gaze settled on the golden words above the main entrance, which read, Rapus Specialized Court. Taking a seat in an empty corner of the courtroom, Lumian tuned into the trial that was underway. Two Intus soldiers stood accused of a heinous crime, intercepting a newlywed couple in the suburbs, murdering the husband, and subjecting the wife to unspeakable horrors. The latter was fortunate enough to survive. With numerous witnesses and ample evidence, the entire case appeared quite clear-cut. After much deliberation, the judge, who was now holding the third hearing, finally pronounced them guilty, decreeing their immediate expulsion from the Highlands. Upon their return to Intus, they would face further punishment in a military court. The verdict didn't sit well with the local crowd, and they expressed their dissatisfaction loudly. However, the judge remained resolute, ordering bailiffs and soldiers to remove the dissenters from the court. Lumian observed the faces of the agitated and angered locals as they were forced to leave, and only when they had gone did he decide to leave the courtroom as well. 
As he strolled past the eternal blazing sun cathedral square, he noticed a group of clergymen in white robes adorned with golden threads. They were walking towards the cathedral, keeping a safe distance from the crowd and speaking in hushed tones. Lumian, relying on his hunter's ears, strained to catch their words from afar. Though the distance made it difficult, he managed to make out two phrases, Evernight's power has invaded this place. What could that mean? Is the Evernight Goddess Church of the Lowen Kingdom extending its reach into the Star Highlands? Lumian pondered for a moment before continuing on his way. At 12.30 p.m. trier time, Madame Magician escorted Lumian back to Sal de Ball Breeze, and he reappeared in his bedroom. He sat down at his wooden table and began organizing Mr. Poet's interpretation of the dream's symbolic elements. In the midst of his work, Lumian heard familiar footsteps approaching and an impolite knock on the door. Putting down the fountain pen, Lumian stood up and glanced at the entrance. Come in. It was Franca, dressed in her usual attire of blouse, beige breeches, and red boots. However, she now wore a light-colored pleated dress around her waist. Very strange, Lumian remarked honestly. Franca sighed a mix of joy and melancholy on her face. I'm not used to wearing dresses yet. This will have to do for now. This is to welcome pleasure. Pleasure? Lumian was puzzled by the term she mentioned. Franca closed the door behind her and explained with a complex expression, since you've joined the Iron and Blood Cross Order, my initial mission is considered accomplished. Now, I'll see if I can join and assist with your operation and since the mission is complete, there should be a reward. The next sequence for a witch is Demoness of Pleasure. Yes, I already have all the main ingredients and most of the supplementary ones, except for real mummy ashes. I came to ask if you could keep an eye out during your mysticism gatherings. Damn it, those mummy ashes sold in shops are all fake. Chapter 303, Sparks of Fire Mummy Ashes Lumian's mind immediately went to the Highland Mystic Potion Shop in Rapus. The mummies had their origins in the old Highlands Kingdom, and they had a special ancient Highlander term for it. Emperor Roselle translated it into mummy. In simpler terms, the most genuine and ancient mummies could be found in Star Highlands, the largest source of mummy ashes. Franca grew more and more agitated as she spoke. Why do you think men in Trier are so keen on things that enhance their abilities in that area? They even dare to consume mummy ashes. This means that those who genuinely need them can't afford the real deal. Many women in Trier are interested as well, hoping their husbands and lovers can perform better in bed. Lumian had read about it and asked Franca curiously, does it really work? Franca scoffed. I can't see any other effects besides getting sick from using powder made from a specially prepared corpse. Well, its use in mysticism is a different matter. Think about it. Trier is now flooded with fake mummy ashes. People are gobbling them up without knowing if they're authentic. There are many herbs with similar effects, but once they are labeled as mummy ashes, the price skyrockets. Who wouldn't take advantage of that? Don't overestimate the merchant's conscience. I've heard complaints at many mysticism gatherings about people finding dead rats, grinding them into powder, mixing it with herbs, and selling it as mummy ashes. When I, um, before I had superpowers and was still struggling, I saw the cafe owner making fake coffee from chicory. Later, he couldn't even afford that. He gathered coffee dregs, animal bile, and even brick dust and soot as a substitute. Believe me, if you visit the kitchens of certain restaurants and cafes, you'd want to hang the boss from the gallows. Those escargot shells are reused, picked up from the trash, filled with ingredients, and served to new customers. Franca continued her rant, expressing her frustration with counterfeit and inferior products hindering her beyond her career. After she finished speaking, Lumian asked with certainty, Have you finished digesting your witch potion? Franca's emotions returned to normal as she replied smugly, that was a long time ago. Have you seen me act as a witch during this period of time? Lumian changed the subject thoughtfully. You seem to despise the Rose School of Thought for their acts of terror in the northern continent. 
you even mock them for hindering the colonization resistance by the southern continent natives. I don't quite understand your logic. Shouldn't they resist and take revenge when bullied? Franco walked to the window of Lumian's bedroom and gazed at the dock and depot concealed by buildings. Her gaze was unfocused as she said, they should, if they wish to seek the adrenaline from exacting vengeance, for a moment of exhilaration. But if you want to lead the southern continent to expel the colonists, such actions will only have the opposite effect. A philosopher back home once said that no king should send troops out in anger. Resisting colonization is a serious and challenging matter, it's something that shouldn't become a wastebasket for venting one's emotions. Seeing Lumian's confusion, Franca pointed out the window. There are many workers and laborers there. They work hard every day and sleep in bedbug-infested rooms. Are they colonists? Did they benefit from the colonies? True, their jobs may be a result of colonial trade, but will they lose their jobs without the colonies and normal trade? I don't think so. The most likely possibility is that they will still have a job that barely provides sustenance, it's the bosses who lose excessive profits. They have their own demands and a desire to change the current society. They often join Trier citizens in various marches and protests, expressing deep dissatisfaction with the government. There are many similar people in Trier. Some of them have various reasons and even sympathize with the southern continent colonies. A philosopher king back home once said that we must distinguish between our friends and foes when carrying out deeds. The Rose School of Thought's various terrorist acts will only pit those who sympathize with the colonists and those who are also resisting the government against them. It makes them the object of hatred that will be exploited by the rulers to bridge any internal conflicts. It will harm the people of the southern continent's resistance against colonization. The philosopher King even prohibited his intelligence officers from carrying out assassinations or seeking revenge, let alone causing terrorist incidents. Franca snapped out of her daze and spoke with enthusiasm, her eyes sparkling, as long as we can gather more allies, isolate our enemies, and ignite that tiny spark, it can set a whole wilderness ablaze. Who is friend and foe? Finding allies and isolating the enemy. Even a tiny spark can set a whole wilderness ablaze. The words left a profound impact on Lumian. He pondered Franca's words repeatedly, especially her last sentence. It unveiled a new understanding of Pyromaniac, bringing him closer to unveiling his first acting principle. After a few moments, Lumian nodded solemnly. I agree with you now. The Rose School of Thought's acts of terror are extremely foolish, mere decisions made after their minds are filled with desire. Ah, as believers of the Mother Tree of Desire, it's quite expected. Franca pursed her lips. If the Rose School of Thought focused on assassinating colonial generals, members of parliament, and high-ranking government officials, as well as destroying battleships and arsenals, I wouldn't mock them. But their blood sacrifices, indiscriminately killing people, are the actions of lunatics. I don't want to become a sacrifice to these madmen one day. Lumian remarked, it's a classic case of turning sympathizers against each other. Franca disdainfully added, not only do these lunatics carry out blood sacrifices in the northern continent, but they also do it in the southern continent, turning villages into uninhabited lands. The southern continent has the Rose School of Thought as another insurmountable obstacle besides the colonists. Lumian nodded gently and said, That lady took me to the Star Highlands and during my tour of Star Highlands, I encountered a mummy merchant. Should I request permission to visit again and obtain some real mummy ashes for you? That lady. Franca realized something and decided not to press further. After some thought, she said, no need for that now. Just because Trier has plenty of counterfeit goods doesn't mean there's nothing authentic. Let's try to find the authentic ones first. If not, we'll go to the southern continent. Lumian honestly shared his intentions. I hope you can advance to sequence six within a week and become a demoness of pleasure. Ha. Huh. Franco was confused. Who's the one making the advancement? Lumian didn't hide anything, responding directly, it has been prophesied that Guillaume Benet will appear in Cartier de la Princesse Rouge next week. I want to find him and capture him, and I need the help of more friends. 
the boss has already agreed to help me find him. The stronger you are, the higher our chances of capturing Guillaume Benet. Amused, Franca teased, you're learning on the spot, kid. You really aren't holding back anymore. You made a request without getting my agreement to help. Lumian smiled, replying, isn't that what I'm doing now? Franca pondered for a moment before saying, wait a few more days. If we still can't find real mommy's ashes, we'll go to the southern continent to search for them. Remember, try not to trouble the major arcana card holder if possible. Right then, Lumian said, sharing a similar view, but he never missed a chance to fleece. Otherwise, it would be best to seek Madame Magician's help in dealing with Guillaume Benet. A subordinate who couldn't handle problems on their own, bothering their superior all the time, would eventually be left behind. Furthermore, the Tarot Club followed a rule of equivalent exchange. What price would one have to pay to enlist the help of a demigod-level major arcana card holder? After chatting for a while, Franca, who was about to leave, glanced at the window and suddenly said, Although Gardner Martin already knows the situation and has made preparations, you can't be careless. You can't place all your hopes on him. The Rose School of Thought is an ancient secret organization. It must possess various abilities. Why are you bringing this up all of a sudden? Lumian was taken aback for a moment before responding with tacit understanding, the boss is at least a conspirer. He has probably set countless traps in secret, awaiting the arrival of the Rose School of Thought. On this topic, the two of them continued their conversation as they left the bedroom and entered the corridor. Franca lowered her voice and said, I sense something amiss with the glass in your window. I suspect a wraith. The Rose School of Thought's wraith? Franca discovered something wrong with her witch's grasp of mirrors? Lumian's nerves tensed as he nodded slightly, acting as though they were discussing an ordinary topic. He saw Franca stroll into the café and depart Sal de Ball Breeze before stepping out of the corridor. Like always, he settled into his regular seat and savored his aromatic coffee. An hour went by, and Lumian started to feel a bit more at ease. He thought the wraith had probably left, so he shifted his focus to Gardner Martin and the potential traps. The following days were filled with paranoia for Lumian. He sensed eyes on him from the glass window in his room and the bathroom mirror, but nothing alarming occurred. Finally, the day of the reward promised by Mr. Kate arrived. As Lumian descended the stairs of Aubert's Du Coke door, he encountered an unfamiliar woman. Dressed in a lake blue dress, her brown hair flowed naturally, and her brown eyes had a uniquely ethereal quality. Her looks were above average, her cheeks plump, and her demeanor stood out from the ordinary. As Lumian passed by the front desk, he casually asked Madame Fells, Is that young lady a new tenant? The plump Madame Fells smiled ingratiatingly. No, she's Miss Safari, staying in room 309. She went to a small seaside town to be a human model for a painter. She only returned today. How enviable. Her job lets her take a vacation by the sea. That human model? Lumian nodded and left Aubert's Du Coke door, catching a public carriage to Avenue du Boulevard. Chapter 304 Decency Avenue du Boulevard, 19 Rue Chier, Basement. Mr. K's face remained hidden under the massive hood, but Lumian could feel the admiration and recognition in his gaze. Standing behind a red armchair, Mr. K pointed to a narrow wooden table by the wall. Make a choice. These are grade two sealed artifacts, as per the standards of various churches. They have distinct characteristics but come with dangerous negative effects. Nonetheless, there are ways to resolve those issues and utilize them to some extent. Following the gesture of Mr. K's raised right hand, Lumian spotted three containers on the narrow wooden table. One was an exquisite wooden box adorned with rubies, emeralds, agates, and other precious items. Another was a rubber injector, and the last one was a wide-mouthed bottle filled with a dreamy green liquid with a golden object at the bottom. Mr. K approached the table, picked up the wooden box with gems, and opened it. Inside, there lay a thin and soft leather mask. As Mr. K lifted it to display, an exaggerated face outlined in red, yellow, 
and white oil paint emerged. For some reason, Lumian's mood took a plunge at the sight of the face, and his heart filled with sorrow. It's called the Clown Mask, Mr. K introduced in a low, raspy voice. Wearing it enables you to create paper figurine substitutes. You can ignite combustible objects within a 50-meter radius and leap between flames, allowing you to transfer wounds across your body and turn a fatal injury into a minor one. However, each wound can only be transferred once. It will also meld with your face, altering your appearance. This aspect is beyond your control, but it grants you strong expression control and sharp premonition for a short duration. To store it safely, you'll need a high-value container. Otherwise, it will continuously bring frustration, pain, and sorrow to those around it, gradually driving them insane until they break down. For Beyonders, this often means losing control. That's why you can't wear it for more than 10 minutes at a time. Additionally, you have to watch a comedic performance once a week, otherwise, it will attempt to replace you when you wear it, truly becoming your face. Wound Transference This sealed artifact belongs to the Seer Pathway. It corresponds to the sequence of Bureau 8's Miss Leah or higher, Lumian quickly deduced based on his experience. He felt that the clown mask suited him well. With Pyromaniac and Flaming Jump, he could significantly increase his strength. He was in need of changing his appearance, but the limitation of wearing it for only ten minutes made it similar to the mystery prying glasses, albeit more convenient. Moreover, paper figurine substitutes and wound transference could effectively boost his survivability, but when it came to dealing with zombies, wraiths, devils, or desire apostles, these abilities lacked specificity. Emotional influences were currently a taboo for Lumian. While his psychological issues had been somewhat healed, the flames of pain couldn't be fully extinguished. They still smoldered deep in his heart. If this emotional breakdown erupted, Termoboros would undoubtedly be grinning from end to end. As Lumian pondered, Mr. K put the clown mask back into its exquisite wooden box and picked up an injector made of rubber hoses, a glass syringe, and a thin needle. At that moment, a tube of bright red liquid quietly filled the syringe, as if it had just been extracted from a person's body. Mr. K gently shook the injector and said, it's called lifeblood. Once injected into your body, it allows you to control your flesh and blood completely for a short period. You won't need to maintain your human form deliberately, and your vital points will be safe. Moreover, you can envelop a target, corrode their body, and kill them from the inside. Simultaneously, you can transform into your own shadow and merge with the surrounding shadows. That way, you can secretly trail the enemy and avoid detection. With each injection, you'll become closer to our Lord, closer to the most ancient appearance of humanity's original form. Others and creatures won't endure it well. Their bodies will collapse gradually with each injection, and they won't be able to return to their original state. Their minds will be cloaked by shadows, making them crave flesh and blood, turning them into irrational monsters. However, we need not worry. As long as we devoutly believe in our Lord and remember to pray to Him always, there won't be many issues with our bodies and minds. I've injected myself several times before. Am I not normal now? Lumian didn't fully buy into it. I don't think you're normal. The flesh corrosion ability seems useful against zombies. Furthermore, he wasn't devout when it came to the true creator. He usually used psychological cues to seal the memories of his honorific name and didn't pray at all. If you carry lifeblood without injecting yourself, it won't affect you other than making you crave flesh and blood, Mr. K explained. He then picked up a wide-mouthed bottle filled with green liquid filled with an alcoholic fragrance and retrieved a golden brooch carved into a scotch broom from it with his white palm that appeared sickly. This one's called decency. Once you wear it, you can acutely detect a target's weaknesses. By symbolically giving them items, you can complete a bribe, significantly weakening their attack, defense, or control over you for a certain period. In addition, you can distort the target's words, actions, and intentions. You can also distort certain actions of yourself or others to create an environment that's beneficial to you. Using bribe to weaken the target's attack, defense, or control. This ability is very versatile. 
It can be used against zombies, devils, or other beyonders. If I use distortion well, I can come up with all kinds of tricks. Lumian's spirits lifted, believing this was what he wanted. The next step was to see if the negative effects could be endured. Mr. K continued, it must be kept in liquor that exceeds 45 proof. Otherwise, it might result in arrest from official beyonders or other factions at irregular intervals. You can't wear it for more than 15 minutes. In the following hour, you'll become repulsive and disdainful. It's best not to go out. Wait patiently until the negative effects fade. As a hunter, how can I not be repulsed and despised? And it's normal for regulars at Old Tavern to carry two or three flasks of liquor with them. Sometimes, I can even use it to attract nearby factions to capture this characteristic for fishing. It's a perfect part of certain traps. Lumian quickly made up his mind and said firmly, I want decency. Now, the question was whether this sealed artifact could be matched with the shadow branch to create a mystical item with both characteristics. Mr. K respected Lumian's decision and didn't offer any persuasion. He tossed the decency brooch back into the wide mouth bottle of liquor, capped it, and handed it to Lumian. Lumian swiftly caught it and mumbled, What if I'm not skilled enough to catch it and shatter the bottle? We'll exchange looks and then flee before the official beyonders come after us. Lumian gripped the bottle of liquor suspected to be absinthe and deliberately said, I have something to report. He briefly recounted the werewolf incident and concluded, the Rose School of Thought suffered repeated setbacks, yet they remain arrogant. I heard they also believe in the evil god, the mother tree of desire. Mr. K's gaze turned cold, and his voice carried an oppressive metallic quality. The evil god's believers are indeed becoming more impudent. Since some deities can't shoulder such a heavy responsibility, let us share their burden. Lumian could sense Mr. K's anger igniting as his pyromaniac potion was showing signs of digestion. After bidding farewell to Mr. K, he left the basement and closed his eyes in the corridor. Through this experiment, combined with the fire in his heart when he advanced to pyromaniac, Franca's words, the various situations in the market district, and the actions of the people of Rapus in the southern continent, he concluded his first pyromaniac acting principle, pyromaniacs not only ignite matter but also the mind and society. In the market district, Aubert's Du Coke Door, Room 207. Lumian gazed at the enticing green liquor bottle, contemplating the need for sturdy military flasks to prevent it from breaking during a potential fight. Simultaneously, he made the final decision to utilize the lucky one beyond her characteristic and the shadow branch to create a mystical item. He felt that decency's powers didn't mesh well with the shadow branch, and its drawbacks were manageable. On the other hand, sealed artifacts offered decent effects and could be used independently. Without any hesitation, Lumian penned a letter, seeking Madame Magician's aid in locating a demigod-level artisan. Afterward, he made his way to the safe house on Rue de Blouse's Blanches, summoned the messenger, and dispatched the shadow branch and lucky one beyond her characteristic, along with the letter, to the holder of the major arcana card. In no time, Lumian spotted the puppet messenger materializing above the desk, dropping a thick stack of papers with a loud thud. Bang! The table groaned under the weight of the hefty object. Lumian rose to his feet and noticed a response placed on top of the stack. No problem. I'll assist you in making contact. The process will take some time, as will the crafting of the item. If you don't mind, I'll add a condition that the final product should be portable. Additionally, while observing celestial phenomena, I sense that you are on the verge of assimilating the pyromaniac potion and can endure a new inevitability boon. Here's information about some creatures from the spirit world. You can study it beforehand and explore which contracts you might form to borrow their abilities. Madame Magician possesses knowledge of astromancy. Her predictions are remarkably accurate. Lumian felt a bit lightheaded as he glanced at the substantial stack of papers. Having summarized the core principle of his initial pyromaniac acting, he knew he wasn't far from fully digesting it. Chapter 305 Test Lumian took his time with the thick stack of information on spirit world creatures. 
he stowed them and Aurora's grimoires in an iron cabinet he had acquired earlier. But now, there were other pressing matters at hand. Unscrewing the lid of a wide mouth bottle, he reached into the green liquor to retrieve the scotch broom brooch known as decency. His plan was to test the sealed artifact's abilities and its negative effects. Waiting for a real battle wouldn't do, he needed to familiarize himself with it now. Figuring it out on the fly during a fight would be disastrous, leaving him unable to coordinate his beyonder powers and attacks effectively. He also wanted to test the extent of the brooch's adverse effects while he was still in good shape. After a battle that had taken a toll on his body and mind, it would be too risky to face those effects hastily. Understanding the brooch's negative effects in advance would allow Lumian to make better choices when forced to use decency, minimizing its influence on him. A hunter who wasn't familiar with their weapon was bound to fail. Lumian placed the scotch broom brooch on the table before him, focusing his mind to sense its power. As he did so, a gust of wind blew in from the open window, making his heart race. He quickly stood up, extended his right hand, and shut the window tight. The moment the window closed, the room fell eerily silent, as if it had been sealed off from the outside world. Lumian then walked over to the door, gently opening and closing it. It seemed like the safe house had turned into a secluded sanctuary. Seating himself again, Lumian exuded an aura that could provoke disgust and hatred in small animals, this was an application of provocation. Almost instantly, a rat appeared from nowhere, snarling and attacking him with its claws. Without much effort, Lumian flicked his index finger and thumb, and a crimson spark shot out, incinerating the rat as it squealed in pain. The rat desperately tried to escape while suffering the scorching pain, but the invisible force sealed all exits, leaving it trapped. It lacked the ability to open a door. Lumian nodded with satisfaction, using the rat to test the other abilities of the decency brooch. The test lasted for about 12 to 13 minutes, but Lumian couldn't be sure without a pocket watch. He decided to proceed with caution and removed the decency brooch, throwing it into a container of green liquor. Then, with another small crimson fireball, he ended the rat's life, filling the room with the smell of roasted fat. After stowing away the container, Lumian left the safe house, ready to test the brooch's repellent effect on others. The gas street lamps were already lit as he stepped out, and he immediately noticed the glares of pedestrians and vendors around him. It felt as if they despised him deeply, wanting to attack him with knives, bottles of alcohol, or even an iron pot filled with food. However, Lion Seal's trademark golden and black hair seemed to deter them from acting on their impulses. The, this effect is equivalent to a large-scale provocation. However, it's not within my control. Lumian assessed roughly, realizing that he couldn't fully control it. Under the unfriendly gazes, he walked along the roadside and made his way towards Avenue du Marque. At that moment, two police officers dressed in black uniforms, their shoulders adorned with silver epaulets, and armed with revolvers strolled by the area. Catching sight of Lumian, they immediately pointed at him and bellowed, Halt right there. Routine inspection. The effects are truly potent. Lumian didn't waste a breath and swiftly turned on his heels, dashing away. Stop! The two officers shouted, drawing their revolvers and taking aim at Lumian. He skillfully evaded a pedestrian's sneaky attempt to trip him, making a sharp turn into an alleyway blocked by a barricade. Without glancing back, he hurried into underground trier. He hadn't brought his carbide lamp, nor did he possess night vision. However, as a pyromaniac, he could conjure light in any environment. Crimson fireballs materialized above Lumian's head and on his shoulders, illuminating his path. Easily outpacing the police officers, he made his way toward another underground trier entrance near Rue de Blouse's Blanches. As he walked, Lumian abruptly twisted his body, narrowly avoiding a black shadow that lunged from a corner. It was a snake-like creature with bluish-black scales. The creature reared up, flicking its bright red forked tongue in an aggressive stance, challenging Lumian. It doesn't only arouse disgust and disdain from humans. They need to see or make contact with me to be influenced. Lumian sighed and shook his head allowing one of the fireballs to shoot out and reduce the venomous snake into three charred pieces, 
emitting a burnt fragrance. Having already gauged the strength and reach of the negative effects, he decided not to take any more risks. He found a nearby empty cave, extinguished the fireballs, and sat in the darkness, quietly waiting for the effects to wear off. After what seemed like an hour, he stood up and conjured three crimson fireballs above his head, left shoulder, and right shoulder to illuminate the tunnel ahead. In no time, Lumian found himself at an exit near Rue de Blouse's blanches. There, he spotted a figure with a carbide lamp emerging from a nearby tunnel. With a grin, Lumian raised his right hand in a wave. Well, well, look who's wandering an underground trier like a rat. It was Jenna. As she caught sight of Lumian, her brow furrowed. Did you use provocation on me? Why are you so irritating? Lumian replied vaguely, something like that. Jenna couldn't hide her annoyance and blurted, damn it. Why did you use provocation on me? Not bad. You didn't come over to beat me up. That means you still treat me as a friend. That's probably how strong the negative effects are when they're about to disappear. He smiled and explained, I encountered something that left me tainted with a dreadful aura, but it will soon fade away. Shifting gears, Lumian examined Jenna, who wore a light white shirt and a faded yellow dress. Her hair cascaded down her back, and she wore a small sun sacred emblem around her neck. What brings you to Underground Trier? Jenna, now looking more like a college student in Cartier de la Cathedral commemorative, pursed her lips and replied, meeting the two purifiers. I wanted to show my devotion to God as you suggested. So I dressed in a way that the church advocates, even wearing a sun talisman. But they guided me to Underground Trier, claiming it was to avoid crowds. Damn it, it's just absurd to go around here dressed like this. As the negative effects of decency waned, Jenna understood why she reacted strongly and calmly shared her experiences with Lumian. Did it work? Lumian glanced at the brown wooden box in Jenna's right hand but didn't rush to ask what it contained. Puzzled, Jenna inquired, yes, it did. Valentine, the purifier, became much more receptive to me. Imra also changed, but they seemed to be cautious and suspicious of me for some reason. Maybe they think you're trying to ingratiate yourself and have ulterior motives, Lumian speculated, attempting to analyze the purifier's mindset. He pointed at the wooden box Jenna was carrying with his chin. Is that their reward for you? Jenna couldn't help but smile. Exactly. They verified the information about Deep Valley Quarry and acknowledged its importance. As compensation, they gave me two main ingredients and one supplementary ingredient for the instigator potion. I'll collect the rest myself. Franca probably has the rest of the supplementary ingredients. Lumian mused. The main ingredient for a Sequence 8 potion isn't cheap, it's precious, you know. Is the information about Deep Valley Quarry really that important? What did this entail? Jenna tersely acknowledged his words. They didn't elaborate much. The only thing they said was that the purifiers can't directly enter the quarry due to issues between the churches. But they'll keep an eye on it to prevent things from escalating. They also want me to keep contacting the client to get more information from him. Apparently, part of the main ingredients for the potion is an advance payment, Jenna explained. Lumian nodded approvingly. Makes sense. Jenna sighed. I'm such a degenerate. Why do you say that? Lumian raised his eyebrows. Jenna grabbed her hair. I should have asked for enough money to pay off my debts before even thinking about the ingredients for the instigator potion. When you become an instigator, that money won't be a problem, Lumian scoffed. You're not planning to stick around as a local singer forever to repay your debts, are you? Jenna fell silent for a moment before admitting, but I don't want to harm anyone. Why not just target villains? Lumian tried to ignite Jenna's determination. Damn it, you're the instigator, not me, right? Jenna muttered, adding, how much should I pay Franca? We got the information together, it's not fair if she doesn't get anything. Lumian chuckled. Considering the potion formula she gave you, even with a friend's discount, you should pay her a minimum of 20,000 Verldor. 20,000 Verldor minimum. Jenna's face showed a hint of pain. 
For now, I can only owe her. Do you think I'll accumulate more debt the higher my sequence? The potion formula and ingredients are so expensive. But your earning potential will increase, Lumian half instigated, half comforted. He extinguished the three fireballs on his body and headed toward the exit of Underground Trier, Jenna's carbide lamp lighting their way. After a few steps, Jenna asked with curiosity, why did you create fireballs above your head and both shoulders? What's the point? Haven't you heard of people carrying three lamps, one above their head, one on their left shoulder, and one on their right shoulder? Lumian asked. No, Jenna shook her head, intrigued. Is it some mystical knowledge? Nah, just folklore, Lumian smiled. I thought it looked cool, so I went with it. Jenna couldn't help but curse, damn it. You're so childish. As they chatted, they left underground trier and entered apartment 601, three rue de Blouse's blanches, where Franca gave them a suspicious look. Chapter 306, Ambivalence Lumian calmly recounted his encounter with Jenna in the depths of underground trier while he was enduring the air of repulsion and disdain. Franca gave a slightly awkward smile and deftly changed the topic. How can you be repulsive and detestable? You didn't lose control. Franca had encountered Beyonders on the Hunter pathway succumbing to a loss of control numerous times, most of them exuding traits that attracted hostility from those around them. This was the principal reason they were swiftly dealt with. Lumian briefly explained, I obtained a sealed artifact. Its negative effects manifest an hour after I remove it, causing me to exude repulsion and disdain. Jenna, curious, interjected, what happens if you don't take it off? Lumian's lips curled as he replied, then it turns into an alarm, drawing the attention of nearby official beyonders who'd like to apprehend me. It's quite the attention seeker, Franca remarked with a playful grin. It does have a fondness for decency, Lumian said, his tone meaningful. Then, he added nonchalantly, its abilities lean heavily towards bribe, with a touch of distortion. Given the likelihood of needing to collaborate with Franca in the future to deal with Padre Guillaume Benet, Lumian took the initiative to divulge the situation regarding the decency brooch. However, he refrained from delving into intricate details, especially regarding the strength and range of its powers. After all, mystical items were a beyonder's ace in the hole. Exposing them risked a sense of vulnerability. Just as Franca had shared information about the Ring of Punishment while omitting the brass revolver and other items during their earlier operation, it was a delicate balance, sharing yet withholding the full truth, building trust while maintaining essential precautions. Franca didn't press further. She pondered for a moment before saying, it corresponds to a Sequence 7 Briber and a Sequence 6 Baron of Corruption from the Black Emperor pathway. It seems a baron of corruption met his end, melding his beyonder traits with the objects on him to create the sealed artifact. Its abilities aren't fully revealed. Black Emperor? Lumian had never heard of this sequence, nor had Jenna. The deity appellation for the lawyer pathway, Franca whispered, excitement in her voice. Rumor has it that Emperor Roselle achieved Black Emperor status before his demise, a true deity. For a brief moment, Lumian and Jenna were rendered speechless. Their expressions mirrored their astonishment. Franca couldn't accurately fathom Emperor Roselle's standing in their eyes as genuine intisions. Had he, no, had he truly ascended to godhood? Rumors, mere rumors, Franca hastened to add, lest her dependable image be tarnished in Jenna's eyes. After a few more exchanges, Jenna opened the wooden box in her right hand, revealing the smaller boxes within. They contained a small, dark, hive-like heart, a sack exuding dark green liquid, and a slender, smoked tube-like substance. Franca scrutinized them briefly before giving a nod of approval. The heart of the demon throat honey guide and the poison sack of the dark prowler, these are the main ingredients. Yes, the dark prowler is a peculiar two-headed snake. You've also acquired the Demon Throat Honey Guide Syrinx. You only need blue jimson weed juice, fern powder, walnuts, and pure water. I have the blue jimson weed juice. The other three supplementary ingredients are easy to come by. Fern powder. 
Lumian recalled the supplemental ingredient for the Provoker potion shared a similarity. It implied being susceptible to others' words. In that light, Instigator and Provoker bore resemblance. Hunter and Demonis truly were neighboring, interchangeable pathways. Noticing Jenna's keenness to buy ferns and walnuts from the right shops and prepare pure water overnight, Frank cautioned, hold on a moment. Set yourself straight first. You've digested the assassin potion, and chances of losing control with the instigator potion are slim these days, but why not aim for the best? Wouldn't it be wiser to minimize the chance of losing control entirely? Lumian scratched his chin and added, I'm curious what kind of monster an instigator would end up as after losing control. Jenna shot him a glare and settled onto the sofa, shutting her eyes and focusing on her breath. Lumian sprawled in the armchair next to him, his arms draped over the armrests. He turned to Franca and inquired, Have you gotten your hands on genuine mummy ashes? Nope, Franca shook her head, a touch of helplessness in her expression. I even offered 500 Verldor for 10 grams, but those guys keep pushing fakes. Worthless bunch. They can't even tell the real from the fake. Only 500 Verldor? Lumian teased. Aren't you rolling in it? Normally, 10 grams go for just over 100 Verldor. 500 is already a small fortune, all right? Franca snapped back, her frustration evident and I'm not exactly swimming in money at the moment. Lumian nodded, getting why Franca's funds were running dry. Her infiltration of the Iron and Blood Cross Order wasn't a true success. It could only be considered as aiding Lumian in reaching the goal. So, the reward she received wasn't the main ingredients for the demoness of pleasure, but rather the privilege to buy them at a discount. How much more do you need? Jenna's eyes popped open, a willingness to help evident in her gaze. Franca shook her head and replied, If 500 Verldor can't get me the real stuff, neither will a grand. They'll just think I'm a fool, waiting for me to bid higher. She then turned her gaze to Lumian. What's your plan for now? Given time, she could likely snag actual mummy ashes in a fortnight or a month. However, Lumian needed her assistance within the next week pushing her to consider searching for true mummies in the Star Highlands of the Southern Continent. Lumian caught onto Franca's unspoken message and mused, maybe consider a little arson and digesting the potion to some extent. This way, he could unlock the contract T-Boon, garnering diverse abilities from different creatures through contracts. As far as he knew, a freshly minted contract T could only forge three contracts. Lumian intended to cherry-pick three from the four possible abilities, ones that impacted the spirit body or psyche, basic teleportation skills, a moderate level of disguise, and an ability akin to invisibility or shadow blending. The final choice hinged on the information on creatures from the spirit realm. Maybe the willing creatures suitable for a contract with Lumian didn't wield matching skills. Lumian was sure of one thing, all spirit world creatures could traverse the spirit realm, a basic form of teleportation. The variance lay in swiftness. If he struck a pact with white paper, perhaps he'd manage only 10 to 20 meters per jump. Not the optimal choice for traversing to the southern continent, exhaustion would likely make him lose control long before he arrived there. Arson. What's your thinking? Franca sat cross legged in the recliner. Lumian recounted the acting principle he had deduced about the pyromaniac. Franca shared her insight based on her own experiences. Upright acting is incitement, and inverted acting is instigation. They can all help you digest the potion. Wouldn't that be easy? Go down to the docks tomorrow and incite the dock workers into a strike. The rallying cry will be for better pay. Lumian shook his head slowly. If I can rally them into a strike and there's a good chance it'll get them some benefits or help them achieve their goals, I'll give it a shot. But if it's only going to bring disaster upon them, I'm not so keen on it. I can't stand exploiting others without benefiting them and causing harm instead, unless there's no other way. Then anyone can be sacrificed. Once there was this guy who always said that we could only grab more and have enough food if we united. But when we did unite to fight others for food, he took advantage of the chaos and made off with the food. You've got quite a bit of experience. 
Franca studied Lumian anew, feeling that he wasn't just as simple as Muggle's brother. Jenna had been through similar situations. Franca sighed and said, as expected, you're quite the instigator in the upright sense. I'd be the same if I were you. Though I can put up a tough front, truth be told. Ha, ah, I can't bring myself to do it. Lumian regarded her thoughtfully and spoke, I find you a bit paradoxical. Sometimes you're seasoned, well-informed, and have a knack for analyzing things. Other times, you're foolish, innocent, and naive. Lumian had only encountered such a contradictory disposition in one other person, his sister Aurora. Stirred by Lumian's string of words, Franca blurted out, Are you trying to provoke me? How am I foolish or naive? At this, she caught Jenna's disapproving glance. Ahem. Franca cleared her throat and went on, It's because I have this core kindness and certain expectations for the world. Even after seeing how harsh life can be, I still cherish life. Sigh, most in my group are like that. Only a few are resilient, brilliant, and agile. They seem to never be daunted by hardships or moral dilemmas. The Curly-Haired Baboons Research Society? Why do they have such similarities? Lumian nodded, choosing not to probe further. With Jenna's plan to gather the remaining supplemental ingredients the following day to advance as an instigator, Lumian swiftly departed from Rue de Blouse's blanches and returned to Aubert's du Coke door. As he made his way up the stairs, Lumian caught sight of Anthony Reed, the information broker, coming down with a suitcase. Moving out? Lumian inquired. That's right. Anthony Reed, still donning his military green camouflage, gave a slight nod. Lumian chuckled and remarked, didn't you mention some unfinished business in the market district? The lead's gone cold. Anthony Reed let out a soft sigh. Gone cold? Suddenly, Lumian recalled having seen a parliamentary election poster in the other man's room. He prodded, because Hughes Artois is dead? Chapter 307, Instigation Upon hearing Lumian's question, Anthony Reed, his round face slightly pudgy and his skin with a slight sheen, fixed his dark brown eyes on him for a moment before responding, I'm not sure what you're getting at. The information broker's emotions appeared steady, and his expression seemed unaffected. It was almost as if Hugues Artois' demise hadn't affected him in the least. Lumian's grin widened, and he didn't press further. Pointing toward the lower level, he suggested, let me buy you a drink. You've aided me in the past, and we've fought side by side. Consider it a parting gesture. Anthony Reed scratched his retreating, light yellow hairline with his free hand, his other holding a suitcase, pondering briefly before conceding, okay. Descending the narrow, gaslit staircase, the duo entered the basement bar and settled at the counter. What's your poison? Lumian inquired in a casual tone, as if he'd just stepped into his own abode. Fennel absinthe, Anthony Reed replied succinctly. Absinthe, eh? Lumian chuckled, producing a Verldor silver coin and four Coppet copper coins. He tossed them to the barkeep, Pavard Neeson, who sported a ponytail. Two glasses of somersault. Somersault was bar parlance, signifying a double serving of fennel absinthe and a measure of little mummy. The latter took seven licks, while the former required twelve. Pavard Neeson deftly flipped over standard cups and filled them with a dreamy green liquid for Lumian and Anthony Reed. As Lumian took a sip, he savored the familiar bitterness and revitalization. He observed Pavard Neeson, whose dark brown beard framed his lips, muttering in a low, ingratiating tone, Seal, got any of them peculiar drugs? The bar owner and amateur painter believed that Seal, a notorious mob leader, surely possessed a couple of roots for obtaining proscribed substances. Lumian caressed the glass with his thumb and smiled, inquiring, What kind of drug are you after? Recognizing that Anthony Reed was an information broker often entangled in illicit affairs, Pavard Neeson did not hold back, explaining in hushed tones, Banned psychotropic drugs. Sigh, when that odd tree affected me, I created the draft I was most proud of. Actually, it wasn't just my most satisfying piece, it embodied the aesthetics I'd always strived for but never reached. 
it perfectly channeled my thoughts and convictions. Since then, that sensations eluded me completely. Every stroke of mine has turned into dog's hit. I'm considering experimenting with psychotropic drugs, hoping to recapture that sensation. Lumian took another sip of the misty absinthe, his lips curling in a derisive smile. If I were you, I'd steer clear of painting altogether. You lack the innate aptitude. Without waiting for Pavar Neeson's retort, he chuckled and stated, relying on drugs for passable creations signifies your dearth of talent. But many famous painters have resorted to it. Pavard Neeson began, only to be cut off by Lumian. He clicked his tongue and interjected, that's an indication their creative faculties are waning, their fountain of inspiration drying up. Isn't that cheating? Pitting drug-fueled works against those of other artists, barely eking out a victory. Earning a spot in an exhibition and proudly proclaiming to every visitor, behold, I'm despicable. I possess an inferiority complex. Drugs are my prowess, and demons are my parents. Seeing Pavard Neeson's visage turn ashen, Lumian spread his arms slightly, probing, does that fill you with pride? Should you possess talent, you'd no longer be an amateur painter. Even if critical acclaim eluded you, and the world's artists' exhibitions snubbed you, private galleries would come seeking. You understand the harsh reality better than I do. At this juncture, Lumian's smile broadened. Drugs won't save you. It's available to all, like a common commodity. When everyone resorts to it, won't they be pitted against their innate skill and standards? Pavard Neeson's lips quivered, yet he remained speechless. With a somber expression, he took a couple of steps back, slumping into his seat, as if his spirit had vacated his body. Anthony Reed, who had been quietly sipping fennel absinthe, turned his gaze to Lumian. You're not a fan of those forbidden psychiatric drugs? Otherwise? Lumian scoffed. Anthony Reed shifted his attention to Pavard Neeson, visibly grappling with his inner turmoil, and spoke contemplatively. You seem to have swayed him. I merely stoked the embers of his guilt, Lumian replied with calm composure. Anthony Reed nodded gently. But what if your persuasion falls short? Lumian laughed. I'm not his godfather. If he couldn't sway him, so be it. A brief pause fell upon Anthony Reed before he turned his gaze back to Lumian. Your method of dissuasion deviates from your usual approach. Is this acting? Impressively observant and astute, as expected from a mid-sequence beyonder of the spectator pathway. If I can kindle the inner fervor within a spectator's heart, it should greatly aid my digestion. Lumian mused inwardly. Holding his glass of verdant liquid, he looked ahead and replied, I stumbled upon some flyers earlier. They made mention of Hugues Artois deserting his troops during the war against the Lowen Kingdom a few years back, leading to countless casualties. Anthony Reed remained silent, savoring his fennel absinthe and quietude. Lumian's gaze flickered toward the vacant bar counter as he continued, I recall you wrestled with the lingering effects of PTSD from that war a few years ago. With a gulp, Anthony Reed took a swig of the green liquor. Lumian opted to not bring up the parliamentary election poster found in the information broker's room. He glanced at the vacant shell that was Pavard Neeson and mumbled to himself, if the sole motivation is animosity towards Hugues Artois, then news of his assassination would be met with jubilation and him drinking until he dropped at the bar. But if one wishes to unravel the reason behind Hugues Artois' actions, understand how he wormed his way into politics in a parliamentary bid despite his past, and uncover the strings being pulled in his favor, one must seek out other breadcrumbs to grant the departed some semblance of peace. The official beyonders should be on this case, but they labor under too many constraints. They lack the untamed boldness of wild beyonders. Seated still, Anthony Reed took another swig of fennel absinthe. Lumian chuckled. It's indeed a vexing conundrum. The hurdles are countless, and the perils are real. Surrender becomes a tempting option for everyone. In the end, though, Hugues Artois lies deceased. The instigator of that tragedy rests in the grave. The departed souls should find some solace. Anthony Reed ceased his imbibing, his middle-aged visage betraying no emotion. Lumian glanced his way, lowered his tone, and smiled knowingly. 
folks plagued by severe mental ills can't ascend far in the spectator path. And even if they do plateau, external stimuli can trigger catastrophic lapses, transforming them into monstrosities. In this ever more perilous world, stability is but a distant wish for flawed beyonders. At this juncture, Lumian reigned in his expression and fixed his gaze upon Anthony Reed's profile. He inquired, his voice resonating with gravitas, do you fancy departing laden with remorse and reluctance, languishing in the throes of becoming a monster, shying away from your former comrades, or do you dare venture forth in pursuit of the truth, courting danger, and crafting your own heroic saga? Without acknowledging Anthony Reed's response, Lumian gracefully alighted from the barstool, lifted his fennel absinthe, and downed the remainder in a single gulp. With that, he whispered into Anthony Reed's ear, I contributed to Hugh's Artois demise. We're still untangling his problem. Observing Anthony Reed's slight tremor, Lumian straightened up and exited the subterranean bar without casting a backward glance. He strolled back into room 207, not bothering to shut the door behind him, and lit the carbide lamp. With a casual swivel, he spun the chair around and settled into it, his posture easy as he fixated on the dim corridor outside. Lumian waited in abnormal silence, as he held a certainty that the figure he awaited would materialize. As moments ticked away, the couple's voices escalated into a quarrel anew, and the rowdy drunkards began to trickle onto the street. The soft patter of hesitant steps drew near room 207, each sound echoing the uncertainty. A sly grin played upon Lumian's lips, and he reclined in the chair, his gaze steady on the door. Before too long, Anthony Reed stepped into view, garbed in a military green shirt and matching pants, capped off by tall leather boots. His hair lay cropped and thin. Standing within the circle of light cast by the carbide lamp, he regarded Lumian seated at the wooden table, a smirk adorning his lips. His features danced in a contorted display. In a rich timbre, he intoned, I know you're trying to provoke me. I know you're acting, but... You're correct. Anthony Reed, middle-aged and weathered, raised his right hand and pressed it to his chest, his expression one of fierce resolve. Over these past few years, my heart has been seared by anguish and righteous anger. A knowing smile graced Lumian's face as he shut his eyes momentarily, sensing the pyromaniac potion digesting a little. He rose from his seat and addressed Anthony Reed, saying, Truth wields the mightiest power of persuasion. Anthony Reed felt a weight lift after speaking, the inner conflict and confusion subsiding. He ventured into room 207, the door clicking shut behind him. His eyes swept over the surroundings in a swift assessment. Did you truly eliminate Hugues Artois? How deep did your investigation penetrate? Celia Bello, the one who assassinated Hugues Artois, is a friend of mine. It was I who first unearthed the heretic cults supporting Hugues Artois, Lumian responded in a matter-of-fact tone before extending a sincere apology. My earlier words held a deceit, and for that, I'm sorry. Anthony Reed was taken aback. Which statement? A mischievous grin curved Lumian's lips. Actually, we haven't even embarked on the trail to uncover the people and forces behind Hugues Artois. Chapter 308, Incomprehensible Choice The plump, middle-aged Anthony Reed found himself taken aback. But after a brief moment, he grinned in a self-deprecating way and uttered, I was so rattled that I couldn't even judge the authenticity of that sentence. As anticipated, a spectator must take a seat in the audience. Lumian remained calmly seated, his smile unwavering. No, it's not that simple. Why did I leap off the barstool? Why did I murmur into your ear from behind? My aim was to shield you from my subtle expressions and involuntary body language. In those moments, your emotions were already stirred, blurring your ability to decipher my true intent. A short pause followed Anthony Reed's contemplative silence, then he spoke, that's one reason. Another lies in your characteristic demeanor. I don't know if you've caught on but you tend to put on a bit of a show, appear nonchalant, or in modern terms, act cool. Just then, I believe those actions, given the circumstances, were in line with your usual behavior, aimed at lending weight to your words. So, suspicion didn't even cross my mind. 
A chuckle escaped Lumian's lips. It's only natural for a lad like me to yearn for a touch of coolness, a bit of swagger. It also conveniently masks my true motives. Actually, both are genuine. That's why they remain impervious to scrutiny. It was akin to him having fire ravens circling him with one hand in his pocket, unleashing them on his adversaries as he advanced. First, it was undeniably cool, and second, he seized the chance to grasp Mr. K's finger to avert any potential mishaps. Anthony Reed pondered momentarily before nodding. Only a superficial motive, steeped in authenticity, can truly deceive a spectator. Raising his right foot over his left knee, Lumian steered the conversation back on track. Our journey to unveil the people and forces behind Hugues Artois hasn't yet commenced, as we are engaged in more pressing matters. But fear not, we shall delve into this matter next week. We possess the relevant sources of information as well. Lumian's strategy involved Jenna delving deeper into Hugues Artois' background through the purifiers, exploring ways she could assist. As the one responsible for Hugues Artois' demise, it was logical for Jenna to keep tabs on the investigation's progress, hoping to unearth all details without arousing the official Beyonder's suspicion. These thoughts and tendencies were inherent in Jenna, so Lumian didn't need to fuel them further. Just a reminder would suffice. In due course, the purifiers could subtly guide Jenna and her companions toward actions they might find inconvenient. This would undeniably supply Anthony Reed's investigation with invaluable leads. Anthony Reed's deep brown eyes mirrored Lumian's figure as he absorbed the discourse in silence. The information broker offered an almost imperceptible nod. I'll stay a while longer. Engaging with spectators of the Beyonder path is straightforward. There's no need to concoct another tale or search for an excuse to sway him. He can ascertain the truth for himself. Lumian flashed a grin and gestured toward the bed. Take a seat. This way, he needn't expose Jenna's true identity or her role as a purifier informant. Anthony Reed stood near the door, rooted in place, and spoke, You've more or less sussed out what's happened to me. Is there something else you want me to add? I'd prefer a more detailed account, Lumian responded without much ceremony. Having been through the Poison Spur mob, the Bliss Society, the Cordu catastrophe, Roar and Michelle's deaths, and the explosion at the Goodville Chemical Factory, Lumian found the evil gods and their minions abnormally repulsive. His casual demeanor had been replaced by a newfound seriousness. Once, he'd believed that people could fancy whatever beliefs they pleased, that it didn't concern him. Now, his perspective had entirely changed. He held that only heretics who'd gone to their grave were the good ones. The living ones were ticking time bombs of doom, liable to unleash havoc on him and his companions sooner or later. So, he wasn't just spinning tales for Anthony Reed. He truly planned on delving into Hugues Artois affairs and uncovering more of those heretics when he could spare a moment. Moreover, this could endear him to Mr. K and the Aurora Order. Of course, it did seem quite odd for a wanted mob leader to be lending a hand to the authorities in taking down cultists. Anthony Reed's expression darkened as he said, Towards the end of the war with the Lowen Kingdom, my comrades and I were stationed at a vital route in the northern foothills of the Hornasis mountain range. Our commanding officer was Major Hugues Artois. We were split into three companies, each at different positions. We were to prevent small Lowen Kingdom beyonder teams from crossing the treacherous path and attacking us from the rear, as well as defend against direct assaults. That night, gunshots and cannon fire suddenly shattered my sleep. I watched as my comrades were torn apart, one by one, from behind. Their heads exploding, bodies rent asunder. The earth became a sea of blood. At this point, Anthony Reed's breath quickened, as if he was reliving the trauma. He paused for a moment before continuing, in the midst of that war, I had a fortuitous encounter that pushed my sequence upward. I never reported it to Hugues Artois. Using my newfound abilities, I managed to break through the encirclement with four wounded comrades and retreated. Two of them were gravely hurt and were left behind on the mountain path for, forever. I can still see their pained and angry gazes. At first, I thought maybe one of the other positions had been compromised, or that Lowen's airships had dropped troops behind us under cover of darkness. 
But later, I realized that the reason was that Hughes Artois company had chosen to retreat without informing us, after encountering only a probing attack. Lumian pondered for a moment before replying, when Hughes Artois ordered the retreat, didn't those soldiers question it? Didn't they try to get word to the other two positions? Hughes Artois was our commanding officer, and he knew how to give rousing speeches. Plus, he had a warrant supposedly signed by General Philip, Anthony Reed said, his expression grim. The soldiers back then assumed he had already passed on orders to the other positions. I still can't wrap my head around why he'd sacrifice us. It wouldn't have taken much time or caused him any harm. Maybe he was overwhelmed and forgot, Lumian suggested, not out to defend the late Hugues Artois, merely offering a possible explanation. Anthony Reed shook his head. He wasn't a green recruit on his first battlefield. He had proven his mettle in prior fights, showed his leadership under duress. Lumian didn't delve further, allowing Anthony Reed to continue. Once we found out the truth, the three of us fought to bring Hughes Artois to military court, but it was futile. They'd simply tell us that imagination was an evidence. Helpless, we watched Hughes Artois shift into politics after the war and rise through the ranks. My other two comrades were frail to start with. They passed away burdened by fury and pain. When Hughes Artois threw his hat in the ring for the Enlightenment Party in the Market District's parliamentary election, I ended up here. Lumian nodded slightly and inquired, being an information broker, that's to hide your true identity? No, I've been scraping by as an information broker for a few years now, Anthony Reed replied with a wry smile. Plus, this cover helps me dig deeper into Hughes Artois dealings. Any breakthroughs? Lumian asked naturally. Anthony Reed's expression darkened as he answered, Hugues Artois foray into politics seems unremarkable. He rode General Phillips' coattails and climbed the ladder. His eloquence caught the eye of several senior Enlightenment Party MPs. And he forged ties with a handful of ex-noble families. Is General Philip a concern? Lumian queried, straightforward as ever. Anthony Reed sighed slowly, his voice heavy, the general met his end before I could investigate him. Official word is, illness took him. Lumian posed a few more questions before saying, I'll catch up with you when I've got more to share. Sure. Anthony Reed understood Lumian's sincerity. After departing Aubert's du Coke door, Lumian made his way back to the safe house on Rue de Blouse's Blanches. He swung open the iron cabinet, retrieving a hefty stack of information concerning the denizens of the spirit world. Within the assortment, he discovered a notebook labeled Sights in the Spirit World. Flipping through a couple of pages, he could feel a surge of frustration and anxiety creeping into his mind. His immediate aim wasn't to grasp the intricacies of the spirit world, but rather to pinpoint suitable creatures from that realm. Thus, he closed the notebook and delved into the introductions of the various spirit world entities. Somewhat inexplicably, after poring over the pages for over half an hour, Lumian sensed his mental energy draining away. His thoughts seemed to evaporate, forcing him to bring his study session to an abrupt close. He sprawled out on the bed, drifting into slumber. Early the next morning, Lumian arrived at apartment 601, 3 Rue de Blouse's Blanches, and rang the doorbell. Franca had already risen from her sleep, attired in her customary shirt and breeches. She directed her gaze towards Lumian and inquired, What brings you here so early? Lumian's eyes flicked towards Jenna, who occupied the living room, a smile tugging at his lips. Isn't today the day Jenna advances to being an instigator? I'm here to witness the moment. A frown played across Franca's features as she muttered, You seem quite concerned about her. Absolutely, Lumian affirmed, his grin widening. Once she's an instigator, she can aid me in dealing with Guillaume Benet. While I can't exactly count on her for a direct confrontation, she'll excel at launching sneak attacks and surveying the surroundings to forestall any potential mishaps. Jenna emitted a derisive snort, while Franca offered a mix of exasperation and amusement through a tongue click. Your words are like honey. The kind that's already been digested? Lumian chuckled, his self-awareness evident. Chapter 309 – Restoring Confidence
Naturally, Franca caught on to Lumian's true intentions, otherwise, her instigator potion would have been a wasted effort. She felt satisfied that Lumian was one who wouldn't falter in a battle of sophistry, and she hoped he could maintain that. Come on in. Franca gestured for Lumian to step into the living room. Right then, boxes already occupied the coffee table, containing demon throat honey guide and other ingredients. Simply glancing at these items stirred something in Lumian, an urge to devour them. Thankfully, it wasn't overwhelming. It was more like hungry folks eyeing a chef grilling lamb. Jenna's focus had returned to the ingredients. Gazing at the white porcelain broth bowl with its dual handles and cover, she found it absurd that she was going to consume it the same way she had consumed the assassin potion. How was this potion concoction? It seemed more like cocktail mixing or broth preparation. Mysticism was nowhere to be found. Jenna inhaled deeply, then poured 100 milliliters of pure water into the broth bowl using a measuring cylinder. She added the demon throat honey guide and the dark prowler poison sack. Amidst the bubbling sounds, the two main ingredients fused in the pure water. A manifestation of the law of beyonder characteristics convergence. Lumian observed closely, holding his words. Franca carefully unsheathed a ritual dagger and conjured a wall of spirituality around the living room. The hive-like heart and the dark green poison sack began to dissolve simultaneously, coloring the pure water in the white porcelain bowl with a gleaming black hue. Jenna then added the syrinx of the demon throat honey guide, five drops of blue jimson weed juice, and ten grams of fern powder. Finally, she tossed in an unpeeled walnut. Watching the walnut disappear as if swallowed by crimson molten steel, Jenna couldn't help but feel a shiver of fear. Can this thing really be drunk? Not bad. It's exactly like the instigator potion I brewed before, Franca commended with an easy smile. Of course it's the same. Concocting a potion is that simple. Lumian thought to himself. Franca waved her hand, her confidence unwavering, and continued, no need to fret. Downing a Sequence 8 potion directly won't trouble you. Plus, you've already digested the assassin potion. Infected by her confidence, Jenna's expression gradually turned resolute. Oh, you're employing instigation, are you? Is this an upright approach for an instigator? Lumian grasped Franca's intentions, yet he didn't call her out. Jenna steeled herself and composed her mind. She picked up the double-handled broth bowl and lifted it to her lips. Gazing at the obsidian potion fizzing with tiny bubbles, as though harboring hidden desires and ill intent, she tilted her head back and poured the contents from the porcelain bowl into her mouth. An acute pain coursed from her mouth down to her esophagus, radiating to her brain and other parts of her body. The pain jolted her awake, memories of the explosion at Goodville Chemical Factory flashing through her mind. She gained fresh insights, a better understanding of the true intentions and thoughts of those involved. She sensed malevolent thoughts that had either come to fruition or were waiting to be acted upon. Soon, Jenna's heart was filled with rage, loathing, and a desire to obliterate those individuals and matters. She felt an urge to cease holding back and unleash her emotions. Recalling Franca's repeated warnings, she resisted letting her hatred, anger, and desires take the reins. She clenched her fists, standing still. Her shadow seemed to deepen, and her brownish-yellow hair appeared to lengthen. In a little over ten seconds, the pain gradually receded, and Jenna reconnected with her body. It's indeed quite easy. Most of the reason why I'm feeling half-dead after gulping down potions at a low sequence is due to inevitability's corruption. Lumian sighed. Jenna swiftly gathered her thoughts and stretched her limbs, examining the changes in her body. Oh, my body's definitely gotten stronger. And I've got this new ability, instigation. It's actually pretty great. Instigation is more than just an ability. It lets me feel what others are feeling, emotions, desires, even malice. It sharpens my thinking and analytical skills. Ha, huh, I'll have to use this to my advantage. Can't have Seal always making fun of my smarts and performance. Even if I don't speak, using instigation actively will make me seem more reliable and approachable. It'll help folks around me think better of me. 
with the instigation ability and some clever talk, I can plant certain thoughts or desires in someone's mind, making them choose to act the way I want. After a quick adjustment, Jenna confirmed that her combat skills hadn't improved significantly, but she could be much more valuable in other situations. How'd it go? Told you there wouldn't be any trouble, Franca said with a grin, her satisfaction not hidden at all. Jenna's blue eyes still had traces of black threads in them. She let out a relieved breath and replied, I was a bit worried earlier. That's just the way it is at low sequences. You'll need to be careful when you move up to sequence 7, Franca reminded Jenna, ensuring she didn't underestimate the risks of a potion. Jenna nodded and said to Franca, I owe you 30,000 Verldor, including this time. I'll pay you back in installments. She included the assassin potion from earlier. Franca had discussed this with Jenna the night before. She had intended to treat it as a gift. After all, she could continue selling the potion formula and information about the Deep Valley Quarry. However, seeing Jenna's determination, she decided to accept it after some thought. With a smile, she replied at that moment, no need to rush. Take your time repaying. You could even stretch it into a 20 or 30 year loan. Lumian couldn't help but click his tongue and turn to Jenna. Has the compensation from the Goodville Chemical Factory come through? Imra and Valentine told me the legal process is done. Once the auction wraps up, the assets will be distributed, perhaps in two weeks. Jenna didn't quite grasp why Lumian was suddenly bringing this up. Julian and I should get around 6,000 Verldor. We'll split it evenly after settling our debts. Honestly, I don't really want it, but you won't agree for sure. Lumian nodded and inquired further, and what about your father's compensation? Because of the Goodville chemical factory explosion, the court's given its final say, but the factory owner's dragging his feet. Ugh, is he trying to move his assets out before he pays up? Jenna's tone carried a hint of anger as she spoke about it. A chuckle escaped Lumian's lips. How about this? We pay a visit to the families waiting for compensation soon. You instigate them, and I'll incite them. We alternate, gather them at the factory owner's place, and demand what's owed to them. It helps them and gives us a chance to digest the potion. The factory owner's got a bunch of armed guards, and he's got ties to the police. What if they hurt the people just asking for their dues? They're already going through so much, Jenna expressed her concern. Lumian arched an eyebrow and replied, the court has made its decision. They've got every right to seek their compensation. If anyone dares to fire shots, I promise they won't shoot again. Don't worry, with us around, they'll be safe. Besides, you can give the heads up to the purifiers. They'll understand. Jenna was convinced, her thoughts racing. Damn it, you're inciting me. While she grumbled, she accepted Lumian's idea and decided to gather information as soon as possible to figure out where the factory owner was now residing. Simultaneously, another thought crossed her mind. Now that I'm an instigator, I need to interact with the entrustee. It's a task from the purifiers. Franca, when's the next meetup? Franca said indignantly, next weekend. Reaching out to the entrustee is risky business. The purifiers are kind of taking advantage of your lack of knowledge by only advancing you one ingredient for the instigator potion. If it were me, I'd demand a better deal. Habitual instigation. Lumian chuckled inwardly. As Franca and Jenna tidied up the coffee table, Lumian remained seated in an armchair, looking all repulsive. After a while, Jenna approached him, her body lowering. Lumian turned his head in surprise. With a confident smirk, Jenna adjusted her hair. I can safely say that you didn't just show up to watch me drink that potion for dealing with Guillaume Benet. Her grin was playful and teasing. Though she wasn't wearing makeup, it brought Lumian back to their first meeting when she was an underground singer at Sal de Ball Breeze. Before Lumian could respond, Jenna straightened up and strolled toward the bathroom, leaving behind a casual question. Is it really so hard to admit that we're friends and you care about your friends? On his way back to Sal de Ball Breeze, Lumian mulled over his role as pyromaniac. He was teetering on the edge of taking the first step towards digesting the potion, 
his hunger for more acting chances was insatiable. Though I must set aflame minds and society, I cannot overlook the elemental act of kindling substances and fulfilling fire's symbolic essence. Who would be a suitable candidate for burning? As these thoughts raced through his mind, Lumian's gaze spotted Baron Brignes. The mob leader, who usually emulated German Sparrow, had discarded his customary poise and genteel demeanor. Instead, he marched restlessly and agitatedly along Avenue du Marquet, his eyes darting around incessantly. Lumian fixated on him briefly, though Baron Brignes remained oblivious. Baffled, he retraced his steps to Sal de Ball Breeze and inquired of Sarkota, who had once served under Baron Brignes, do you have any knowledge of what happened to Brignes? I observed him in a state of great unease just now. The reticent Sarkota glanced towards the café's glass window and replied, Baron Brignes's illegitimate son has gone missing. Illegitimate son? Gone missing? Lumian's thoughts immediately turned to the young lad Baron Brignes had picked up from the Suet Steam Locomotive Station. Chapter 310 Encounter How did he go missing? Lumian asked, puzzled. Baron Brignes wasn't just a mob leader, he was a beyonder, too. As long as he was attentive, how could he allow his child to disappear? Moreover, who in the market district would dare to snatch his child? Sarkota shook his head. He didn't provide details. Could it be the machinations of the Rose School of Thought, striving to expose the truth about the Savoy mob from Baron Brignes? With recent events woven into the mix, Lumian had some unconfirmed theories. After a brief pause of thought, he inquired, Do you know what Brignes's illegitimate son looks like? Sarkota nodded. The Baron's underlings came by with a portrait that resembles a photograph. A portrait that resembles a photograph. Had he invoked ritualistic magic? Lumian's memory recalled the contents of Aurora's grimoires. Gazing at the brilliant sunlight streaming through the window, he turned to Sarkota. Gather some men and aid Brignes. Regardless of whether the child was ensnared by the Rose School of Thought or had truly gone missing, if they couldn't locate him soon, the outcome would be grim. At his age, even without additional complications, his fate as a street urchin wouldn't be kind. Understood. Sarkota refrained from inquiring why his boss had decided to lend a hand to Baron Brignes. After all, it wasn't yet noon, and Sal de Ball Breeze had just commenced operations. The real hustle and bustle didn't kick in until three or four in the afternoon. Apart from the janitors and kitchen staff, most folks had time aplenty. Lumian ordered a glass of ice water topped with sugar-infused alcohol and stood on the café's balcony, observing the mobsters interrogating vagrants along Avenue du Marquet. After a while, Rat Cristo appeared. The diminutive smuggling chief emerged from an alley, trailed by seven or eight dogs of varying hues and breeds, and entered the diagonally opposite alley. Before long, he drew nearer to Sal de Ball Breeze. At this sight, Lumian finished the remaining alcohol, placed the glass on the railing, and leaped from the second floor to the street. Christo, his two rat-like whiskers wiggling, approached with a sycophantic grin. Good morning, Seal. Are you aiding Brignes in locating his illegitimate son? Lumian inquired directly. Christo nodded gently. Indeed. He personally reached out to me for assistance. Coincidentally, these kids excel at tracking down people. As the rat spoke, he affectionately patted the dogs' heads. They alternated between gathering and dispersing, following a distinct scent. Baron Brignes truly cares for that illegitimate son. Lumian advised Rat Cristo with a pensive air, there might be something peculiar about this situation. Stay vigilant. I don't want you to go missing before finding the boy. The Rose School of Thought being responsible for abducting the boy was always one of the possibilities. Christo was taken aback, pondered for a moment, and remarked, there's indeed something amiss. In recent years, we've never heard of Brignes having such a son. Moreover, he holds him in high regard. Why would the boy vanish? A sudden appearance of an illegitimate child? Lumian's intuition suggested this might be more intricate than he presumed. After contemplating briefly, Christo gratefully said, 
seal, your intellect surpasses mine. Don't you possess medicine to enhance your mind? Lumian inquired, half jesting and half curious. As Christo allowed the dogs to nuzzle his trousers, he sheepishly smiled and replied, Indeed, but they're short-term solutions. Their effects are middling, nowhere near the potency of a potion. Damn it, excessive consumption can lead to complications. Lumian shifted the conversation, asking, Do you possess authentic mummy ashes? Christo assumed an enigmatic expression. How much do you require? I can provide you with the best version. That little minx Jenna often frequents Franca. She's a tricky one. Just days ago, Franca inquired if I had genuine mummy ashes. TSK, even the boss is having trouble. Seal also had numerous dancers and actresses as mistresses. Despite his youth, he still relied on medicine. I mean true mummy ashes. Lumian stroked his chin. I don't. Christo shook his head. That stuff is ineffective, and I don't know who propagated the falsehood, but I do have a concoction that can satisfy all your paramours. It's composed of various herbs, I merely claim mummy ashes as the primary ingredient. Did Franca buy it? Lumian inquired with a grin. She did. Christo cooperatively chuckled. Probably because the boss is too embarrassed to approach me. Her facade was impeccable. She concealed her true desires from the rat, seeking the so-called ineffective mummy ashes. Lumian sighed and confessed openly, I need genuine mummy ashes. They possess mystical uses. Keep an eye out since you often engage with merchants trading in alchemical materials. No problem. Christo suspected that Seal aimed to preserve his dignity and wouldn't acknowledge his quest for such a remedy. He insisted on mysticism as a pretext for seeking mummy ashes but didn't expose him. After all, it was a minor matter. Observing Christo's persistent search for Baron Brignese's missing illegitimate son with his dogs, Lumian turned on his heel and made his way back to the dance hall. As he was about to approach the bar counter, Termoboros's commanding voice reverberated in his ears, to the cellar. To the cellar. Lumian's initial thought was that the inevitability angel had something planned. Which cellar, he inquired. The one used to store ingredients, replied Termoboros. So proactive, so eager. What's he plotting? Lumian began to wonder if there was an underlying scheme at play. Termoboros continued, it's a stroke of fate for you. Even if you don't go, it will find its way to you. It's destined. You're giving me chills. Termoboros won't likely put me in immediate danger right now. What could be in that cellar? Lumian contemplated briefly and reckoned that the ingredient storage cellar was usually bustling around noon. In theory, there shouldn't be anything unusual or perilous. After careful consideration, he decided to head to the cellar, listen at the door, and take a look. If he sensed anything awry, he would write to Madame Magician and inquire if he should heed Termoboros's advice and enter. Amidst the greetings of the chefs, kitchen helpers, handymen, and dishwashing maids, Lumian crossed through the kitchen and descended the stairs to the ingredient storage cellar. The cellar's dark brown wooden door was securely shut, as usual. Lumian strained his ears, intently listening for any signs of activity. A faint chewing sound reached his ears. It wasn't a dramatic sound, devoid of the horrifying notion of a creature devouring flesh. Rather, it resembled a tramp gnawing on food after a long bout of hunger. Something's definitely amiss. Lumian cautiously pushed open the cellar door. The light from the stairs seeped in, revealing a figure. It was a boy of seven or eight, his back to Lumian. He had short yellow hair, a caramel coat, white stockings and black strapless leather shoes. Behind him lay a dark red school bag that seemed somewhat weighty and sturdy. Lumian found the attire oddly familiar. Suddenly, he recalled where he'd seen it before. Baron Brignese's illegitimate son. So, his disappearance led him to hiding in the ingredient cellar of Sal de Balbris? Lumian had intended to take a quick glance before shutting the door and leaving to pen a letter to Madame Magician at Aubert's du Cope door. Yet, upon realizing that the person in the cellar was likely Baron Brignese's illegitimate son, 
he furrowed his brow slightly and swung open the dark brown wooden door a bit more. Additional light streamed in, causing the boy to instinctively turn and face the door. Lumian caught sight of the brass buttons on his clothes, a black and white checkered shirt, and a linen coat. He saw a face with evident baby fat, unperturbed but vacant brown eyes, and a mouth smeared with blood. The boy clutched a few raw steaks tinged with a dark red hue in his hand. His mouth kept opening and closing as he chewed on a vague mass of flesh resembling a rat. Its thin black tail gently swayed near his lips. Lumian narrowed his eyes and slipped his left hand into his pocket. The boy remained unperturbed, his gaze vacant as he continued staring at Lumian. He chewed a few more times before swallowing the bloody rat, tail and all. Lumian arched an eyebrow and asked, Are you Brignaza's illegitimate son? No, the boy mumbled, nibbling at a piece of raw steak. Then what's your connection? Lumian queried in a peaceful manner. After a while of eating raw steak, the boy answered, He's my godfather and guardian and trier. Remarkably precise in Tishan, hardly any accent. Lumian regarded the peculiar boy with puzzlement and probed, Are you running away from home? Yes, the boy replied, blood staining his mouth as he continued nibbling on the raw steak. Behind him stretched a thick darkness, enveloped by the dim light from the corridor. Why did you flee from your godfather? Do you need me to help you return? Lumian asked, offering a friendly smile, noticing that the other party was more amicable in conversation. The boy shook his head vigorously. No. I don't want to go back to attending classes, studying, doing homework, taking practice tests, and sitting for exams. W.H., the boy's reasoning left Lumian oddly bewildered, as if he had glimpsed his own past. He was intelligent and had no trouble attending classes, reading, or taking exams. He absorbed knowledge swiftly, but he disliked homework or practice tests. He relied on Aurora's heartfelt education to barely persevere. He often wished he could rope in Raimund, Ava, and his friends to do those tasks for him. Is this rat-chewing enigma the fateful encounter Termoboros alluded to? Lumian pondered and inquired, You don't seem to be fermentous? With an honest demeanor and a bloodied mouth, the boy responded, I'm from Lenberg. Chapter 311, Strange Boy Lenberg? Baron Brignaza's illegitimate son or godchild resides in Lenberg? Lumian was puzzled, his mind racing with playful guesses. Baron Brignaz places a high value on education, entrusting his most beloved child to the kingdom of the god of knowledge and wisdom for learning. Lumian studied the young lad before him and asked in a laid-back tone, aren't you supposed to be hitting the books in Lenberg at your age? The education there is leagues ahead of what Trier offers. The boy's face lit up with an oddly animated expression. Nah, I'm not up for the daily grind of school, burning the midnight oil over homework, and tackling exams every month. Sounds a little terrifying. A shiver trickled down Lumian's spine at the thought of such a life. At the very least, it didn't sit right with him. Agreeing with a nod, Lumian casually asked, Are live rats tasty? The boy regained his composure. It's not exactly gourmet, but I can't be choosy when hunger gnaws. Waiting till midday to raid the kitchen doesn't cut it. True bliss is savoring a meal whipped up by a maestro chef. And some mild hunger pangs do add a certain flair. After explaining, he must have felt he came across too mature and quickly recalibrated. Can't blame me if your kitchen's dragging its feet until noon. Well, that's hardly the point, now, is it? When I was wandering about without a proper place to stay, I sure as heck didn't have any notions of munching on live rats. The big issue, of course, was that I couldn't even catch the pesky things. And if by some miracle I did, then I had to somehow figure out how to set up a fire, skin them, and roast them. But this kid right here? He's out here grabbing rats, using nothing but his own bare hands. His strength or maybe just his good luck isn't half bad, I'll give him that. It's not even an hour away from noon, and he's acting like he's got an insatiable hunger? The more Lumian looked at him, the more he was convinced there was something peculiar about this little lad. Amused, he inquired, 
Brignais didn't bother to feed you, then. Need me to escort you to the police headquarters so you can lodge a complaint about his child abuse? Well, aside from pestering me about my studies, he's all right. He makes sure I have a proper meal every two hours. On top of that, he whips up cakes, biscuits, roasted meat, and pies for those midnight hunger pangs. A subtle lick of the lips revealed the boy's longing. Are you a pig? Lumian had never eaten so much while undergoing puberty. And yet, the lad didn't appear overweight, only solidly built. In the blink of an eye, the boy's gaze shifted as he spoke in rapid succession, perhaps studying demands a lot of energy. I need all this sustenance to keep my brain firing on all cylinders. Is there no saying about how trying to explain is just a cover-up in Lenberg's education? Your elaborate justification makes me wonder if your appetite is problematic. All this eating hasn't exactly made you a genius, has it? Lumian grinned and quipped, if Brignais wasn't intentionally starving you, why resort to raw rats and steak? In a frustrated tone, the boy retorted, I managed to slip away without breakfast or morning tea today. And yet, you're so famished that you're downing raw rats? If you go hungry for another half day or so, will you start eyeing pedestrians on the street? With a fluid motion, Lumian produced an iron-gray military flask from his shirt pocket. His left hand slid into his trouser pocket, deftly unscrewing the cap of the flask before tucking it away. Lumian raised the iron-gray metal flask, breathing in the fragrance with a satisfied grin. He inquired, his voice light, fancy a sip? Gulp! The boy's Adam's apple bobbed as he swallowed his saliva. Struggling, he responded, I'm not of age yet. I'm just a kid. He's tasted it before, and he's taken a liking to it. Lumian passed his judgment and swallowed a mouthful of the spirit. Maintaining the military flask at his lips, he spoke in a casual tone, a question hanging in the air, which deity do you believe in? Why were you asking? The boy inquired cautiously. Seeing the lack of alarm, Lumian breathed a sigh of relief. He tipped the flask again, the liquid gurgling. He lowered the military flask, his expression bright as he spoke with clarity, as a devout follower of the god of steam and machinery, I've got to verify the faith of those with uncertain origins. By steam. This time, Lumian spoke without the veil of alcohol. Subconsciously, the boy shook his head. Words don't mean much. Just saying I believe in whichever deity doesn't make it true. Lumian studied the boy's reaction. It's true that folks from the Orthodox churches can sometimes claim belief in any deity without much sincerity, but they're harmless. I'm more concerned about worshippers of evil gods. They're fervent and unpredictable. They won't fake it to deceive others, believing that to be against their faith and blasphemous. Instinctively, the boy retorted, not always. Some followers of evil gods will pose as adherents of the Orthodox gods to further their holy missions. They can pray, attend rituals, join mass, and chant the names of other gods without a second thought, as long as they repent to their own deity afterward, they reckon there's no issue. At that moment, the young lad abruptly halted. He exchanged gazes with Lumian and lapsed into a prolonged silence. After a spell, he took a bite out of his uncooked steak and introduced himself, I'm a believer of the God of knowledge and wisdom. The devoted faithful in our church have this peculiar knack for pointing out slip-ups in the other party's speech, just like before. Yep, just like before. Lumian fixed a piercing gaze on the lad for a few beats before inquiring, what might be the usual prayers at the God of Knowledge and Wisdom Church? Quick as a flash, the boy responded, like I was saying earlier, folks who believe in those evil gods can mutter the honorific name of an orthodox god with a heavy heart and toss out those prayers. You can't rightly figure out what's in others' minds unless you're a card-carrying member of the Eternal Blazing Sun Church and you've got it notarized that you won't lie. With that, the lad clammed up once more, his gaze fixed vacantly on Lumian. After a brief pause, he stretched out his empty right hand and pressed it to his forehead. May wisdom be with you. Such a foolish fellow shouldn't be a spy sent by an evil god. From his intelligence, he's really a child. Lumian struggled to maintain his composure, requiring a concealed deep breath to regain control over his facial muscles. 
Indeed, he concurred, his lips curving into a smile. Mirroring the boy's action, he brushed his head with the base of the iron-gray military flask and uttered with significance, May wisdom be with you. Without affording the boy a chance to reply, Lumian adopted an alluring tone. Would you care to join me at the cafe on the second floor? I'll treat you to a proper meal. The chefs here are quite remarkable. The boy swallowed visibly. You won't turn against me, will you? You can tail me the entire time. That way, I won't ever get a shot at double-crossing you. Lumian initiated a little trial, testing if the other guy's brains matched his looks and age, or maybe they lagged behind. And mind you, we only prohibit the God of Knowledge and Wisdom Church from preaching in Intus or setting up a cathedral. We do let their believers cross the border. Trier's got the Lenberg Chamber of Commerce, you see. The boy pondered for a moment and said, Okay. Lumian sized him up, withdrew his left hand, sealed the liquor flask, and tucked the iron gray flask back in his brown coat. Then, he pressed his forehead again. May wisdom be with you. With that, Lumian pivoted and ascended the stairs. The kid stuck to him, politely shutting the cellar's deep brown door behind him. Seeing Lumian whirl around, the kid explained earnestly, if it's left open, the food inside will spoil. True enough. Lumian pulled his gaze and climbed up the stairs. The kid trailed him close, eyes peeled for any odd moves, any signs of betrayal. Lumian steered him into the kitchen, then upstairs to the cafe on the second floor and ordered a set meal. In no time, the spread hit the table, fried veal steak, grilled eel, roasted leg of lamb, chicken pie, red wine, and cream. Lumian settled in, watching the kid wolfing down like he was bottomless. Every now and then, he tossed a comment, veal is crisped good, but the meat is nothing special. Sweet sauce masks the eel's fishiness, but it makes it greasy. Leg of lamb is roasted just right, crispy outside, tender inside. Spices are off a touch, though. Too much fennel. Dot. Just eat. Why are you so talkative? Lumian silently watched the boy eat the table full of food with a satisfied expression. Fifteen minutes later, Baron Brignes walked in from the second floor entrance, donning a half-top hat with a diamond ring shining. The boy turned in surprise and glanced back at Lumian. Lumian smiled and said, Did you think I'm the only one here who knows you? The boy was startled as he fell silent. Baron Brignes walked up to Lumian and said with unconcealed relaxation, Appreciate it, seal. Just so happened to catch him skulking around in the cellar, Munching on something, Lumian responded, his voice warm and friendly. Baron Brignes gave him a sidelong glance before shifting his attention to the boy. Time to head back, Ludwig. Ludwig, the young boy, remained silent. Swiftly, he polished off the last remnants of his meal and rose from his seat. Seal, we'll catch up, Baron Brignes directed a nod at Lumian. Seated opposite, Lumian observed as Baron Brignes clasped Ludwig's hand, their departure imminent. Lumian's lips curved again before saying, Don't forget to settle the tab. Baron Brignes displayed a hint of surprise. His eyes flickered, suggesting a momentary uncertainty in his initial assessment. Yet without uttering a word, he withdrew a wallet brimming with banknotes and promptly covered the cost of Ludwig's meal. Lumian maintained a contemplative silence watching the duo disappear down the stairwell. Leaning back in his chair, he murmured softly, his voice a mere whisper, Temoboros, where exactly is the stroke of fate you mentioned? Chapter 312, Hint Though Lumian maintained a cautious skepticism toward Temoboros, his curiosity about the enigmatic stroke of fate continued to gnaw at him. The way Termoboros had alluded to the earth blood or as an encounter had caught his attention. Could this time involve Ludwig, the young boy? There was something off about this fellow, something amiss. Yet, as their conversation unfolded, Lumian came to acknowledge Ludwig's intelligence, origins, and apparent devotion to the god of knowledge and wisdom. Despite this interaction, Lumian found himself gaining no true insights or foresight. 
It was unlike his understanding of the earth blood ore's potential, which hinged on specific conditions of going underground, finding the right area to encounter something. Once again, Termoboros's powerful voice reverberated through Lumian. The moment will reveal itself. Can't you people make yourself clear? Lumian's frustration surged, his blood boiling in his veins. I'm unlike what you consider people, Termoboros responded, straightforwardly. I'm a mythical creature. Dot. Lumian was left speechless, taken aback. He forced a scoff and retorted, I doubt even your sealed form can truly grasp fate's threads. Each time, your answers are mired in vagueness. What sets you apart from amateurs in the divination club? If you possess the power, reveal clearly where my next opportunity lies. Termoboros responded with a deep tone, Tonight, at 11 p.m., Wrist Docks, Warehouse 3. Ha! Huh. Surprise course through Lumian, Termoboros's hint was unexpected. Yet, within his astonishment, puzzlement persisted. Inevitability's angel is that kind? As a high-ranking Oms monk, he shouldn't have been provoked so easily to interpret my fate. Could there be an ulterior motive? Regardless, I'll consult Madame Magician's insight first. Lumian decided swiftly. He rose, departed Sal de Ball Breeze, and embarked on a journey to Rue de Blouse's Blanches. Executing a simple act of arson, he could initiate the initial potion digestion step and contemplate gaining a contract T boon. Despite his anxiety, Lumian refused to lower his guard against Termoboros. Within Rue de Blouse's Blanches, in the safe house, Lumian meticulously documented the particulars regarding Ludwig and Termoboros's clue. Subsequently, he conducted a ritual, summoning the doll-like messenger. As Lumian awaited Madame Magician's response, he delved into a trove of information concerning spirit world creatures. Reading the descriptions of certain knowledge consumed a substantial amount of his spirituality. Some even induced dizziness, nausea, frustration, headache, a burning sensation, and illusions. Similar to Aurora's grimoire's portrayal of profound knowledge about deities and high-level creatures, this information is fraught with intense corruption and perilous ramifications. If all the knowledge that pursues humans bears such attributes, it's genuinely chilling. The prospect of losing oneself upon hearing it or succumbing to immediate demise is unsettling. Thus, Lumian punctuated his reading to safeguard his mental well-being from plummeting to precarious thresholds. After poring through descriptions of approximately 30 to 40 spirit world creatures, Lumian stumbled upon a figure he recognized. Rabbit of knowledge, weak spirit world creature, friendly to humans and possesses an innate thirst for knowledge. Their summons are rarely declined. Diverse experiences yield distinct rabbits of knowledge. Shared traits include mastery of various languages, spoken and written communication skills, and adept reading capabilities. Extracting salient information from extensive knowledge is their forte, and their transcription speed outpaces even mechanical typewriters. Drawback, limited communication finesse and inflexible thinking. Some rabbits of knowledge have been tainted by anomalous knowledge, evolving into significant hazards. To summon, restrict choices to the friendly and weak. So, it goes by the name rabbit of knowledge. Summoning this entity in the future should be more targeted. Yet, its abilities and attributes are of limited value. If I had gone as per Aurora's vision of university enrollment, I would benefit from its multilingual proficiency and strong reading skills. Noteworthy, the text omits mention of its speed within the spirit realm, implying its negligible worth in that aspect. It moves sluggishly, drains spirituality. Lumian lowered the document, massaged his temples, and embarked on his third respite. During this juncture, the messenger bore Madame Magician's response, I share curiosity regarding what encounter the lad named Ludwig would bring. His appearance in Trier intrigues me, motivations remain nebulous. Vigilance is prudent. His existence carries intrigue. Proceed. The window of acting presents itself to me as well. Can't you people make things clear? Lumian's lips twitched, absorbing the succinct message. However, a nuanced sense emerged that Madame Magician's opening sentence wasn't an immediate response. 
it resonated more as a condensed echo of her contemplations. In essence, Madame Magician, imbued with her astromancy prowess, struggled to glean Ludwig's fate. Her perceptions seemed clouded, suggesting she only harbored conjectures. The obscurity surrounding Ludwig's destiny, evident in her inability to perceive it, spoke volumes. At 10.50 p.m., at Wrist Docks, outside Warehouse 3, Lumian took cover in the shadows, poised to seize the much-anticipated opening for action. Soon enough, two silhouettes approached Warehouse 3, drawing within a mere five to six meters of Lumian. One of them spoke hushedly, riddled with concern, Hector, the accountants arrive tomorrow for an audit. How do we address this? Shall I hire a thief to pilfer the account records? What purpose would that serve? The moment they inspect the warehouse, suspicion will arise. Our remaining stock barely equals a tenth of the required amount. Hector's tone escalated, simmering with intensity. If we're to proceed, we ought to do so comprehensively by reducing the warehouse to ashes. This way, any discrepancies would remain concealed. I see. Listening closely, Lumian deduced his cue to act. As his companion wavered, Hector interjected, fires are commonplace in Trier, normalized in everyone's mind. Moreover, igniting them ourselves isn't necessary. The market district swarms with miscreants and rogues. Once the time is ripe, we can entice them to vacate Trier with a handsome fee. Hanare, we can't wait any longer. You must decide now. Hanare paused, then spoke resolutely, agreed. We'll locate Guy and recruit him into our plan. The duo conducted a swift survey of the warehouse's surroundings before departing for the docks, en route to rendezvous with their comrade, Guy. After a brief trek, the sky abruptly reddened, casting an incandescent hue across the scene. Simultaneously, the crackle of flames resounded. Hanore and Hector instinctively spun around, bearing witness to an inferno emerging. Vermilion flames surged, fierce and ravenous, soaring to engulf the structure. Fire, fire. Hector mumbled, a glint of realization dawning. Indeed, fire. Praise the sun, it's a fire. Hanore exhibited a similar reaction, his right hand tracing a triangular sacred emblem over his chest, lips moving in muted invocation. Yet, within the momentary elation, disquiet brewed within Hanore's senses. Trepidation tinted his voice as he discerned, the warehouse isn't a flame. It's our office. Positioned meters away from the warehouse was their office, a modest gray two-story edifice. The expanse separating it from the warehouse remained empty, devoid of combustible material. Dot. Hector's visage contorted in terror. Clenching his jaw, he spoke with grim resolve, we must set fire to the warehouse now. Even as the words left his lips, an explosion erupted from the locus of crimson flames. Though not seismic, the detonation garnered the attention of dock workers and firefighters. Fire. Fire. The clamor resounded as responders converged. In Trier, a city renowned for frequent conflagrations, firefighters were seasoned in addressing such crises. Observing the scene, Hector and Hanore, who hadn't reached Warehouse 3, slumped onto the roadside, their vigor sapped. At the entrance of the dock, Albus, his hair now a fiery hue, averted his gaze from the raging blaze to the middle-aged man at his side. Monsieur Guy, your colleague seems even more agitated than you. Guy's complexion paled as he shook his head in bewilderment. The warehouse wasn't the target of the fire. A pause lingered before Albus sneered. I warned you already. Hesitation begets mishaps. Now, ponder your escape. May you be more decisive this time. Beside the unassuming two-story structure, Lumian gazed upon the soaring flames. The timber and flammable materials metamorphosed into an ephemeral dragon, casting his countenance in fiery red, eyes alight with fervor. With a grin, he advanced toward the blaze. The duo's intent to commit arson entailed erasing incriminating evidence by reducing the warehouse to ashes. However, Lumian's purpose was to generate turmoil, inviting scrutiny that would unearth the discrepancies within the warehouse. Such was the duty of a responsible citizen. 
A mantle of flames enveloped Lumian, adhering to his attire obediently, merely a hair's breadth from ignition. Donning the flaming cloak, Lumian marched into the roaring blaze. Fire coalesced with fire, repelling smoke. Effortlessly traversing the structure, Lumian exited on the opposite end of the dock. Following the arson, Lumian acquired a rudimentary mastery over the potion's powers. He tamed it, dispelling the burning sensation on his skin and the trepidation in his heart. While his potion digestion remained incomplete, Lumian had already adapted to his present state, giving him the capacity to receive an additional inevitability boon. After carrying out a few rounds of anti-tracking, Lumian returned to the safe house on Rue de Blouse's blanches. Initiating the initial step of digesting the pyromaniac potion prior to tracking down the padre filled him with satisfaction. He maintained a smile, yet his demeanor faltered upon glimpsing the towering pile of dense information within the iron cabinet. It would take at least a month or two to finish reading them. How could he identify an apt contracted creature in so brief a span? Chapter 313 Plans with Different Styles Lumian stood before the iron cabinet, his mind immersed in contemplation. With just a handful of days remaining until the date designated by the prophecy spell, Lumian earnestly aspired to secure contract T status, thereby attaining three distinctive abilities. This enhancement was imperative prior to pursuing Guillaume Benet. The augmentation would tip the odds in his favor. Relying solely on Pyromaniac, even in collaboration with Franca, now a demoness of pleasure, and the support of Anthony Reed and Jenna, prevailing against the Padre's uncanny abilities remained tenuous. Victory might be attainable, but apprehending the adversary without incurring losses was a near-impossible endeavor, except if he enlisted the assistance of the Aurora Order Oracle via Mr. K's finger. This assessment solely considered Guillaume Benet as Lumian's adversary. If the Padre had other confederates, alongside a cohort of bestowers or beyonders, and if he had grown mightier than his state upon departing Cordu, Lumian's undertaking wouldn't assure triumph, even with Mr. K. Lumian's aspiration was to pinpoint the Padre's whereabouts and engineer a snare, drawing him out. Such an approach would markedly simplify the process. Nevertheless, Lumian needed to bolster his strength substantially. Otherwise, the fishing operation would entail dire jeopardy. As Lumian perused the stack of dense information concerning spirit world entities, his mind world, seeking avenues to locate a suitable contract partner within a constrained time frame. Should I designate a time frame for reading and strive to cover as much ground as feasible? Then, my selection must derive from my existing familiarity. This proposition falls short of my expectations. It risks bypassing the most fitting opportunity. Although the circumstances aren't optimal, I must reconcile with reality. Perfection remains elusive, I must confront my own limitations head on. Son of a sow, it hasn't reached a juncture necessitating blind acceptance. For now, I'll withhold any definitive moves until I ascertain the Padre's whereabouts next week. I'll bide my time. Following the completion of this information assimilation, a comprehensive strategy will crystallize, right? It will take approximately a month. The potential for accidents looms large. Ah, the rabbit of knowledge appears to have the ability to read and extract key points. Can I summon one to help me read the information and extract the keywords of every spirit world creature, like when I whistleblowed? Then, I'll carefully study the corresponding spirit world creatures based on the keywords. It's a creature of the spirit world to begin with. Having come into contact with such knowledge, it will definitely be less affected than me and can last longer. Lumian gradually grew excited. The more he thought about it, the more he felt that it was feasible to ask the rabbit of knowledge to help him do the reading and write a brief summary. He swiftly perfected the corresponding plan. That rabbit is quite stupid and silly. I have to design a table in advance and list the page number, strength, whether it's friendly, brief description of abilities, and points of characteristics. I'll let it fill in the columns and step in order. Unfortunately, a person can only summon one rabbit of knowledge at a time. Otherwise, if I had ten or twenty, I will be able to complete the summary on spirit world creatures before dawn. 
If one person can only summon one, what about having more than one person? I can have Franca, Jenna, and Anthony Reed summon one each for me. Ah. Uh. Rabbits can read quickly, extract essential points, and fill out summaries. Humans can do the same. Franca, Jenna, and Anthony can help browse through the information and quickly extract keywords from the columns. I'll contribute knowledge, and they contribute labor, spirituality, and time. Lumian's eyes grew brighter and brighter. He felt that if he pushed this plan forward, even with frequent breaks to mentally recover and the time to summon a rabbit of knowledge again, he should be able to produce a summary on the spirit world creatures in twelve hours. When the time came, he would browse through the summaries that wouldn't affect his mind and select twenty to thirty suitable ones. He would read the raw information in a targeted fashion and make a final decision. The only problem now was that the information on these spirit world creatures had been provided by Madame Magician, Lumian hadn't exchanged it using contributions or money. He believed that before sharing with others, he had to obtain the approval of the major arcana card holder. This was basic respect. Lumian sprang into action without hesitation. Swiftly, he composed a letter outlining his inquiry and the comprehensive plan he had crafted. Soon, Madame Magician responded, For a moment, I don't know what to say about your idea. It appears you possess an aptitude for such considerations. Sharing your knowledge with your friends is permissible, but remember to advise them against engaging with powerful or perilous spirit world creatures. These entities hold no sway over you, thanks to Mr. Fool's seal. It serves as a deterrent in the spirit world, offering you a measure of protection that others lack. Actually, there are simpler and easier ways. Take the information to Two of Cups and spread it in every corner of the room. Then, get Two of Cups to recite the divination statement repeatedly and throw out three tarot cards or three coins. Choose whichever spirit world creature they land on. Even if it's not the most suitable for you, it's relatively suitable. It might be useful in a future occasion. Hiss, what a brilliant charlatan. Madame Magician is indeed skilled in divination. Her style is completely different from mine. Lumian hadn't considered divination. After careful consideration, he decided to follow his plan. The answer chosen through divination always felt unreliable and unreal. He subconsciously didn't want to rely on it. By relying on his own intelligence and abilities to filter them out, he would feel more confident and convinced. Unless there was no other way, Lumian hoped to finish reading the information before making a choice. He burned Madame Magician's reply and carefully wrote up the form. For the time being, he only made five copies. Immediately after, he set up the altar to see if he could accurately summon the Rabbit of Knowledge. To this end, the summoning incantation he had devised was, rabbit-shaped spirit wandering in the void, a friendly creature that can be communicated with, a weakling who pursues knowledge. The choice to avoid using the human-coined rabbit of knowledge as its name spoke of Lumian's respect for the enigmatic nature of these creatures. Having carefully considered his approach, Lumian ignited a solitary candle and made a summoning in his own name. His incantation concluded, and the candle's flame transformed into a deep shade of green, expanding to resemble a human head in size. From within the luminous green flame, a translucent creature emerged, its appearance reminiscent of an amusingly awkward rabbit. Relief washed over Lumian as the ritual proved successful. The creature's presence signaled a triumph, and Lumian's experienced voice addressed it, I wish to share knowledge with you, seeking your assistance in distilling key points and completing a form. The rabbit's eyes brightened, and in a tone that mimicked Lumian's voice and Trier's and Tijan accent, it inquired, Where is the knowledge? This was the first time Lumian had heard such a creature speak. He didn't expect it to imitate his tone and pronunciation. With purpose, Lumian retrieved a stack of information about spirit world creatures he had yet to delve into. He gestured towards the form on the table, articulating the task's parameters in a manner befitting a creature of limited intellect. The rabbit absorbed Lumian's guidance, its long ears drooping as it committed the instructions to memory. Eventually, it nodded in comprehension. Seated at Lumian's desk, the rabbit's eyes sparkled as it engaged with the information. Lumian noted with satisfaction that, 
Despite its unwilling nature, the rabbit demonstrated proficiency in its repetitive task. It diligently extracted pertinent details and methodically filled out the form with words like powerful and dangerous. Although it's not very smart, doing such repetitive work isn't a problem for it. It's at least twice as fast as my reading. Lumian nodded in satisfaction and lay on the bed, preparing to close his eyes and rest while the rabbit of knowledge was busy working to alleviate his fatigue. After an unknown period of time, he suddenly sensed danger and hurriedly sat up. He saw that the transparent rabbit had grown to two meters tall, constantly flipping through the information and extracting. Stop! Lumian didn't understand what was happening and instinctively stopped the other party from coming into contact with the knowledge. The rabbit turned its head, its eyes bloodshot. After staring at Lumian for a few seconds, it reluctantly halted its work. Lumian's introspection led him to deduce the cause behind this transformation. As a creature of the spirit world, the rabbit of knowledge was similarly affected by that knowledge, albeit to a relatively mild extent. However, it wasn't like ordinary humans due to its lacking intelligence. It didn't know to stop and rest after an abnormality unless it directly endangered its life. As it accumulated, it inevitably underwent a certain mutation. Phew, it's useful, that's true, but not having much intelligence is a huge problem. Lumian ended the summoning and allowed the rabbit of knowledge to return to the spirit world and slowly recover. He washed up briefly, lay on the bed, and prepared to rest. An idea surfaced just before sleep claimed him. Lumian summoned the rabbit once more and directed it to replicate a hundred copies of the form he had devised. Only then did he truly relax and fall asleep. The following morning, Lumian was brimming with vigor as he set off for Ruanarchy. His first stop was to locate Anthony Reed, the information broker, and discuss the potential of his assistance. As he approached Aubert's Ducoke door, a figure emerged from a nearby side alley. It was Baron Brignais, adorned in a half-top hat and a formal black suit, mahogany-colored pipe in hand. I promise to catch up with you and express my gratitude for aiding me in finding Ludwig, Baron Brignais began with a smile. It's quite surprising to find you neither at Sal de Ball Breeze nor Aubert's Du Coke door. Gratitude? Then help me read and write a summary. Lumian muttered subconsciously before swiftly dismissing the notion. Compared to Anthony Reed, an information broker with a mental illness, Baron Brignais was not only a member of the Savoy mob, but his background also seemed problematic. It was best not to let him discover that his relationship with Franca didn't rely solely on Jenna. A smile tugged at Lumian's lips. The night offers its own beauty. It's pointless to remain confined within one's room. How do you intend to express your gratitude? Rather than providing a direct answer, Baron Brignais diverted the conversation. I may not have mentioned this earlier, but I converted to the worship of the God of Knowledge and Wisdom a few years back. Chapter 314 Crowdsourcing Did you communicate with your godson and come to me to confirm the situation? Lumian maintained his smile. What you believe has no bearing on me, as long as you don't subscribe to an evil god. Furthermore, devotees of the god of knowledge and wisdom are not wanted criminals and trier. His implication was clear, I'm still a wanted criminal. Believe what you will. Baron Brignais had always been astute. He changed the subject and continued, thank you for aiding me in locating Ludwig. I'm unsure how to adequately express my gratitude. He refrained from specifying a thank you gift, hoping to gauge Lumian's stance and thoughts. Lumian pondered briefly before recalling the idea he had set aside. Getting Baron Brignais to assist with reading and summarizing didn't necessitate his presence alongside Franca, Jenna, and Anthony Reed. He could impart some information, clarify what he needed to focus on, and allow him to return home to peruse and transcribe. Likewise, before Anthony Reed committed to joining the pursuit of Padre Guillaume Benet, direct contact with Jenna and Franca couldn't be allowed. An isolated office could be arranged for him at a later time. Lumian glanced at Baron Brignais and inquired deliberately, Are you proficient in reading and drafting notes? 
Aurora's grimoires had denoted that the pathway under the Church of the God of Knowledge and Wisdom was labeled Reader. This was also the title of Sequence 9 Potion. Sequence 8 was Student of Ratiocination, and Sequence 7 was Detective. Given Baron Brignay's rarely exhibited special abilities and mostly leveraged his exceptional intellect, above-average combat skills, and sharp marksmanship to lead the Savoy mob, coupled with his present faith, Lumian speculated he was a beyonder of the reader path. From the potion's nomenclature alone, one could infer such an individual excelled in reading. Baron Brignay's drew from his pipe and responded, in contrast to the illiterate, my reading and learning aptitude is rather commendable. He couldn't entirely fathom Seal's intentions, yet he suspected Seal was prying into his beyonder pathway. And it wasn't confidential. Gardner Martin had long been privy to this. Lumian unveiled a genuine smile. Of late, I've acquired a trove of information concerning creatures from the spirit world. However, as you're aware, you should be aware, correct? Delving into such knowledge extensively exerts a significant toll on the mind. As a beyonder of the hunter path, I shan't require this information for an extended period. Nevertheless, I wish to have access to the pertinent knowledge when necessity arises, without squandering precious time. Therefore, I intend to furnish you with a portion of the data. Kindly assist me in reading and extracting the key terms. Much akin to constructing an index for a library. Baron Brignes promptly grasped. He grinned and remarked, truthfully, this would prove advantageous to me. That knowledge holds considerable value. Library Index As anticipated of an adherent of the God of Knowledge and Wisdom. How professional! Lumian rejoiced, sensing Baron Brignes was roughly on par with Anthony Reed combined with a rabbit of knowledge. Simultaneously, he harbored a cautious sentiment toward Baron Brignes. For instance, he would furnish this god of knowledge and wisdom follower with ten pages of information. He would peruse them in advance and jot down notes. Subsequently, he would cross-reference them with the index submitted by Baron Brignes to discern any deliberate omissions or alterations. Of course, this was Lumian's unrefined approach. He could alternatively beseech Franca to verify via divination, but the potential for interference still existed. Lumian slid his hands into his pockets and surveyed Baron Brignes, akin to an artisan observing a laborer. He beamed and uttered, I'm indifferent to who benefits, as long as I accomplish my objective. Baron Brignes nodded faintly, refraining from further commentary. He solely apprised Lumian of his whereabouts the following morning and requested the information to be conveyed there. Aubert's du Coke door, room 305. Facing Anthony Reed, Lumian eased back and reiterated his words to Baron Brignes. Concluding, he voiced, this knowledge serves as your compensation. Furthermore, I shall impart to you the knowledge of ritualistic magic. You'll be able to summon a unique spirit world creature to peruse the information alongside you and distill the essential points. How does that proposition strike you? Are you inclined to accept this assignment? Anthony Reed's deep brown eyes mirrored Lumian's form as he contemplated and responded, You're pressed for time. This matter bears added weight for you. It carries great significance. Lumian had no intention of concealing this. He seized the opportunity and conveyed, I'm confronted with the need to face a formidable adversary soon, and I seek to secure a fitting contracted creature. When the moment arrives, I might extend you an invitation primarily in a supportive role. You can consider whether to agree and what form of compensation you desire. Eh, <laughs> there's no rush for an answer. Think over it for the next two days. You're paving the way for me to be mentally prepared and foster appropriate expectations. Anthony Reed deciphered Lumian's thoughts. Instantly, Lumian felt a twinge of embarrassment, but he was never one to blush easily. He maintained a composed smile and articulated, Can you not tell that being honest will put your life in danger? Anthony Reed offered a slight nod, affirming certain aspects prior to committing to aid in perusing the information and crafting the summary. On the second floor of Sal de Ball Breeze, in the room adjacent to Lumian's quarters, Lumian surveyed Anthony Reed and the Rabbit of Knowledge, seated in tandem, diligently sifting through the information and completing forms. 
he subtly nodded in relief. Once more, he reiterated the caution not to delve deeply into the spirit world creature knowledge marked as powerful and dangerous. Exiting the room, he entered the office at the corridor's end. Franca cozied up in Lumian's armchair, her red booted feet propped on the desk's edge. Baffled and intrigued, she inquired, What exactly do you need our help with? Why are you being so mysterious? Jenna settled into the chair across from her, turning her body as her gaze drifted to the door. Lumian nonchalantly shut the door and recounted the scenario, elucidating his need to secure a contracted creature prior to confronting the Padre. Wouldn't a simple divination suffice? Franca pondered as she acquiesced to Lumian's entreaty, while Jenna simmered with curiosity about the spirit world creatures. Before long, Franca gazed up at the trio of rabbits of knowledge and Jenna, as well as Lumian, each absorbed in their respective tasks of poring over documents. Amusement laced her voice as she quipped, Why does this feel like a miniature workshop, and we're the toiling transcribers? Congratulations, your instincts are on point. Lumian retorted in jest, Am I not also perusing the information and completing forms? Franca molded over and conceded. She resumed her labors. And so, they persisted until well past 10 p.m., punctuating their efforts with numerous breaks, meals, siestas, catnaps, to mitigate the strain. Brief reprieves preceded the summoning of the rabbits of knowledge once more. Intermittently, during these short intervals, Lumian observed Franca, Jenna, Anthony Reed, and the quartet of rabbits of knowledge. He remained vigilant to prevent them from becoming too engrossed and to detect any anomalies they might experience. Jenna reached her threshold first. Having newly ascended to instigator, she hadn't fully acclimated to the potion's effects and was grappling with containing the surge of power. Her state was less than optimal. Anthony Reed followed suit. His psychological scars ran deep, rendering him susceptible to certain deviations. Lumian, Franca, and the seventh set of rabbits of knowledge soldiered on till the end. Baron Brignes concluded his task around 6 p.m. and delivered the documents and forms to the café. After dismissing the summons and seeing off the fatigued assistants, Lumian returned to the safe house on Rue de Blouse's Blanches, arranging the forms in a neat stack. Perusing the papers briefly, he confirmed the general state of affairs. A sense of accomplishment swelled within him as he casually tossed the forms onto the table. The immediate selection wasn't on his agenda. His plan was to first establish a contract T-status and sort out the specifics of the contract. Only afterward would he consult the index, thereby preventing the likelihood of stumbling upon a spirit world creature that matched his criteria in all respects but failed to meet the contract stipulations. Lumian rested for a spell before summoning a rabbit of knowledge and tasking it with duplicating two more forms. Storing the three indices separately, Lumian's weariness was palpable. The prospect of cleansing himself seemed distant as he tumbled onto the bed and surrendered to sleep. At 6 a.m., Lumian brimmed with vigor, showing no haste to descend underground, arrange an altar, and beseech for a boon. Instead, he engaged in his usual regimen, jogging, practicing boxing, and cultivating his mental equilibrium. By nearly 8 a.m., he stood before the doorway to room 207 at Aubert's Du Coke door, ingredients at the ready. After a brief internal debate, Lumian ultimately seized the carbide lamp. Although he no longer required specialized illumination equipment, he was, in essence, a paragon of such abilities. His aspiration rested on his foe's initial assumption that he lacked night vision and was inept at generating light. An underground trier, within the quarry cavern that had once borne witness to inevitability-linked rituals on several occasions. Lumian briefly tidied the dank, lightless setting, positioning a blood-infused candle upon the altar stone. Just as he concluded the sanctification of the ritual silver dagger and ready to cast a spiritual barrier, faint footfalls reached his ears. The sounds reverberated within the subterranean passage, seemingly not distant from the present mine. Someone is passing by. Lumian's pulse quickened, his intent fixated on swiftly restoring the area to order and concealing himself. Yet, as he neared the altar before him and before he could extinguish the carbide lamp, soft footsteps drew close, manifesting at the cave entrance. 
Aware that concealment was futile, Lung Mian promptly swiveled around, one hand nestled in his pocket, his gaze converging on the source of the sound. A slender man of brownish-black complexion stood there, clutching a carbide lamp. His black hair bore a slight curl, and his eyes held a profound allure. He sported a black seer's cloak reminiscent of those seen in a circus. Monette. Lumian recognized the figure. He was an islander swindler who had duped Charlie and been hoodwinked by the con artists in Sal de Ball Unique. Monette, too, saw Lumian. A smirk tugged at the corners of his lips as he greeted with palpable cheer, what a coincidence. In tandem with his words, the swindler produced a crystalline monocle, inserting it into his right eye socket. Chapter 315 Anxious Termoboros What a coincidence! Lumian knew better than to consider it mere coincidence. Deep within the expansive underground of Trier, unexpected encounters were not uncommon, given the diverse cast of characters that frequented its depths, quarry police, smugglers, cave adventurers, mineral researchers, wandering university students, members of secret organizations, wanted criminals, mobsters, heretics, and anti-government militants were active here. However, the odds of stumbling upon familiar faces in such a dark domain were almost negligible. This wasn't like the time he had rescued Jenna, Lumian had doggedly followed the trail. Monette's presence monocle affixed, roused Lumian's caution. He mustered a semblance of a smile and replied, Indeed. What a coincidence. With one hand casually slipped into his pocket, Lumian played his role, pretending to secure the candles and materials on the stone surface. The intention was to convey that the ritual was complete and he could depart whenever he pleased. There was nothing of value to plunder or destroy. Monette adjusted his monocle and with a wave of his hand, offered a departing smile. See you above ground. And just like that, he withdrew, his footsteps fading into the depths. Lumian was caught off guard. He's leaving just like that? Could it really have been a coincidence? Judging from Monette's familiarity with underground Trier, it is evident he has traversed these passages countless times. Yet, that level of familiarity should have taught him that barging into a well-lit spot amidst the darkness could easily trigger conflict. Common sense dictates that a stranger's presence in the quarry cave warrants cautious observation for any approach. The abrupt, nonchalant appearance seemed off. Does he truly possess that much confidence in his prowess? It can't be just to scare me. As Lumian's thoughts raced, he shifted his gaze from the cave entrance to the candles and materials neatly arranged on the rocks. The question arose whether to persist with the boon ritual. In that instant, the voice of Termoboros reverberated within him, you'd best relocate. Ah. Lumian's senses tingled, catching a note of unease in Termoboros's tone. It was subtle, almost elusive, making Lumian doubt his judgment. This was the first time Lumian had perceived emotional fluctuations in this inevitability angel. In previous interactions, no matter how much Lumian goaded and prodded, Termoboros merely maintained silence. And yet, something about this encounter had stirred anxiety and apprehension within the angel. As his heart quickened, Lumian blurted out, Is this person truly dangerous? He isn't inherently dangerous, but I sense a looming threat, Termoboros responded. This confirmed Lumian's guess. The angel had sensed a looming problem through the strings of fate, a predicament that could jeopardize his very essence. Why does a seemingly less formidable individual trigger such unease? What's his motive? Lumian pressed on. Termoboros reverted to his usual depth as he intoned, I'm sealed. I can only perceive the outside world through you, so I lack ample information. To uncover the answers to these queries, the seal must first be weakened. Do I look like an idiot to you? I even suspect that your anxiety and worry might be fabricated to exert pressure and intimidate. But given Termoboros's previous conduct, even if progress hadn't been made, such overt intentions should not have been revealed so swiftly. Monette's appearance was indeed oddly coincidental, his actions shrouded in inexplicable bizarreness. If possible, I must evade him. It's safer to assume he poses considerable danger rather than underestimate and expose myself. 
With a brisk pace, Lumian gathered his belongings, clutched the carbide lamp, and exited the quarry cave. Drawing upon the subterranean map meticulously memorized from Gardner Martin's records, Lumian navigated closer to Cartier de la Cathedral commemorative, discreetly delving a few meters below ground level to stumble upon another somber, soundless quarry cave. He incorporated no fewer than three evasive maneuvers along the way to evade potential trackers. Phew. Exhaling a breath of relief, Lumian surveyed his surroundings and rested his carbide lamp upon the ground. On a moderately level rock, he arranged the candles and ritual components, ensuring their proper alignment. Abruptly, a flicker of motion in the shadows at the quarry's edge pricked his senses. Hiss. Lumian's heart skipped a beat. Clasping the carbide lamp cautiously, he directed its beam toward the source. A bluish-yellow radiance pierced the obscurity, unveiling a black rat partially concealed by gravel. The rat made no effort to evade the light, it stood still. After a few heartbeats, it pivoted languidly and vanished into a minuscule crevice at the rock wall's base. For some reason, Lumian sensed a disproportion between the rat's right and left eyes. Gripping the carbide lamp, tension once again coursed through Lumian. He hushed, Temoboros, is there a problem here too? Temoboros's voice resonated within Lumian's being, emanating a regal aura. It's best if you pray to the fool immediately for angelic protection before moving elsewhere. Could the situation be that grave? Lumian's pupils dilated. Swiftly producing an additional candle, he hastily constructed the altar. Not a shred of concern lingered regarding Termoboros potentially manipulating him into a detrimental choice. After all, supplicating the fool was Lumian's last resort, and it undeniably served his interests. From a different vantage, the very fact that circumstances compelled an inevitability angel to indirectly beseech the fool's protection implied that something far amiss was afoot. Unleashed, the peril would prove unfathomable. Being both mentally and physically optimal, Lumian's adept hands fashioned the candles, a process lasting just over ten seconds. He sanctified the dagger and forged a wall of spirituality that enshrouded solely him and the altar. Methodically, he ignited the three candles sequentially, from deity to humanity, from left to right, punctuating with drops of essential oil and extract. Amidst the haze and wisps of fog, Lumian exhaled, reciting gravely, the fool that doesn't belong to this era, the mysterious ruler above the gray fog, the king of yellow and black who wields good luck. I implore you, I implore your protection. As the ritual unfolded, Lumian surrendered to the mist's embrace, the prickle of his skin, the lassitude of his mind. Once more, he glimpsed the twelve-winged seraph, pure luminescence descending from infinite heights to envelop him. As the radiant wings receded and dissolved, Lumian's senses jolted back to him. Gauging his state, he hastened to pack up the altar items and hastily exited the mine's confines. Descending beneath the bustling market district, Lumian maintained his vigilant, practiced evasiveness, pushing forward with meticulous attention. Almost twenty minutes elapsed before Lumian stumbled upon another concealed quarry cave, secured by its discreet location, courtesy of his map. Stepping inside, he assessed the surroundings. His voice hushed, he inquired, Temoboros, is there any issue here? Presently, none, Termoboros responded. Lumian shut his eyes, a newfound calm settling over him. He mulled over his options. Should I surface and await the anomaly's dissipation before seeking out a secluded haven for the boon-praying ritual? Or should I seize the moment, briefly escape the abnormality, and hasten my progression to contract T, capitalizing on the fool's angelic protection? In keeping with Lumian's disposition, he leaned towards the risk. The scenario wouldn't change later. He couldn't ascertain if the anomaly had genuinely dissipated. He needed the counsel of someone higher in rank. In that case, he might as well seek that counsel now. The altar was reinstated. Yet, this time, he bypassed protection or boons, summoning instead Madame Magician's messenger. The doll messenger, clad in a gown of light gold, coalesced above the flickering candle flame. Observing Lumian, it grumbled, this isn't a good place. With that, it retrieved the hastily inscribed letter from Lumian's hand. 
the letter briefly recounted Monet's behavior and Termoboros's response, querying the possibility of initiating the boon prayer ritual at present. Lumian exercised some cunning here. He didn't outright solicit Madame Magician's protection, merely inquired about feasibility. Hiring a demigod came at a steep price. Lumian deemed it currently unaffordable. Instead, he aimed to draw her attention by inquiring. Of course, if push came to shove, he'd consider it. Debts could be repaid. Or if the person was deceased, repayment became moot. This isn't a good place. Does this pertain to the current quarry cave or the entirety of Underground Trier? Lumian contemplated the messenger's words. Swiftly, the messenger returned, bearing Madame Magician's response, that's a big problem. Madame Magician's opening remark twitched Lumian's eyelids. Of course, the situation isn't dire, at least, I haven't discovered the gravest entities returned to this world yet. What we must ascertain is his true intent. Termoboros's reaction implies he's the target, but this individual excels at concealing motives. This may well be a calculated illusion meant to deceive us or another party. For the time being and the foreseeable future, anomalies should be absent. Stabilize yourself and proceed with the boon prayer. His? That's an angel? The entity whose hostility Monet exhibited is an angel? Lumian hissed involuntarily, engulfed by a renewed surge of trepidation. This brought to mind the uniqueness of Sal de Bal Unique. He suspected that confronting them to reclaim a debt might entangle him with a host of angelic blessed. Seeing Madame Magician's assessment align with Termoboros's, Lumian composed himself and reconfigured the altar. Before long, he focused on the pair of grey-white candles symbolizing inevitability's power and himself. Amidst the intricate fragrance of grey amber perfume, he retreated slightly and intoned deeply, power of inevitability. You are the past, the present, and the future, you are the cause, the effect, and the process. Chapter 316 Invitation Letter in a repetition of events, the silver-black candle flame once again solidified into a beam of light, striking Lumian's left chest, already racked with agony and turmoil. Amidst the pervading gray fog and the unsettling black wind, a silvery-black illusionary liquid began to trickle out. At some elusive point in time, Lumian's pain and vertigo faded into insignificance. He felt as though he had transformed into an entirely different entity. Standing in the wilderness, he gripped a wooden bow in his hand and released an arrow that gleamed with a blue radiance toward his aerial target. Lumian vaguely remembered who he was, but he felt that everything was extremely real and he was experiencing it. The keen, spectral blue arrow cut through the sky, finding its mark in the belly of a dusky vulture. An acute agony surged into Lumian's consciousness. He observed himself beating his wings descending with an arrow lodged perilously close to his abdomen. No, why have I become a vulture? Amidst the present experience, Lumian maintained a fragment of awareness about his own state and condition. Bang! He collided brutally with the ground, each bone fracturing with excruciating force. Agony pierced his core. Lumian teetered on the brink of unconsciousness as a hyena lunged, its sights set on him. Warm, repulsively scented flesh filled his mouth. He found himself ravaging the lifeless form of the grayish-black vulture. The bluish-tinged arrowhead had snapped within the avian creature. This taste is nauseating. I'm no Ludwig, the monstrous child. Lumian's internal complaint resounded. He didn't completely mistake himself for a hyena, but he continued to bite and devour his prey uncontrollably, not letting go of the poison parts. Abruptly, a searing pain stabbed into his back, and he was thrust onto the ground by razor-sharp claws. His attacker, an uncanny lion marred by decay, oozing blood-yellow pus from its wounds. Lumian tore the hyena's throat apart and retreated with it into the nearby underbrush. As he witnessed the scene through an observer's lens, he systematically dismantled the hyena. Amidst a mix of satisfaction and revulsion, Lumian's abdomen seethed. His beyonder powers, teetering on the edge of control, were fully ignited by the venom, resulting in a chaotic anomaly. His sanity waned, spiraling into insanity. 
all that remained was an insatiable urge to obliterate the beings before him, to unleash chaos. No, I mustn't succumb. The paramount objective remains incomplete. Lumian drew in the faint, sweet aroma of grey amber, resisting complete surrender to madness. In the midst of his cathartic sprint, his attention fixed on a hunter, and he lunged at the figure. With a wooden bow in his grasp, Lumian caught a whiff of a repugnant odor and sighted a decaying lion, two wart-like growths on its shoulders. Its mouth, adorned with remnants of vibrant red flesh and blood, stretched to its limit. A jolt of alarm coursed through Lumian as his full self-awareness returned. He discerned that the hunter's form had turned ethereal, akin to the vulture, hyena, and lion, morphing into intricate silver-black words and bizarre symbols. The words linked with the symbol, weaving a ring that abruptly contracted into his body. Lumian's eyes opened, and he confronted the flickering silver-black candle flame. A half-meter tall stone, functioning as an altar, met his gaze. The encounter felt tangibly authentic. As if I had been the vulture, the hyena, the lion, and another human. Lumian massaged his throbbing head and gradually rose to his feet. Reflecting on his prior experiences, he assimilated the newfound knowledge within his mind. He couldn't remember when he rolled on the ground in pain. Phew. Exhaling deeply, Lumian affirmed that he had acquired a fresh boon and transformed into a contractee. He swiftly tidied up the altar, dismantled the wall of spirituality, and grabbed the carbide lamp, ready to leave the quarry cave at any moment. Simultaneously, Lumian assessed his transformation and the contractee's abilities. His spirituality had seen a marked increase. His dancer flexibility and the alms monk's endurance in harsh environments had shown modest improvement, though not substantial. His intuitive sense for luck had also seen a slight upgrade. However, upon recognizing that Termoboros could sway his fate and judgment, he refrained from frequently relying on this ability for protection. Summoning dance now exerted a broader sphere of influence, and his ability to forcefully possess the bizarre creatures had extended further. The contractee status bestowed upon him just a single fresh ability, the power to enter into a contract with a summoned creature, directly borrowing a distinctive characteristic skill. Contrary to Lumian's anticipations, this unique contract had merged with his body and soul during his advancement. Its transfer to others was impossible. In essence, he had become an indivisible part of the contract, the most pivotal aspect. In time, he would need to rely on this element to compose the remaining sections of the contract and offer them to the target creature for signing. After musing for a time, Lumian had a rudimentary understanding of the specifics of the contract ability. The agreement could solely be formed with the consent of the target creature. Once the contract was sealed, he could handpick the traits he desired, guided by his volition. With each ratified contract, not only would he acquire a skill, but he'd also assimilate a measure of influence from the contracted being. The higher its rank, the greater the adverse impact. The count of contracts inked depended on his resilience. Perhaps he could endure just one high-level or exceedingly potent attribute. Several ordinary traits might be born, keeping pace with his standing. Particularly feeble ones could be pursued more liberally. Upon signing a contract, a cost was entailed. Part was a tribute to the contracted entity, and the remainder was a tribute to the witness. The cost could encompass life, limbs, kin, loved ones, offerings, one's spirituality maximum, a fraction of reason, and so on. The precise demand hinged on the desires of the contracted creature. Hence, much of the intelligence Lumian gleaned from this boon concerned the corresponding creature. This encompassed specific abilities and the compensation the counterpart sought. Nevertheless, most of these odd creatures were sinister and uncanny, and the price he'd need to pay was consistent. Lumian didn't wish to select from their ranks. Of course, this wasn't the prime rationale. Conceivably, these creatures harboring the mystical knowledge interwoven with the power of inevitability had ties to the entity known as inevitability. Lumian dreaded that forging a contract with them might covertly manipulate him, propelling his destiny into the abyss. Consequently, Lumian had no intention of designating the entity as the object of prayer and witness while entering into a pact. A superior choice was at hand, Mr. Fool. 
According to the sermons in the Fool's Cathedral that Lumian had heard, this great entity reigned over the spirit world. The angel of the Holy Spirit by his throne presided over the spirit world on his behalf. Even if embellished, this testified to Mr. Fool's considerable sway in the spirit world. In such a situation, Lumian, marked by the Fool's seal and enlisting the Fool as an intermediary and packed witness, could potentially yield substantial advantages and concealed benefits when attempting to forge a pact with a spirit world creature. It was just like other contractees signing contracts with strange creatures that came with knowledge. Lumian promptly sorted through the recently acquired knowledge and discerned that certain aspects remained quite ambiguous, as if they encompassed myriad possibilities. For instance, the stipulation of obtaining the target creature's consent before signing a contract did not specify the methodology of obtaining consent. Securing agreement through offerings as a bribe constituted consent, but so did beating them into unreserved submission. Similarly, the compensation demanded by the latter should be negotiable. Additionally, the deleterious impacts that the acquired knowledge from contracted creatures brought along, along with the limits of one's endurance, precluded the prospect of Lumian circumventing the system to forge a pact with a high-ranking creature and attaining godlike power at a reasonable price via Mr. Fool's seal, the sovereign of the spirit world. Nonetheless, the liberty to cherry-pick any amalgamation of skills within a defined spectrum imposed a considerable upper boundary on the potential of a contractee. Naturally, the floor was equally low. Opting for an ill-suited skill and exacting an erroneous price could render one subpar even in comparison to an elite non-beyonder individual's aptitudes. Lumian steadied himself and murmured with a sense of contentment, Temaboros, do you have anything to add? To be candid, Lumian's foremost apprehension upon descending into the underground was whether Termaboros would exploit the boon-seeking ritual to instigate harm. After all, the potency of the boon he was acquiring was escalating, posing a genuine threat to the angel of inevitability. Even if securely sealed, he would unearth a method to stir up discord. It was improbable for him to remain inert, permitting his strength to wane. Furthermore, during the boon ritual, the seal would inevitably crack slightly, permitting the essence of inevitability to trickle out. This would afford Termaboros a distinct opportunity. Initially, Lumian had intended to solicit safeguards before officially beseeching a boon. Unexpectedly, Monet's bizarre appearance and the angel backing him had expedited the need for a blessing. Termaboros had turned more tractable, abstaining from conspicuous interference. Termaboros's voice resounded with his response, the mine entrance. The mine entrance. What does that imply? Lumian clutched the carbide lamp and advanced toward the entrance of the quarry cave, mired in bewilderment. A bluish-yellow luminescence cast light over the debris-strewn expanse, revealing a meticulously trimmed piece of stiff paper. It wasn't present when I entered. Lumian tensed and cautiously drew closer. On the ebony paper, a monocle had been meticulously drawn, almost replicating reality. For lines of bold, vibrant red and tision words graced the page, Sal de Ball Unique Night of Lovers 7 p.m. on the last night of every month you're invited. Sal de Ball Unique. Monocle. Night of Lovers. Lumian's thoughts instantly summoned an image of Monet donning a monocle in his right eye socket. He had earnestly invoked the fool's angelic safeguard and expended considerable effort to elude detection, yet he had failed to shake off the enigmatic trickster. No, Mr. Fool's angelic blessing exudes a high-tier anti-divination and anti-prophecy influence. Unless Monet has been lurking in my vicinity without being thrown off, it's implausible for him to regain proximity. Lumian's heart skipped a beat as he instinctively surveyed the surroundings. Silence reigned within the obscurity bordering the quarry cave. Yet, Lumian's skin prickled, as though an abundance of eyes remained concealed within the air. Chapter 317 Summoning Target In the court of days, Lumian might have snatched up that invitation and made his way to the Salle de Ball Unique by month's end, all to unleash a prank to return the shock. However, this time around, Lumian's grip on the mystical world was firmer, a result of his brush with countless otherworldly aberrations. 
He conjured a flicker with the snap of his fingers, sending forth a crimson spark that alighted on the ebony paper before him. Amidst the swiftly burgeoning flames, Lumian departed the quarry cavern, his carbide lamp casting its light, guiding him towards the nearest exit of the underground trier. Yet, on this journey, an unshakable paranoia seized him. The moss on the rocky walls, the unseen insects within the shadows, even the intangible entities that traversed the air, it was as if Monette's eyes bore into him from all angles. It wasn't mere illusion but rather a reality that wound Lumian's mind taught, each heartbeat a gallop of unease. Termoboros's unwavering quiet provided the lone solace, a lack of agitation hinting that the quandary hadn't escalated, yet. A quarter hour's passage led Lumian to ascend the steel stairs, emerging onto solid ground once more. As sunbeams pierced the sky, penetrating a sea of white clouds and bathing his visage in their glow, he felt as though he'd been reborn. Phew, no wonder Madame Magician said to live under the sun in Trier as much as possible. Exhaling a sigh, Lumian snuffed the carbide lamp, locked in his bearings, and charted his course back to Rue de Blouse's blanches. Upon re-entering the safe house, he immediately summoned Madame Magician's messenger, apprising the holder of the major arcana card of the developments that unfolded. Madame Magician's reply was simple, exemplary work. Steer clear of Sal de Bal Unique. The Lord's Angel of Time shall keep vigilant watch over this affair. Why would Mr. Fool's Angel of Time direct his attention towards Sal de Bal Unique? Is there indeed an Angel of Time? The angelic entity whom the charlatans of Sal de Bal Unique revere bears a link to Mr. Fool's Angel of Time. Or perhaps, an animosity. Lumian ruminated momentarily adrift in the murk of comprehension. With a measure of relief prevailing, he reclined upon the bed, surrendering himself to sleep's embrace, an interlude wherein his mental fortitude and vitality underwent reinvigoration. At noon, Lumian ate two savory meat pies and drank a glass of apple whiskey sour. Seated at the table, he engaged in earnest perusal of the bestiary chronicling the spirit world creatures. As he raced through the pages, a sleek black fountain pen danced in his hand, crafting purposeful circles on the paper to accentuate potential candidates. After over an hour of intense scrutiny, Lumian distilled a preliminary list of 50 to 60 spirit world entities boasting suitable attributes and modest threat levels. Following the breadcrumbs of indicated page numbers, he retrieved the source manuscripts and embarked on meticulous research. Intermittent breaks punctuated his reading. As evening painted the sky in hues of twilight, Lumian at last concluded his meticulous perusal of the source materials, now in possession of their profound knowledge. A final selection had been forged. First in line was the abscessed hand. This enigmatic spirit, once shrouded in legend across the southern and central parts of the world, had been conjured by aficionados of mysticism, leaving a trail of lifeless bodies in its wake. From crime scene accounts, the fallen were strewn across the forest expanse. With the exception of those initially claimed within a hunter's lodge, the remaining deaths occurred nearly simultaneously. This revelation hinted at the abscessed hand's swift transitions between victims, throttling one soul and in a heartbeat, lunging towards its next quarry. Dream divinations unveiled a bluish-black, gangrenous hand, swollen and oozing with putrescence. Its appearance was always abrupt, snapping a victim's neck within two to three seconds before vanishing to assail another, irrespective of the distance. Based on the hand's traits, Lumian inferred its considerable aptitude for traversing the spirit world. As for its danger level, Madame Magician's accounts deemed it commonplace, bound by the constraints of the summoning ritual. Nevertheless, a significant detail stood out from the major arcana card holder, it's suspected to be a fragment of something greater. Severed hand? Could its kindred comprise severed legs, heads, torsos, and innards? What would happen when these fragments converge? If reassembled, what would manifest? Lumian scoured the index in vain, failing to unearth analogous entities. His focus rested on abilities, traits, and threat levels, with little heed to nomenclature. An alternative theory remained afoot. The remaining abscessed hand counterparts might reside within the powerful and dangerous categories, evading the scrutiny of Franca, Jenna, and the rabbits of knowledge. 
should the anticipated spirit world traversal prowess prove elusive, or if the cost demanded an untenable toll, Lumian had an arsenal of alternatives at his disposal. With regards to disguising abilities, he found a peculiar fondness for a spirit world creature known as the Headless Bride. This mythical tale was woven within the heart of the Hajeni kingdom in the southern continent. It began with the story of a young girl who dared to elope with her beloved. In the shadowed chambers of their hidden nuptials, her kin unveiled the shrouded ceremony. Amidst the assembly of family and kin, her own brother exacted a swift, brutal end, severing her head in the name of matrimonial transgression and ancestral decree. Perhaps this girl was special to begin with, or perhaps she had come into contact with something related to the spirit world during her elopement. Thus, ignited by the agony, fury, and rancor that gripped her before her demise, she imbibed the essence of the spirit world, transmuting into a creature akin to an evil spirit. Dressed in scarlet bridal raiment adorned with gilded motifs, she hunted and hexed her lineage, subjecting them to an unending torrent of catastrophes spanning three decades, until the tapestry of their lineage was all but erased. In the present, the headless bride prowled the spirit world, shape-shifting with calculated artistry. Its transformations beguiled unwary beings and unsuspecting travelers, drawing them closer to their doom in its relentless embrace. For a pyromaniac, this was an easy target with the protection of a ritual. Headless bride's alternative was human-faced mantis, this is a unique creature from the spirit world. When he was alive, he was a playboy with elegance and good looks. As an educator in Shaun within the Intus Republic's Hornasis province, he was embraced by admiration and ardor from both distinguished dames and youthful maidens. He was gifted in literature, skilled in poetry, and had numerous lovers. This idyllic existence found an abrupt termination when a spurned spouse denounced him to the church as a warlock, accusing him of employing sorcery to control his wife. Agents dispatched by the Eternal Blazing Sun Church probed into the matter gathering accounts from a multitude of local men. Astonishingly, their testimonies echoed the allegations in the complaint letter. Strangers to one another, these men's narratives converged in unsettling symmetry. In contrast, the dames and young maidens adamantly attested to their willing involvement, fervently defending the playboy's actions. Amid simmering resentment from the local men, the trial raced to a conclusion. The playboy met his end at the stake. Upon later investigation, officials confirmed his innocence, unveiling the accusations as a construct of collective envy and enmity. It suggested that an instigator was behind the scenes. In the spirit world, the playboy's essence metamorphosed into a mantis bearing a human visage. Festering within him was an all-consuming loathing, mingling with a mastery over metamorphosis and relentless predation. Lumian turned emotional as he read the two pieces of information. Six years in the countryside had acquainted him with the ignorance that shadowed village life. From this, he deduced that not all spirit world denizens sprang from nature's womb. Rather, under exceptional circumstances, the souls of departed humans could transmute into enduring spirit creatures. A plausible explanation for hauntings. Pondering meticulously, Lumian relinquished his aspiration for invisibility and concealment. Instead, he earmarked his final contract slot for traits with direct influence over his spirit body. His choices boiled down to the thousand-eyed evil and the shadow of Shriek. These two entities were quintessential natives of the spirit world, venturing forth only in the realms of nightmares and tomes of authentic warlock craft. The thousand-eyed evil comprised fleshy forms, exuding a pink eye core, each adorned with an eye bereft of lashes. Gazing into the ebony pupils of these multitudes, whether human, beast, or mere spirit bodies, led to swift slumber. Their connection to dreams was palpable, they occasionally manifested in the darkest recesses of the most harrowing nightmares. The shadow of Shriek, on the other hand, manifested as a confluence of translucent shadows. With frequent outbursts of shrieks, they induced unconsciousness in those who dared to draw near. Beyond their shrieks, they bore the attributes of ordinary shadows. Lumian meticulously transcribed all the details concerning the alternative contenders onto fresh paper, folding it as he slipped the paper into his pocket. 
he lingered within the precincts of Salle de Balbrise for a period, eventually departing from Avenue du Marquet around 10 p.m. navigating the pathways along wrist docks. He ultimately gained entry into the two-story edifice he had once reduced to smoldering ruins. Though the inferno that had previously ravaged the building had long since been quelled, the structure now stood cloaked in inky darkness and utter desolation. Recognizing that his intended audience was none other than Mr. Fool, rather than the entity called Inevitability, Lumian had no intentions of executing the summoning ritual underground. This strategic choice was to avoid any potential encounters with the odd and dangerous swindlers of Sal de Ball Unique. His primary objective was to locate a secluded enclave, far removed from prying eyes. This calculated approach would ensure that even in the event of an unforeseen mishap during the conjuration, should the summon entity lose control, the collateral damage would be contained, thereby facilitating a swift resolution. Having meticulously arranged a relatively unscathed chamber ensconced within the obsidian heart of the decrepit building, Lumian proceeded to meticulously arrange the altar. Relying on the insights gleaned from his role as a contractee, Lumian diverged from the norm by invoking two additional candles, each symbolizing a deity. In this ritual, Mr. Fool was both the focal point of supplication and the solemn observer. With a wall of spirituality set in place and candles aglow, Lumian didn't rush to commence the incantation. Instead, he extracted an iron-gray flask from the inner pocket of his worn brown jacket. Within this flask, Lumian had ingeniously affixed a slender thread, its counterpart connected to the decency brooch that lay submerged within a pool of absinthe. This ingenious design facilitated Lumian's swift and precise retrieval of the sealed artifact. No clumsy maneuvering was required, a simple hook of his index finger and the scotch broom brooch was within his grasp. As he tugged at the brooch, a burst of crimson sparks erupted, severing the knot binding the sealed artifact. Without a moment's hesitation, Lumian adorned the resplendent decency brooch upon his chest. He harbored the belief that brokering a contract with a denizen of the spirit world carried an inherent cost, akin to a form of bribery. In this context, Lumian hoped the decency brooch would assume a role of significance. Securely fastening the brooch, Lumian's gaze shifted to the trio of candles, silently ablaze before him. Drawing a deep breath, he steeled himself for the upcoming ritual. Chapter 318 Price Lumian recited in ancient Hermes, following the precise summoning ritual as described in Aurora's grimoire and the mystical knowledge of contractees. The fool that doesn't belong to this era, you are the ruler above the gray fog, you are the king of yellow and black who wields good luck. I beseech your shelter. I pray for your attention. I. In the name of the fool, I summon, a peculiar creature that roams the upper realm, the enigmatic severed hand, the bluish-black throat crusher. Lumian crafted this summoning incantation based on insights from the abscessed hand's data. As the ritual afforded some degree of protection to the subject of the invocation, and since the abscessed hand was not deemed perilous, he omitted the terms weak and friendly, infusing it instead with other phrases that would effectively pinpoint the target creature. The bluish-black candle flames surged, intertwining to shape an ethereal doorway adorned with cryptic symbols. A faint gray mist filled the surroundings, instilling an eerie atmosphere. Gradually, the door creaked open, and a decaying bluish-black severed hand emerged. It loomed twice the size of Lumian's palm, with the potential to crush a human skull. The afflicted severed hand hovered before the enigmatic illusory entrance. Its fingers extended toward Lumian's throat, yet it abstained from aggression. Lumian retrieved a flask of military-grade alcohol, differing in hue, unscrewed the cap, and drizzled a few drops towards the altar where the abscessed hand stood. The liquid struck the ground midway, but with a glint from the scotch broom shaped brooch, the bribe was discreetly consummated. Only then did Lumian speak. His voice resonated within his throat and chest as he enunciated alien syllables. These were words he had never encountered, sourced from the mystical knowledge of contractees, empowering him to master their pronunciation and essence. They fell under the mystical language of fate, an integral part of this arcane tongue. Lumian's vocal resonance coalesced into silvery black glyphs, akin to symbols, materializing from thin air. 
they descended upon the faux goatskin resting on the altar, melding into a brief yet uncanny covenant. As the pact solidified, Lumian established an intricate connection with the abscessed hand, akin to utilizing the summoning dance to anchor it to his very being. Through this conduit, Lumian gleaned the rudimentary abilities and traits of the abscessed hand, sensing its yearnings in the process. These yearnings were the price Lumian had to pay. Locate my body, or godhood shall elude you forever. An advance payment and a debt to be settled later. Could this be the unfolding of the bribe? No, that's not it. Upon sealing a contract, the price is promptly remitted, manifesting as my inexorable fate of ascending to demigodhood. Once I uncover the remaining segments of the abscessed hand, the reward shall naturally replace the price. Presently, it's akin to providing ample collateral. Lumian's musings raced as he gleaned the crux of the pact. Concurrently, he found the coveted spirit world traversal ability from the abscessed hand's attributes and qualities, inclusive of its anti-divination, quasi-invincibility, and the skill to snap the necks of those without godhood. A trait intrinsic to the abscessed hand, not a mere ability. Its effects marginally deviated from Lumian's expectations, yet remained within tolerable thresholds. With decency's utilization window limited to 15 minutes, the cost was bearable, and its attributes neared sufficiency. Lumian squandered no time, summoning the other candidates and vowing an ancient Hermes. I shall aid you in finding your body. Until then, godhood shall elude me. These words fused with the surroundings, morphing into wisps of bluish-black mist that seeped into the faux goatskin parchment. The abscessed hand descended, leaving a tincture of yellow-tinged, sanguineous pus within the contract's vacant space. Spontaneously, the covenant ignited, yielding myriad silvery-black symbols and words. They interlinked, configuring an intricate and enigmatic pattern, abruptly condensing onto Lumian's shoulder. Though concealed beneath his attire, Lumian's psyche conjured an image of his right shoulder. A curious black seal-like emblem materialized there. Instinctively, Lumian apprehended that upon activating the contract sigil, he could harness the abscessed hand's attributes to traverse the spirit world. Dissolution of the contract was only conceivable upon the demise of either party, a destiny preordained. Without bothering to experiment with spirit world traversal, Lumian terminated the summoning and embarked on a fresh ritual. In the name of the fool, I summon, the vengeful spirit that wanders the void, the headless bride in her eternal plight, and the wellspring of a bloodline's malevolence. Once again, the enigmatic illusory portal manifested, enshrouded in bluish-black flames interweaving. A frigid wind swept forth, transforming the summer night into a wintry chill. Lumian observed a form materialize from within the illusory entrance. Adorned in a vibrant red festive gown, meticulously threaded with gold, the figure stood before him. Without question, the figure lacked a head, exuding an aura of deep-seated malice and resentment. Lumian meticulously followed the prescribed procedure, utilizing the liquor as a bribe, reciting the contractual pledge. He discerned the price demanded by the headless bride. Sacrifice a kin or friend. Thank you for your presence, Lumian murmured with a sardonic smile, concluding the summoning. From this seemingly fruitless summoning, he gleaned valuable insights. He confirmed that bribe wielded a degree of influence. The original demand from the headless bride entailed a kin's sacrifice, however, bribe had managed to expand the scope to encompass friends. Lumian's sights next shifted to the human-faced mantis. He had formulated a summoning phrase, the vindictive spirit that wanders the void, a hunter adopting mantis guise, a shapeshifter adept at donning human semblance. Amidst a peculiar swooshing sound, an immense, translucent cyan mantis emerged from beyond the illusory door. Its head bore the visage of youth, handsome and radiant, inadvertently lowering one's guard. Sensing the summoner's presence and gender, the mantis swiftly transformed into a resplendent woman attired in a black evening gown. Internally scoffing, Lumian meticulously fulfilled the entire sequence, bribe, recitation, and perception. The human-faced mantis delineated three categories of offerings, requiring solely one to be met, contractors' reproductive organs, contractors' capacity for lying, contractors' immolation at the stake. Post-bribe, the stipulations underwent some relaxation, 
affording an additional choice or two. This entity seeks but a single thing, human anguish. The first aligns with his malevolence towards men. If I were of the female gender, this option likely wouldn't surface. The second corresponds to slanderers and false accusers, while the third aligns with the stake he himself endured. Lumian swiftly concluded. As a pyromaniac, the third demand posed no grave challenge. On one hand, he exhibited formidable resistance to flames, and on the other, enduring agony was his forte. Were this choice absent, Lumian intended to forfeit and subsequently summon several comparable spirit world beings later. Depriving him of the power to lie would markedly undermine his capabilities, rendering survival in a place like Trier implausible. He also wasn't certain if his reproductive organs would return at 6 a.m. after sacrificing them, he didn't want to take the risk. Without delay, he found the Nice face he sought from the arsenal of the human faced mantis's abilities. Nice had been the name of the human faced mantis during its living days. The essence of this ability leaned more toward illusion than corporeal transformation. Nevertheless, absent the means to nullify it or godhood, piercing through the illusion remained beyond reach. This occasion saw the black insignia affix to Lumian's left shoulder, accompanied by surges of crimson flames welling from his feet. Unperturbed by Lumian's actions, they ignited his attire and charred his flesh. Sensations reminiscent yet distinct from his encounter with Susanna Mattis enveloped him. An amalgamation of familiar and unfamiliar torment coursed through his consciousness, assailing his senses. Swiftly forsaking his cherished belongings, Lumian clutched the decency brooch in his palm. The conflagration endured for a full three minutes. Lumian's skin charred, his clothes imprinting scorched marks onto his body. For a pyromaniac, such wounds posed no moral peril, they scarcely even qualified as severe. He maintained the vitality to prepare for the ensuing summoning. The enigmatic entity that roams the upper realm, a mass of flesh bedecked with myriad eyes, a participant in the abyssal realms of nightmares. As the chant resonated, a creature of flesh and sinew rolled forth through the illusory door. Each flesh fragment sported a white eye, its pupil veiled in obsidian. Clasping the aluminum white military flask, Lumian's grip faltered, and he abruptly descended into a profound slumber, ensnared by the myriad gazes. After an indeterminate stretch, he snapped back to consciousness, realization dawning that the ritual had concluded on its own accord. The thousand-eyed evil had retreated to the spirit world, foregoing a genuine assault. I was lulled to sleep by mere sight. Communication is impossible. Also, this level of influence lies beyond the ritual's inherent protection. Lumian exhaled, seizing the Sal de Balbri's pocket watch to ascertain the time. Thankfully, I only slept for a few minutes. There's still about three minutes left. Lumian focused, initiating a fresh, summoning forth the shadow of Shriek. The spirit that wanders in the void, a confluence of myriad silhouettes, the progenitor of incapacitating Shrieks. Once more, the mysterious illusory entrance swung ajar. Yet, what met Lumian's gaze wasn't an anomalous shadow coiled into a blob, but a nebulous silhouette draped in a pitch-black armor resembling fish scales. Distinct from all armors documented in newspapers and magazines, this suit bore scales each akin to miniature, writhing shadows. Hmm. Could the summoning incantation have been imprecise, yielding a kindred spirit world creature? It seemingly boasts an incapacitating shriek. Let's first gauge the prospects of cementing a pact. Lumian fathomed the situation and embarked upon another cycle of bribe, utterance, and apprehension. The armored shadow stipulated an offering, a blood tribute of ten or more lives or gold amounting to one hundred thousand Verldor. Courtesy of bribe, the prerequisites exhibited leniency, demanding the sacrifices be rendered within three months. Failing to comply would precipitate contract retribution, a potentiality encompassing control loss or, worse yet, fatality. A sum of 100,000 Verldor. Lumian discerned this to be modestly manageable, thereby delving into the ability roster and traits of the armored shadow to locate the coveted incapacitating shriek. While scouring, he happened upon an ability bearing an intriguing nomenclature, Spell of Harumph. Chapter 319, 
travel. The spell of harumph derived its name from a combination of a snort from the nose and a harumph from the mouth, giving it a distinct quality that Lumian found intriguing. Moreover, the enigmatic armored shadow, while alive, was believed to be either human or a humanoid intelligent creature. Many of its distinct attributes and abilities had been given their own names. These attributes weren't like the dense individuals who relied on Lumian to simplify and assign labels for their ease of remembrance. Information channeled through the unique connection revealed to Lumian that the spell of Harumph was a spell-like ability capable of affecting a spirit body. Through the dual sounds, it stirred one's consciousness to induce a mystical transformation, generating a unique fluctuation that surged towards its designated target. Any creature touched by such a fluctuation would experience severe dizziness at a minimum or even a psychic piercing assault at its worst, potentially rendering the target unconscious. This ability would grow in potency as the user advanced in levels. In essence, it possessed the potential to influence divine entities, provided Lumian also ascended to sequence 4 or temporarily elevated his level in some fashion. Impressive. It's on par with the incapacitating shriek. Moreover, harumphing seems more dignified than indiscriminate shouting. Realizing time was of the essence, Lumian made a commitment and formalized the agreement. He harbored a genuine curiosity about the additional attributes and capabilities of the armored shadow. Their names held a certain uncanny quality, such as the night parade of ten thousand demons and the soul-devouring scream. This instance, the seal-like object descended onto Lumian's right chest, marking the conclusion of the ritual. Swiftly, he secured a thread around the decency brooch and returned it to the iron-gray military flask. Dismissing the spiritual barrier, he cleared the altar and retrieved the objects he had laid out. Subsequently, a ghostly light emanated from Lumian's right shoulder, and he abruptly vanished, traversing into a mystical realm drenched in layers of hues and peculiar creatures. In the subsequent moment, he exited the spirit world, dazed, reappearing in his bedroom on the second story of Sal de Ball Breeze. As Lumian massaged his throbbing head, he surveyed his surroundings and nodded approvingly. It's indeed true spirit world traversal. This ability is very useful. The only problem rested in its exorbitant spirituality cost. With Lumian's contractee and pyromaniac enhancements, he could only execute it three to four times. Considering the consumption of flames and the contingency allocation for safety measures, he could employ it once or twice in a relatively intense confrontation. For a pure contractee, they could merely teleport twice as standard procedure, excluding any other expenditure. Furthermore, this was contingent on selecting a proximate coordinate. Of course, proximity didn't exclusively signify the immediate vicinity. The spirit world encompassed a realm of mystique and peculiarity. Up, down, left, right, front, back, even time, intermingled there. It intersected with the real world, governed by its distinct chaos. Beyond concepts linked in nature, everything else seemed scattered without deliberate arrangement. In essence, Trier as a holistic notion held sway. It boasted a corresponding domain in the spirit world, unsullied by fragmentation or dispersal. Nonetheless, its surroundings extended beyond neighboring towns and villages. It might correlate to a river's conceptual presence in the southern continent, or manifest as a settlement projection for undersea beings. Minus precise coordinates, Lumian could solely teleport within Trier's immediate ambit. Otherwise, he risked straying into the spirit world's treacherous realm, a hazardous endeavor indeed. When he had endeavored to traverse the spirit world previously, all of Trier's locations had materialized within his consciousness as unfamiliar coordinates. This granted him the capacity to teleport back to Sal de Ball Breeze instead of venturing to remote corners of the metropolis. Concurrently, Lumian faintly perceived the Highlands Kingdom's city of light, Rapis, his former destination. It wasn't overtly distant in the spirit world from Trier, but neither was it nearby. Directly teleporting there remained infeasible for Lumian. He needed to ascertain one or two intermediate coordinates between the two locations. Remarkable. Lumian acknowledged with satisfaction. 
inclusive of limited uses and range, his spirit world traversal from abscessed hand perfectly met his expectations. Lumian proceeded to the full-length mirror. Activating the black mark on his left shoulder, he observed his charred form transition into that of a middle-aged man, featuring a few strands of silver at his temples. His cheeks were rounded, eyes amber-red, and facial contours dignified. The features were sharp, radiating an approachable aura. Gardner Martin. It can replicate one's appearance, physique, and demeanor. Yet actions and mannerisms must stem solely from myself. Lumian evaluated Nee's face's potential. The transformation had expended a notable degree of spirituality, but its maintenance necessitated but a fraction. He could adopt Gardner Martin's likeness for more than ten hours. Dispelling Nee's face, Lumian retreated a few paces. Gazing upon the mirror, he opened his mouth. Ha! Ah. In response, his spirit surged into the black mark on his right chest. His spirit body quivered, releasing an almost imperceptible yellow light from his mouth. The radiance penetrated the mirror, traversing the wall, vanishing after a span of nearly ten meters. Effective solely at close quarters. Consuming less spirituality than spirit world traversal yet surpassing Nee's face in expenditure. Applicable four or five times within combat. Lumian, his body marred by burns, exhaled leisurely. He donned his attire, settled onto the bed, and surrendered to sleep. Temporarily shelving thoughts of the gold he owed the armored shadow and the commitment to locate abscessed Han's body, Lumian had ample time for these matters. Current requisites centered on recuperation and rest, alongside allowing the repugnant aura accompanying the decency brooch to dissipate. The next morning, Lumian, clad in a black felt hat, shirt, sweater, and sturdy jacket, pressed the doorbell of apartment 601 at 3 Rue de Blouse's Blanches. Franca greeted him with a downcast countenance, seemingly taken aback by Lumian's outfit. Is your sense of temperature playing tricks on you? Lumian inquired, have you gotten your hands on genuine mummy ashes? Didn't you ask that very question just yesterday? Franca snapped. The answer was no. A smile tugged at Lumian's lips. I'll take you to find a real mummy. Where? Franca was puzzled and curious. Lumian stepped into the room and replied nonchalantly, the southern continent star highlands. How will we get there? Franca glanced toward the washroom before lowering her voice. Are you suggesting we bother your major arcana card holder? I've merely penned a letter to inquire about a transit junction, Lumian responded with a smile. Transit junction. Franca combined her understanding of the mystical arts and swiftly formulated a hypothesis. Have you obtained a mystical artifact capable of teleportation? Lumian shook his head and elaborated succinctly, through my contracted creature. What sort of contract yields such extraordinary results? Franca exclaimed, genuine surprise tinging her words. She had been wondering over Lumian's haste in filtering contracted creatures. Typically, those amenable to a Sequence 7 contract were fairly commonplace. Moreover, their summoning typically necessitated a ritual, rendering them rather impractical for most confrontations. Lumian let out a chuckle. A unique kind of contract. Ah. Uh. Franca studied Lumian carefully, circling around him. The pants-wearing, shirt-clad which cleared her throat and remarked, Are we considered brothers? Not quite, Lumian answered promptly. We hold different beliefs. Franca lowered her voice again. Isn't it just superficially steamed, but actually, it's Mr. Fool? Lumian replied piously, I still maintain some faith in the eternal blazing sun. Dot. After all, he had upheld this faith for nearly six years. Franca found herself momentarily speechless. After a few seconds, she inquired, Could we be considered friends? Yes. Lumian now spoke in accordance with his true feelings. Franca's brows eased. Could you teach me that unique contract? Name the price. She made her request straightforwardly. Lumian shook his head again. I can only employ that contract due to unique circumstances. All right. Franca refrained from pressing further, though a tinge of disappointment lingered. 
At that moment, Jenna emerged from the washroom. Lumian asked half teasingly, Are you interested in journeying to the southern continent? Travel? Why would I want to travel? Jenna appeared perplexed. Franca swiftly recounted her need for genuine mummy ashes and Lumian's method of teleporting to the Star Highlands. Ultimately, she queried, Do you wish to come along and observe? Jenna deliberated briefly and responded, Okay. She recognized her need for greater experience in the realm of beyond her powers, a necessity for observation, learning, and training. Furthermore, her maximum geographical range had been confined to Trier's Cartier de la Maison d'Opera. For a while, she had been captivated by tales of the southern continent circulating in the taverns and dance halls. Lumian assessed his two companions and offered a gentle reminder with a smile, I'd advise you to don thicker garments. The altitude is considerable, and it's currently winter there. Oh. Franca looked at Lumian and understood why he had bundled up for winter. Before long, Franca changed into a black coat resembling leather armor and donned dark knee-length pants with plush interiors, adopting the guise of a female mercenary or bounty hunter. Jenna hadn't yet transported her thick clothes, thus she borrowed Franca's clothing. Though their appearances matched, Jenna was shorter, necessitating a tightened belt, secured sleeves, and rolled-up pant legs to prevent impeded mobility. Lumian reached out and grabbed their shoulders, activating the contract mark on his right shoulder. A spectral light danced along the seams of his clothing, enveloping Jenna and Franca in a surreal realm, awash with vibrant overlapping hues and enigmatic creatures retreating in every direction. In an instant, they departed the spirit world, materializing on a desolate island. Before Jenna and Franca could fully adjust, Lumian initiated spirit world traversal once more. Upon their return to reality, the assassins found themselves facing a distant snow-clad mountain peak in an adjacent foreign city dominated by a white edifice. Jenna soon regained her composure and involuntarily exclaimed, How magical! If she were compelled to encapsulate the magic and articulate her sentiments, a choice of expletives might have been used. Although not certain if this location was indeed the southern continent's Star Highlands, the fact that she could translocate swiftly from Rue de Blouse's blanches to this wilderness underscored the mystical potential of teleportation. Lumian endured the pulsing headache and the substantial drain on his spiritual energy as he pointed toward the City of Light, seemingly unperturbed. Proceed inside. Chapter 320 Mummy Franca and Jenna couldn't tear their eyes away from the grazing herd of cows, sheep, and horses. The swarthy men donned felt hats and thick blue or red robes, while the local women flaunted their colorful, multi layered gowns. Numerous white buildings and shops peddling leather products dotted the scene. It was a captivating and unfamiliar sight. Franca stepped aside as a wooden carriage drawn by a long-haired bull, trundled by in the biting wind. She glanced at Lumian and Jenna before speaking up. Why the silence? Let's engage with the locals. After all, what was the point of wandering without interacting? Lumian fell momentarily quiet before responding, I lack sufficient information. Jenna felt a pang of embarrassment. I don't know enough either. All she was acquainted with were tales of romantic exploits featuring pharaoh queens and adventurers unearthing treasures within rainforests. Ah. Uh. Franca gestured dismissively with her right hand. I'm not much better. How much is not much? Lumian didn't pry further. He ushered his companions into a shop named Highland Mystic Potion. The proprietor, Salen Empaya, an intention dressed in a blue coat adorned with gold accents, recognized Lumian right away. After all, his distinctive hair color and appearance set him apart. Moreover, only a few days had passed since their last encounter. Salen assessed Franca and Jenna, extending a warm smile to Lumian. What brings you here this time? Lumian, struggling with a headache from expending too much spirituality, got straight to the point. Real mummy's ashes. I want to see the mummy. Salant's eyes flickered briefly, but he refrained from probing. Very well, I'll show you. Being a seasoned purveyor of mummy ashes, he knew these products didn't bestow virility, 
they were combined with genuinely efficacious medicine before hitting the shelves. However, since the clients didn't inquire about the practicality of real mummy ashes, he saw no need to divulge that information. Furthermore, he suspected Lumian and the two women intended to purchase a mummy for resale and profit. This was a substantial transaction. Sal Lent temporarily closed his shop and guided Lumian, Franca, and Jenna to the rear warehouse, where ordinary herbs were stored. They descended a narrow staircase, reaching the basement door. Turning to face Lumian and the others, he sought confirmation. Do you really want to see it? It wasn't so much a guilty conscience as a cautionary note. Absolutely, Lumian responded without a moment's hesitation. In the midst of his words, his gaze fixated on the basement's pitch-black wooden door. It bore a mystical symbol, its form a distortion of dark green and pale white hues. Within, a mix of rudimentary skulls, intertwined arms and vines, and inverted triangles melded to create an enigmatic pattern. Threads of the same hues radiated outward from these symbols, infiltrating walls, floor, and ceiling alike. Salent brought forth a golden key, advancing toward the door. Franca's voice dipped to a hush as she addressed Lumian and Jenna. Those arcane symbols appear rooted in the domain of death. Jenna furrowed her brow. What significance do they hold? Franca's head shook gently as she replied, I'm uncertain. Generally, these would play a pivotal role in ritualistic magic. Yet, without a wellspring of power, such magic can falter. As I understand, the cathedrals of Orthodox churches feature akin arrangements. The devout believers who pray daily lend their spirits and spirituality to sustain the ritualistic magic. While individual contributions may seem modest, their accumulation wields ample strength. Perhaps this location holds the power necessary for sustaining ritualistic magic. Lumian grinned at Franca. You might have a reason to rejoice. This perspective heightens the likelihood of finding a genuine mummy. A relieved sigh escaped Franca's lips. Hopefully, counterfeits aren't as rampant here as in Trier. Perplexed, she inquired, but why the need to bring us here to see a real mummy? My divination could discern the authenticity of the ashes. To broaden your horizons, Lumian replied confidently. Before Franca could curse, he added, directly requesting mummy's ashes might tempt him to provide counterfeits. When your divination results manifest on the spot, should I then smash his cabinet or engage in a scuffle? Such violence is hardly ideal. Lumian drew on an adage often uttered by Aurora. Of course, he left out the adverse effects of the three contracts. The abscessed hand stoked a yearning to snap a target's neck. The human-faced mantis fueled a heightened disdain for those who unjustly maligned the innocent. The armored shadow goaded him to break free from the shackles of life's confines. Perhaps Mr. Fool's witness or the boon of bribe rendered these effects relatively manageable. They were detriments he could subdue with focus, yet their collective might occasionally spark such impulses. Simultaneously, Franca and Jenna scoffed, unified in their disdain. Only hunters harbored an affection for violence. At that juncture, after a brief struggle with the lock, Sal Lent triumphantly swung open the pitch-black wooden door, its surface adorned with a cryptic symbol. Within the basement passageway, Lumian's eyes landed on wall-embedded oil lamps, forever alight. Drenched in the dancing hues of dark green firelight, Franca and her companions trailed behind Sal Lent, the shopkeeper of concealed curatives, as they ventured into the corridor that lay beyond the portal. Light permeated the space, yet an illusion of advancing into darkness seized them step by step. The already cold atmosphere seemed to plummet several degrees Celsius lower. Sal Lent proceeded seven to eight meters ahead, navigating past firmly shut grayish-white stone doors. He halted before a chamber positioned at the corridor's midpoint. These stone doors and the encompassing walls bore symbols akin to those at the basement entrance. Salat nudged open the stone door confronting him, unveiling a diminutive sepulchre to Lumian and his comrades. In the chamber's heart rested an exotic humanoid sarcophagus adorned with a golden base and a kaleidoscope of colors. This mummy hails from five centuries ago, Salat introduced, drawing near the stone casket and pressing down its lid. He seems rather unconcerned about us making off with the mummy. 
Lumian mused under his breath. Franca emitted a soft chuckle, her voice hushed. Perhaps he simply thinks nothing of us. Jenna remained silent during their exchange, her curiosity and trepidation fixated on the innards of the golden sarcophagus. Within, a corpse swathed in yellowish-brown fabric lay. Its lips were slightly parted, while faint voids marked the spots where eyes once resided. Hints of seeped oil stained its form. Unrestrained by the foreign surroundings, Franca extracted a mirror and initiated a divination before Salon's presence. His eyes flickered momentarily, swiftly reverting to their prior state, as if he'd encountered such phenomena too frequently. Before long, an aged voice resonated from Franca's mirror, its cadence accompanied by the gentle rush of water. A bona fide mummy, albeit not ancient in origin. Franca's gaze snapped up at Salent, the proprietor of the Mystic Potion Store. Salent offered an awkward smile in return. I fibbed earlier. This mummy isn't a relic from five centuries past. Truth be told, it was crafted just a fortnight ago and dispatched here. However, regardless of origin, it underwent a comprehensive and protracted mummification process. The sole disparity from ancient mummies is the brevity of its interment. An ancient mummy born a mere fortnight prior? Lumian quirked an eyebrow at Sal Lent, his tone casual. Do you hunt down the living to fashion mummies? Sal Lent gently shook his head. No need for such methods. The southern continent witnesses countless daily deaths. Procuring fresh cadavers requires only a nominal fee. Hiring hunters to track and capture would entail far greater expenses. Undertaking the task personally would exact an exorbitant temporal toll. He involuntarily assessed the advantages and drawbacks of multiple strategies. Post this explanation, Jenna regarded the mummy with a newfound perspective. It was the body of someone who hadn't long been dead. His motionless form stood exhibited as a tradable commodity. Though the two-week-old mummy served its purpose and met the requisites, Franca yearned for superior specimens. With a sigh, she averted her gaze from the recently minted mummy, prompting Salent with a question. Are there older mummies available? Salent hesitated momentarily before treading cautiously. How about those from last year? This constituted the most ancient mummy within the basement. Franca emitted a rueful sigh. That works too. Less enthused, Salent led the trio to another sepulcher. Initially presuming Lumian and his companions intended to purchase an entire mummy, Salent had showcased the most well-preserved specimen. Now, it seemed Lumian merely sought a segment. The yellowish-brown mummy dating back to the prior year already displayed signs of fragmentation. Not only were lower extremities absent, but its chest and abdomen also sported gaping voids. With Franca's divination validating its authenticity, Sal Lent posed his inquiry with diminished enthusiasm. How much do you require? Fifty grams, Franca responded, intending to amass a larger reserve. Sal Lent mulled over the request before pronouncing, five hundred verldor. Promptly, Franca remitted the payment, her eyes fixed as Salent procured a hammer and dirk, employing them to sever a portion of the mummy's arm, akin to extracting ore. Jenna stood dumbfounded. To her, it seemed somewhat gruesome and brutal. Though she'd witnessed mob fights and personally taken a life, she'd never encountered someone treating human remains as inexpensive commodities. Internally, Franca sighed and suppressed her emotions. This was the stark reality of the Beyonder world and its potion system, yet compared to the boons, it was strangely appealing. With the fraction of a mummy's arm now in her possession, Franca wordlessly led Jenna out of the tomb, trailed by Lumian and Sal Lent. They had traversed scarcely three meters when the kerosene lamps lining the corridor receded, casting an eerie dimness. Sal Lent swiveled his head, his demeanor a mix of surprise and uncertainty. Chapter 321 Compensation In the dim corridor, despite the unchanging temperature, an icy gust swept through, sending shivers down the spine. Lumian, who had cleared his mind to restore his spirituality, snapped back into attention. He examined the tombs on both sides, his demeanor unaffected by the sudden disturbance. 
his initial urge was to reach into his pocket and grasp Mr. K's finger. Yet, he held back, mindful of the unfamiliar territory that was the southern continent. Mr. K might not sense the use of his finger, so Lumian suppressed his instinct. Franca reacted swiftly too. A small mirror materialized in her palm. Jenna, less experienced, didn't grasp the scene's significance, but her instincts told her it wasn't a positive development. It was akin to the spooky tales told in bar dance halls to frighten young girls. Salent, avoiding the dim oil lamp's gaze, briskly moved past Jenna and Franca, making a beeline for the pitch-black wooden door to the basement. He paid Lumian no attention. Bang! 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 Sounds of impact echoed from the tombs on either side. It wasn't clear if sarcophagus lids had been struck or heavy stone doors pounded. Salant's expression shifted, and he bolted out. In the silent basement, the echoes of the pounding lingered. Lumian and the others hurried after the mystic potion store owner, easily overtaking him. At that very moment, the pitch-black wooden door creaked shut abruptly. Seeing this, Franca sprinted forward and flung the mirror out the door. A resonant crack marked the mirror's collision with the wooden door, fragments scattering across the floor. Lumian and Franca came to a halt simultaneously, their attention on Salent. Jenna, still in motion, comprehended and made the same choice. In the eerily dim corridor, Salent, decked in a blue coat with gold accents, stood frozen, his pale face tinged with a sickly green hue. The pounding from the tombs persisted, its reverberations shaking everyone present to the core. Sal Lent trembled visibly, muttering to himself, We're done for. We're all finished. Franca inquired swiftly yet composedly, What's going on? Only by grasping the core issue could she devise a swift and effective strategy. Seemingly detached from his own senses, Sal Lent didn't answer. He half mumbled, We're done for. We're all finished. Before he could complete his thought, the entire basement quivered. The dark green flames that had shrunk to the size of rice grains flickered noticeably in the same direction. Fear warped Salant's features, his voice unconsciously amplified. It's awake. It's awake. Who is it? Jenna found it more spine-chilling than any ghost story she'd encountered, but she pushed herself to ask. Salant remained unresponsive, repeating his panicked cry. It's awake. It's awake. Seeing that the mystic potion store owner was clearly in a state of extreme horror and not in his right mind, Franca decisively abandoned her attempts to ask him for information and took out a mirror. Her plan was to use magic mirror divination to swiftly assess the current situation. Even if the divination's response wasn't crystal clear and required interpretation, it was still better than being completely clueless. In a matter of moments, Franca completed the incantation and witnessed an aqueous light emanating from the mirror. Just as she was preparing to gather her thoughts and formulate appropriate questions to obtain corresponding answers, Lumian, who had been standing silently beside her, suddenly spoke up. Did it work? It did. I can perform the divination, Franca cooperatively responded, although she was puzzled by Lumian's actions. Lumian immediately broke into a grin. No need for questions. Ah. Uh. Franca was caught off guard before she grasped Lumian's intention. Just then, the basement shook once more. Salent, the mystic potion store owner, was so overcome with fear that his voice turned high-pitched. It's here. It's here. We're going to die. In the next heartbeat, Lumian seized his shoulder. Simultaneously, Lumian firmly held Jenna's arm with his other hand, while Franca hooked her arm around his shoulder like a bro. An eerie light shimmered through the crevices of their clothing, and the four of them materialized outside the basement, standing before the pitch-black wooden door adorned with intricate and enigmatic symbols. It's here. It's here. We're going to die. Salant's cries of despair still echoed in the air. Lumian cast an appraising glance at the mystic potion store owner, pondering whether to utilize the knee's face to transform into a mummy and give him a scare. Therapeutic provocation had its merits too. However, considering his waning spirituality and the prudence of revealing too many abilities to a stranger, Lumian ultimately shelved the prank idea. 
Smack. Jenna swung her right palm, delivering a resounding slap to Salon's face, leaving him bewildered. He gazed at the woman before him, utterly perplexed. Franca and Lumian exchanged speechless glances, unsure how to react to this unexpected turn of events. As the pitch-black door and the basement walls swayed gently, the cacophony outside abruptly subsided. Jenna felt the weight of their gazes and mumbled, isn't this how they wake them up? That's how they would bring back my neighbor when she lost control of her emotions. It wasn't madness. In the factory district, people had their own practical remedies. More often than not, they did the trick, though occasionally they proved ineffective. Of course, if you were part of her family, she wouldn't dare try it. She'd seek professional assistance instead. Franca snapped out of her reverie and commended sincerely, well done. Several moments elapsed, and Salon's gaze cleared. Instinctively, he scanned their surroundings and exclaimed in surprise, We're outside. When did we get out? When you were screaming we're going to die, we're going to die, Lumian retorted with an annoying tone. He then raised an eyebrow and inquired with a deep intonation, who are you saying was about to wake up? Salon's expression shifted multiple times before he stammered, a genuine ancient mummy. It slumbers deep within the tomb and occasionally stirs. It only woke up a few days ago. Why did it wake up so quickly? Normally, there was a rough time frame for how long the mummy remained awake. According to Salon's experience, it would be at least another month before it awoke again. That was why he dared to bring Lumian and the others into the basement. Unexpectedly, an accident occurred. What caused the ancient mummy to awaken prematurely? Lumian directed a thoughtful gaze at Franca, as if silently asking her if she wished to consider obtaining the genuine ancient mummy. Franca comprehended his inquiry and shook her head, indicating that it wasn't necessary. The mummy's ashes were merely supplementary ingredients. The ones formed the year before were still usable. There was no need to risk dealing with what seemed to be a perilous entity. Lumian withdrew his gaze and pushed through the headache gnawing at his temples. He turned to Salent and grinned. I don't care if it's last year's mummy or an ancient one awakening. There are two things I know for sure. First, I saved your life. Second, we were scared out of our wits and nearly met our end down there. So, you owe me a thank you present and compensation for the mental strain. How much do you think is fair? Keep in mind, I only want gold. With the memory of owing the armored shadow and Mr. Fool a total of 100,000 Vroldor in gold, Lumian was keen on seizing every opportunity to amass funds. As the tumult behind the pitch-black wooden door gradually settled, Salent heaved a sigh of relief and responded, How about 1,000 Vroldor? That's all the gold I have on hand. His heart ached at the thought of parting with the money, but he acknowledged Lumian's point. Without their intervention, he'd have met his end in that basement, becoming fodder for the mummy. Moreover, the group had demonstrated significant prowess. Rejecting their request outright seemed like a risky proposition. Agreed. Lumian didn't push for more or attempt to haggle. As the quartet made their way toward the stairs leading to the warehouse, Franca lowered her left hand and surreptitiously let something slip into the shadowy corner. After obtaining 1,000 Vroldor in gold coins, gold nuggets, and jewelry, Lumian, Franca, and Jenna exited the Highland Mystic Potion Shop. Franca glanced back at the shop and let out a right chuckle. Tisk, all this trouble, and we ended up with a mummy's hand and an additional 500 Vroldor. Without waiting for Lomian's response, she queried with a grin, Are you running short on funds again? You used to save people without expecting payment. They could give it or not. Have you switched to the spectator's pathway? Lumian teased, nodding in agreement. The special contract I mentioned involves sacrificing 100,000 Vroldor worth of gold within a set time frame after the pact is made. 100,000 Vroldor? Jenna's understanding of monetary matters had undergone quite a transformation since entering the world of mysticism. Based on what she knew, even someone like Seal didn't possess as much liquid wealth as her. Yet, he dared to accumulate a debt of 100,000 Vroldor just for a contract granting access to those special abilities. 
Franca clicked her tongue and inquired, Why didn't you teleport us right to the door from the start? The basement door wasn't closed then, so no mishaps would have occurred. Don't you think it's more dramatic to do it at the last moment? Lumian retorted with a question. Naturally, the actual reason was that he had recently gained the ability to traverse the spirit world and hadn't ingrained a reflex to use it. When the pitch-black wooden door in the basement shut, he had been hesitant to attempt teleporting for fear of it failing. Later, Franca successfully completed her magic mirror divination. Through it, Lumian confirmed his ability to remain connected to the outside world within the seal, which allowed him to make the definitive teleportation. Amid Franca and Jenna's baffled expressions, Lumian massaged his aching head and announced, Let's find an inn. I need to rest and restore my spirituality. Okay. Franca wasn't in a hurry to secure an inn. Instead, she turned into an empty alley and produced an ornate makeup mirror. Why are you using divination? Jenna queried inquisitively. Franca's lips curled into a smile. I'm using it to divine the reflection in my other mirror. Seeing Jenna's perplexity, she elucidated, I left a small mirror that looks like a shard outside that basement. With that, Franca caressed the mirror and chanted an incantation. Before long, the mirror projected an image, Sal Lent, the mystic potion store proprietor, stood before the pitch-black wooden door, his posture hunched as he cried out, Only death endures forever. Chapter 322, Pleasure Only death endures forever? Lumian and Jenna struggled to grasp the gravity of the situation unfolding before them. Their attention turned towards Franca. Franca observed as Sal Lent bowed and offered his prayers before departing from the dimly lit basement. The mirror's enigmatic display dissolved into darkness, marking the end of the divination. She spoke contemplatively, he seems to be from the Numinous Episcopate. Numinous Episcopate? Lumian, who had encountered references to this secret organization within Aurora's Grimoires, knew that it originated from the royal lineage of the Balam Empire on the southern continent and ancient death believers. The organization's mission seemed to involve awakening or reviving death while expelling colonists to restore the Balam Empire to its former glory. Aurora's knowledge of the Numinous Episcopate was somewhat superficial, lacking details about prominent figures, rituals, or specific practices. The Numinous Episcopate? Jenna's lack of familiarity was apparent in her voice. Franca proceeded to provide a succinct overview of the Numinous Episcopate's background, aligning with Lumian's understanding. She concluded, in the Southern Continent, the Numinous Episcopate holds a comparable status to the Rose School of Thought. Although they don't resort to blood sacrifices or terrorism like some secret faith-based organizations, rituals are inherent to their nature. The Numinous Episcopate's pursuit of death's revival necessitates sacrificial rites. Right, the Numinous Episcopate's leader is a demigod nicknamed Pale Empress. Pale Empress? Given the Numinous Episcopate's similarity in strength to the Rose School of Thought, it's plausible that Pale Empress is an angel. Lumian rubbed his head lacking the energy to analyze further. Jenna's gaze shifted toward the Highland Mystic Potion Shop, her confusion evident. Why would the shop owner, in Antision, join the Numinous Episcopate? The Numinous Episcopate's goal was to eradicate colonists and rebuild the Balam Empire. Intus was one of the colonial powers established in West Balam. Salent, though having lived in the southern continent for over a decade and reaping the rewards of being an Antision, found himself in a puzzling predicament. His allegiance to the Numinous Episcopate, despite these benefits, raised questions. Salet wasn't one of the lowest-class denizens of Trier like Jenna who didn't have a clear concept of colonial interests. Franca muttered, who knows? Numerous possibilities exist. Enforced conversion after being captured, manipulation by mysterious forces, Gradual enticement with escalating benefits leading to devout belief, or a transformative experience thanks to being rescued by a kind death believer. In any case, the Numinous Episcopate displays cunning by employing a genuine Northern Continent native to operate a mystical potion shop, peddle mummies, and act as an inconspicuous spy. Their strategy appears well orchestrated, defying easy suspicion. 
observing Lumian's weariness, Franca decided to not delve further. She located a nearby inn and secured lodgings for them. Upon Lumian's awakening, sunlight streamed through the glass window, casting a warm glow on Franca and Jenna, who were seated at the table. The sky was serene, adorned with fluffy clouds resembling wisps of cotton. Franca and Jenna savored a burrito seasoned with spices, enveloping succulent beef and mutton, while Lumian indulged in a plate of roasted onions, potatoes, corn, and assorted meats. A sweet corn-based beverage graced their table, emanating a delightful aroma. As Lumian sat up, a chuckle escaped his lips. Looks like you two had quite the time. Munching on her food, Franca mumbled, I don't often venture to the Star Highlands, and I accomplished what I set out to do. Naturally, it's time to unwind. What's this called? It's called. Damn it, forget it. You get the idea. Despite a prolonged attempt, Franca struggled to articulate her thoughts in the appropriate language. Eventually, she abandoned the effort, prioritizing her meal. Jenna gestured to her right. We brought you some lunch. A strip of fried beef, coated with a crimson sauce exuding a subtle alcoholic aroma, lay before Lumian. I figured you might be hesitant to venture out due to the language barrier, Lumian admitted, promptly satisfying his hunger. He had previously realized that only a minority of the locals understood Intision, and even then, only on a basic level for rudimentary communication. Franca, swallowing a bite of burrito, sipped on a cup of steaming corn juice. Body language is universal. Jenna added with a grin, Franca's gestures are truly something to behold. She even mimics pig squeals, cow moose, and sheep bleats to communicate her meat preferences to vendors unfamiliar with Intision. Yet, the nobles here are a departure from my expectations. They appear more akin to northern continent counterparts than their southern continent peers. In this relaxed ambience, the trio enjoyed a leisurely lunch, recounting their escapades as if they were on an authentic holiday. Under the cover of night, within the Le Marque du Cartier du Gentleman district, nestled at wrist docks, an abandoned building stood, a site Lumian had previously set ablaze. Cognizant of the potential disturbances that advancements within an apartment might trigger among nearby residents, Franca heeded Lumian's advice and selected this vacant location. Promptly erecting a wall of spirituality, Franca collected the ashes of the incinerated mummy, thanks to Lumian, along with the other requisite ingredients. Meanwhile, Lumian and Jenna maintained a careful distance, intently observing as Franca adroitly mixed the ingredients and consumed the potion. A brief hush enveloped the scene, then Franca's visage twisted in anguish. Almost instantly, her flaxen hair, formerly bound in a ponytail, broke free of its constraints. Propelled by an invisible force, the hair drifted and extended, resembling a radiant web expanding in all directions. More ethereal strands emerged, dense and elongated. Swiftly, they populated the space embraced by the wall of spirituality, fashioning a spectral woodland of filaments. Once again, Jenna bore witness to the mystifying and surreal attributes of the potion, while obscured by the burgeoning hair. Alongside Lumian, she patiently awaited the anomaly to subside. Whether this passage of time spanned dozens of seconds or stretched beyond two minutes, the ethereal flaxen hair finally withdrew, returning to Franca's form. With a jubilant countenance, Franca pivoted to face her companions, her limpid eyes radiating contentment. Everything went quite seamlessly. I'm anticipating future advancements to be quite cumbersome and challenging. Curiously, Jenna found Franca's flowery blouse and off-white breeches harmonizing impeccably with her demeanor for the first time. The attire seemed to accentuate an ineffable allure, evoking a blush and a warmth in Jenna's ears, despite her own femininity. On the other hand, Lumian experienced an unfamiliar and unwanted warmth and reaction. As Franca acclimated to the powers of the demoness of pleasure, Lumian and Jenna's racing hearts eventually steadied, restoring a semblance of normality. Concluding their task and dismantling the spiritual barrier, Franca rejoined them, sporting a radiant smile. Her eyes shimmered akin to a lake glinting with reflected light. How much of an improvement are we talking about? Lumian posed a direct question. A rough comprehension of the situation would facilitate better teamwork. 
Franca's eyes danced playfully as she responded, a grin adorning her face. Take a guess. I'm not a demoness. How can I guess? Lumian's retort barely left his lips before he frowned. An intangible force had coiled around his legs and body. Then, with a sudden rush, Lumian's form was engulfed in crimson flames that erupted from within him, engulfing the enigmatic threads. Only now did Lumian and Jenna perceive the intangible tendrils, tinted in fiery hues resembling translucent spider silk. Amidst her amusement, Franca inquired of Lumian and Jenna with a mischievous glint, Do you understand now? Perhaps you'd like to explore another? No. No need. In unison, Jenna and Lumian retorted, their voices echoing their apprehension. Franca maintained her smile, suggesting, Are you truly certain you don't wish to give it a try? I assure you, a mere touch can envelop you in true pleasure. Damn it. Jenna instinctively retreated a step, her expletive punctuating her reaction. Lumian regarded Franca, grappling with whether she was indeed teasing him or harboring some genuine intent. Yes, the target should be Jenna. I can't rule out the possibility of using simple contact to embarrass me. As Lumian's thoughts raced, Franca suddenly composed herself and said seriously, in addition to the two I mentioned earlier, my proficiency in black fire, frost, curse, and mirror magic has all been elevated. Their integration has expanded as well. For instance, I can utilize a mirror to focus on a target and employ black fire to enact the curse. Another scenario involves my utilization of mirror substitution and staff substitution to counteract fatal harm while gaining some measure of recuperation. My capabilities as an assassin and instigator have also been enhanced. She succinctly summarized her advancements without delving into particulars. Lumian nodded, mulling over Franca's capabilities. He inquired thoughtfully, Do you possess a charm like ability too? Franca's smile hinted at an answer but she chose to remain silent. Jenna observed Franca for a moment and then noted something else, pointing at her and remarking, you've become even more beautiful. Franca's individual features and overall appearance had transcended any imperfections. Her demeanor radiated an undeniable brilliance, a striking, flamboyant beauty that demanded no disguise. Is that so? Franca responded, her surprise evident. Lumian couldn't resist stroking his chin, pondering whether Madame Hidden Blade would genuinely switch to Iron Blooded Knight when going from Sequence 5 to Sequence 4. As Lumian bade Franca and Jenna farewell and embarked on his return to Aubert's Du Coke door, a sudden realization swept over him. He lowered his voice and inquired, Temaboros, what's the next boon after Contract T? Yet, Termaboros remained silent, offering no reply. Lumian let out a scoff. It's fine. Once I locate the Padre, he'll divulge the information. Although his confidence might waver internally, maintaining an outward appearance of assurance was essential in times like these. The day of the prophesied event arrived swiftly. In Cartier de la Princesse Rouge, at the crossroads of Rue de la Mireille and Rue du Cheval Blanc, Lumian disembarked from a public carriage with a casual grace. Clad in a white shirt, a black vest, brown trousers, and sleek leather shoes, he cast his gaze upon the slumbering neighborhood that lay ahead. Chapter 323 Psychological Profile Lumian stood at an intersection, his hands casually tucked into his pockets as he strolled leisurely toward Rue de la Mireille. This street held more significance to the people of Trier than even the renowned Avenue du Boulevard. It was their aspiration. In the days before Emperor Roselle ignited the Industrial Revolution, Trier's cityscape hadn't sprawled to the extent it had now. It nestled in the easternmost corner, fortified by stout city walls and vigilantly guarded by soldiers. Their military encampment wasn't distant, which prompted the emergence of numerous brothels and prostitutes nearby. As the sands of time sifted through, Rue de la Mireille garnered its reputation, and Trier's population burgeoned. A modest market burgeoned into a realm of prestige and extravagance that stretched across the northern and southern continents. Lumian passed beneath the sheltering canopy of Entis parasol trees, his gaze taking in opulent palace-like structures alongside unassuming apartments. 
they all shared a common trait, windows adorned with frosted glass and the occasional green shutter. Rue de la Muraille appeared to be rousing from its midday slumber. The road hosted few pedestrians, but each one bore a distinct air. Some dashed by in somber gray-blue work attire, driven by haste, while others donned antiquated finery. They glanced around before slipping into apartment complexes. Cameras slung around necks captured candid moments before these wanderers vanished into ornate edifices. Attempts at projecting an intision facade couldn't mask true identities, betrayed by hairlines and exaggerated heights. Moreover, Lumian's keen eye caught sight of an iron gray robot, towering at two meters. A steam spewing outlet adorned its back, accompanied by gears, torsion springs, screws, and bent pipes, a symphony of decorative mechanics. Perched on the robot's left shoulder, a lavishly dressed man flaunted intricate makeup. His leisurely observation spanned pedestrians, dignitaries shrouded in gold or silver masks, and groggy men stumbling into wakefulness. Here, the ordinary and elite intertwined in a peculiar harmony. As Lumian advanced, he methodically surveyed his surroundings, his gaze unrelenting in its pursuit of his target. In a flash, he spotted Albus approaching from a side alley. The Iron and Blood Cross Order member, sporting dark red locks, acknowledged Lumian with a sly grin. He lifted his right hand, pointed at his own head, provocation in motion. Under Gardner Martin's directive, Albus was tasked with tracking down Padre Guillaume Benet. It seemed Albus was insinuating a competition of sorts, pitting Lumian against himself to see who'd uncover the prey first. Beyond Albus, the Iron and Blood Cross Order likely deployed several official or peripheral affiliates. In this, Gardner Martin had kept his promises. Undeterred by Albus's gesture, Lumian pressed on, deeper into Rue de la Muraille. Guided by the revelations of Demonis of Pleasure Franca's magic mirror divination, the prophecy's domain narrowed, Guillaume Benet's presence was expected on five streets, including Rue de la Muraille and Rue du Cheval Blanc, within the week. However, Rue de la Muraille's length, its expanse, and the thronging populace created a nebulous landscape for Lumian's quest. Carpet searches and widespread net casting was virtually impossible. Success hinged on the possibility of enlisting aid from the authorities and mustering an army to seal off this domain, vigilantly guarding every entrance to underground trier. Previously, Lumian could only hope that the Iron and Blood Cross Order, a secret organization teeming with formidable hunters, boasted superior tracking and manhunt techniques. Or perhaps, Termoboros, an inevitability angel, might drive them to converge. As long as the distance between Lumian and Guillaume Benet was moderate, they would reunite as though preordained. However, a new trail had emerged. This advancement was predominantly the fruit of the mystical knowledge he had acquired as a contractee. Within this trove of knowledge lay a menagerie of uncanny creatures, summonable or recruitable, complete with the requisite costs for forging contracts. The compendium detailed the abilities obtainable and the subsequent penalties incurred post-contract. Merging the exhibition of Guillaume Benet's contractual capabilities from his memory and dream, Lumian pieced together a fragment of insight, summoning abyss demon flowers necessitates a sacrifice of fresh human blood. The downside, an increased desire for coitus. Invisibility mandates thirteen portions of prepared meat. The downside, an intensified susceptibility to hunger. Slow flight sacrifices one's romantic infatuation perpetually. The downside, an urge to show off. Bone curse predicates the sacrifice of a living person. The downside, drowsiness. The soul assimilation mystic spell exacts no fewer than three human souls. The downside, random bouts of dizziness, numbering four to five daily. Internal explosion demands the sacrifice of any beyonder characteristic. The downside, unrelenting spirituality drain, tantamount to permanent reduction of spirituality capacity. From the detailed description of the soul assimilation mystic spell, Lumian conjectured that the Padre had inadvertently met an additional, covert cost. That was his name. The soul assimilation mystic spell affected the target's spirit body by invocating their true name, causing them to experience dizziness and other reactions, amplified by deeper comprehension of the target and employment of verbiage echoing the spirit world. 
In contracting with a spirit world entity armed with the soul assimilation mystic spell, Guillaume Binet inadvertently disclosed his true name. Entities endowed with such powers could wield a person's true name for manifold feats, a potentially profound latent hazard. This clandestine peril was merely one amid numerous akin enigmas housed within a contractee's mystic wisdom. Therefore, Lumian opted for an extensive screen of spirit world creatures, personal interaction followed by experimental engagement. Based upon the known downsides accompanying the contracted abilities, Lumian hatched an educated hypothesis. After Guillaume Benet, a man driven by insatiable desires, found his appetite for sex surging, he had definitely sought out women. The prophecy's alignment with Cartier de la Princesse Rouge harmonized with the results unearthed from the magic mirror divination about the five nearby streets. Furthermore, he found his hunger more voracious than ever, and the act of intimacy left him drained of vigor. Thus, the likelihood was high that he would gravitate towards a brothel that catered to both carnal and culinary needs or invite a woman back home. Guillaume Benet was not only a man of fervent desires, but also an ambitious soul, thirsting for power. Being confined in the village and before the contractual abilities imbued his life with adverse effects, his lust mirrored an expression of power. Otherwise, it was impossible to explain how his desires sprawled across every woman, an inclination spanning the spectrum between esteemed paramours and those of lesser stature. To him, appropriating the companions of other men became a testament to his standing, might, and allure. Stepping onto Trier's soil, a place where his provincial accent drew disdain from the citizens, he undoubtedly sought vindication, manifesting his claims in his own unique manner. Fused with his relentless pursuit of strength and his past style, Guillaume Benet very likely went after sought-after courtesans, stoking the fires of envy amongst the local denizens. He might even spirit one or two of these coveted women away to grace his home. This comprehensive analysis of the Padre's character and psyche wasn't Lumian's solitary undertaking. Rather, it emerged from the expertise of Anthony Reed, a psychiatrist. Armed with Lumian's intricate portrayal of Guillaume Benet, Reed painted a psychological canvas, a vivid portrait of this heretic's inner workings. Thus, two distinct paths unfurled to ensnare his prey. The first entailed staking out upscale brothels, where both meals and famous courtesans awaited. The other trail veered towards investigations surrounding courtesans who had entered matrimony, taken on mistress roles, or even vanished within the past two months. For the former pursuit, the mantle rested upon the shoulders of the Iron and Blood Cross Order. Lumian's current task revolved around unearthing a conduit to intelligence about Rue de la Murelle's clandestine tales. Anthony Reed, an adept intelligence broker, held a key. He was well acquainted with Bueller, a ghost face columnist renowned for exposing scandals and whispers that wove through the fabric of Rue de la Murelle. Bueller, a connoisseur of drinking and writing, would frequent a corner of Hope Cafe where he could survey the entrance before venturing into the brothels. With his objective clear, Lumian embarked on a steady stride toward the cafe nestled amidst Rue de la Murelle. En route, he revisited the entirety of the task at hand, stirred by an indescribable emotion. His divination capabilities paled in comparison to Franca's. A lone prophecy spell rested in his arsenal, a tool he dared not wield recklessly. The finesse of Anthony Reed's psychological profiling and information-gathering expertise dwarfed Lumian's own. However, mobilizing these allies allowed him to harness these strengths, akin to gaining possession of these abilities. Lumian couldn't foretell the ramifications of ascending to godhood. Yet, one thing was certain, beneath Sequence 4, one's prowess met constraints. Cooperative squads harnessed the potential for synergy, enabling them to confront even higher sequences sans those with godhood. Soon, Lumian caught sight of Hope Cafe, its entrance adorned in a milky white veneer. After pushing open the heavy door, he cast his gaze upon the corner granting anyone a vantage point. A slender-faced man in his thirties, his ebony hair framing azure eyes, his beard trimmed meticulously and waxed to precision, met Lumian's gaze, his attention fixated on the entrance. Sensing Lumian's scrutiny, the man's visage transformed. He reached for the soft-covered notebook and crimson fountain pen upon the table, on the verge of vanishing through the back door. 
In response, Lung Lian drew his revolver and dispatched a shot toward the cafe's rear exit. With a resounding bang, the bullet embedded itself into the wood. The cafe's patrons were jolted into alarm, their reactions oscillating between concealment and inquiry, engendering chaos. The bearded man stood immobilized, neither sure if he should run or stay. Under the collective gaze of bartender, patrons, and staff, Lumian advanced toward his target, revolver in hand, amusement playing across his features. Are you Monsieur Bueller? Yes, that's me. Bueller forced a smile. Lumian gestured toward Bueller's original seat and spoke nonchalantly, take a seat. I've come to purchase information. A sigh of relief escaped Bueller as he hunched, retracing his steps to settle into the chair. Lumian occupied the opposite seat, putting down his revolver. With a trace of playfulness, he queried, why the preference for such a dim corner? Bueller sighed and said, in my line of work, reprisals are a constant concern. You're well aware that some individuals detest seeing their names or likenesses entangled in the web of scandals across newspapers and periodicals. This corner grants me an unobstructed view of the entrance, affording early detection of any potential troublemakers. And, should the need arise, I can effect a swift escape through the back. Chapter 324, Which is True and Which is False After a brief mention of the reason for selecting his seat, Bueller glanced up at Lung Mian, a self-deprecating smile on his lips. I didn't expect you to open fire so quickly. Lung Mian's hand rested casually on the revolver by his side as he offered a faint smile in return. It seems the folks you've encountered before are law-abiding citizens. Bueller's instincts, honed from past experiences of being beaten, urged him to retort. But as he compared Lumian's demeanor with those of his previous encounters, he found a strange logic in the man's words. Thanks to the shelter of the law, he, a columnist for Ghost Face, had managed to survive up to this point. Are you not afraid of attracting the police? Bueller turned to look at the waiter, who dared not approach with the menu and drink list. Firing a gun in a place like this isn't a minor incident. Someone should have already alerted the authorities. Lumian chuckled. That's why we have to hurry. His words punctuated by deliberate actions, Lumian picked up his revolver, rotated the cylinder, and slotted a yellow cartridge into the empty chamber, right before Bueller's eyes. I want to know which courtesans have left Rue de la Mireille, this haven of extravagance, in the last two months, Lumian inquired with a calm resolve. Instinctively, Bueller shook his head. They aren't true courtesans. Those women possess their lavish residences and permanent paramours. They frequent high society, wielding influence over industries and policies with their words alone. This place merely acts as a reserve for courtesans. I'm only interested in those who fit my description. Lumian dismissed the specifics of courtesanship. Bueller's gaze flickered between the revolver and Lumian's grip and said, recollecting, four of them. Lil Jort wed a Lowen merchant and relocated to Backlund. White Vase Sophie became the lover of Member of Parliament Battis, attending high society banquets and salons. She had a chance of becoming a true courtesan. Du Rose Mary fell victim to mental illness and mutilated her face with scissors one morning. She's confined to an asylum. Condiment beauty Paulina vanished from Rue de la Mireille without a trace, as though whisked away by someone of status. As Bueller recounted, he noticed the dashing figure before him, ready to fire at the slightest provocation, producing a post-it note and a fountain pen, meticulously jotting down notes. Swallowing unease, he continued, I encountered Paulina on Rue Vincent not long ago. She seemed well off, with a four-wheeled carriage, a maid, a valet, and even a butler. Sadly, I had pressing matters then and failed to determine her place of residence. Rue Vincent. Lumian's memory jogged. It was one of the five streets Franca had divined. Farthest from Rue de la Mireille, it exuded a quieter, upscale aura. Based on Bueller's account, he suspected Paulina had become Guillaume Benet's paramour. For a fugitive, a prospective courtesan proved a safer choice than frequenting Rue de la Mireille. Guillaume Benet was intelligent and capable. 
his present yearnings for intimacy and his voracious hunger hadn't rendered him a mindless imbecile. He would surely opt for a less risky strategy. Just then, hurried footsteps resonated outside the cafe as three police officers neared the entrance. Cooley, Lumi and Donna's dark blue cap, stashed his note and pen, and slid fifty verl door notes onto the table before Bueller. With these tasks accomplished, he reclaimed his revolver, stood up, and proceeded to the cafe's rear door. Swiftly, he opened it and departed. Bang! The police officers burst into Hope Cafe through its main entrance. On the elegant street of Rue Vincent, stately villa-like houses adorned both sides of the road. The road was wide and well-kept, with only occasional pedestrians and carriages passing through. After Lumian turned into the street, he found himself at a loss. He couldn't infiltrate every house and search every room, could he? Besides, he wasn't the most suitable candidate for this kind of investigation. Franca would be better suited for it, but involving her was risky. After a brief contemplation, Lumian allowed a smile to grace his features. He strolled toward one of the houses and pressed the doorbell. A young valet opened the dark brown door. His appearance suggested no trace of southern continent lineage, and he gazed at Lumian in bewilderment. In a clear Triarian accent, he inquired, Sir, how may I assist you? With an amiable grin, Lumian replied, I'm here to inquire about the most splendid madam residing on this street. Dot. The valet was momentarily speechless. This was the first instance he'd encountered someone seeking such peculiar information. Or perhaps not. While such matters were whispered about behind closed doors and boasted about in taverns, there were occasionally individuals who exhibited curiosity about such affairs. However, who would approach a stranger's door in the sweltering sun to inquire? What was this person up to? Before the valet could react, Lumian produced a ten verl door note and offered it with a genial demeanor. The valet's eyelids twitched. He hesitated for a moment before accepting the payment. He suspected this young man to be a counterfeit dandyist, specialized in duping affluent ladies of their bodies and riches. The appearance and conduct matched the descriptions found in newspapers. However, if the lady wasn't the valet's mistress or lady, why refuse the reward? When the stranger acquired what he sought, a certain madam would also receive some gratification. The valet cast a furtive glance around before lowering his voice. The lady in Unit 50 is exquisitely beautiful. A genuine Triarian, she married a foreigner from the southern lands. That accent. As the valet spoke, he shook his head with a mixture of indignation and scorn, as if he had harbored this sentiment for some time. Lumian's smile broadened. Indeed, under the sway of his burgeoning impulses, the padre couldn't resist sharing his prize with the neighbors, a stunning Triarian courtesan. He might not host grand banquets or waltz to proclaim his conquest, nor would he escort his lover for a public appearance. Nonetheless, he would inevitably find subtle ways to make his neighbors aware that even foreigners could possess resplendent courtesans as mistresses. At times like this, Guillaume Benet had to exercise prudence in disguising himself. However, his mistress's beauty wasn't something easily concealed. She might even meticulously dress herself to exhibit her remarkable presence. Of course, Lumian couldn't be certain if the lady was Paulina, the presumed mistress. Yet, the gradual collection of anticipated information through bold assumptions and careful confirmation made him feel he was steadily closing in on Guillaume Benet. Beyond the gates of 50 Rue Vincent, Lumian glanced at the facade as an ordinary passerby might. The three-story base structure stood before him, surrounded by a lush green lawn and a garden vibrant with colors. A gardener tended to the greenery, offering a partial view. Lumian promptly averted his gaze from the building's pillar, wary that prolonged observation could arouse suspicion. As for any possibility of being recognized by the padre, Lumian held no concern. Prior to setting out, he had employed Nee's face to alter his appearance and communicated to his companions that it was due to cosmetics. Lumian's striking appearance, a fusion of golden and black hair, could be anyone's. As long as Guillaume Benet lacked the ability to penetrate the illusion or actively employ it, it was unlikely he'd realize his pursuer had infiltrated the vicinity. 
Lumian's current plan was to leave Rue Vincent and switch places with Jenna or Franca. He would then ensconce himself in the shadows across from Unit 50, patiently observing until all suspicion around the target was dissipated. He refrained from adopting the guise of a tramp this time, given the scarcity of such individuals on this refined street. While a rare appearance might occur, these transients were promptly shooed away by the household staff. Just as he prepared to depart from the beige edifice, Lumian turned his head in a casual manner. His gaze alighted on a figure visible through the living room window. The figure stood at a modest height, barely reaching 1.7 meters. Clad in a dark shirt and black trousers, the person possessed a slightly stocky build. Their nose bore a gentle curve, and their black hair fell in a mid-length cascade. Lumian's pupils dilated for a fleeting moment before swiftly returning to their normal state. A wisp of a smile tugged at the corners of his lips, and an invisible fire seemed to ignite in his eyes. Despite the adept disguise, Lumian would recognize him even if he were reduced to ashes. It was Guillaume Benet, the Padre of Cordu. Lumian wrestled to contain his surprise, his gaze staring onward. Simultaneously, his mind raced as he evaluated the next course of action to undertake. Before long, he reached the end of Rue Vincent. At that very juncture, a parrot adorned with green and white feathers took flight from Rue de la Mireille and perched itself on Lumian's shoulder. It chirped excitedly, we've located the target. Located the target? Then who did I just see? Another padre? Lumian was momentarily flabbergasted and perplexed. Which one was the genuine Guillaume Benet? Had he erred in judgment, or had the Iron and Blood Cross Order and Rat Cristo been deceived? Fifteen minutes earlier, at the Dill Brothel on Rue de la Mireille. Within the annex bar on the first floor, Albus savored his landy proof while discreetly observing the attendants, laborers, and the overseer who managed the establishment. His assessment encompassed the clientele as well, but it yielded nothing of note. Many concealed their identities by donning assorted masks, making it nearly impossible to unveil their true selves. Having gained a preliminary insight into the inner workings of the dill brothel, Albus seized the chance to make his way toward the washroom. He veered onto the path leading to the kitchen when an attendant approached, carrying a collection of post-it notes. This attendant's responsibility encompassed recording the requirements of each room and relaying orders to the kitchen. Albus, marked by his dark red hair, advanced and retrieved a handful of glistening coins along with a substantial bundle of banknotes from his pocket. The attendant's features twisted into a blend of perplexity and intrigue. Albus smiled and said, I'm on the hunt for a scoundrel. Uncertain about his guise, I'm merely aware he shares your build and possesses a penchant for consorting with the most celebrated ladies. Post-exertion, he seeks sustenance to satiate his hunger immediately. If you're able to furnish me with the relevant particulars, all this is yours. Chapter 325, Visit The attendant's gaze locked onto the handful of gold coins and the banknotes, their unique ink fragrance captivating his senses. He couldn't help but hold his breath, caught in the allure of the treasure before him. After a few heart-pounding moments, he swiftly surveyed the area, ensuring no prying eyes were nearby. Gradually, a sense of relief washed over him. All, all of it. The attendant's voice quivered as he swallowed with difficulty. With a precise flick of his wrist, Albus tossed a gold coin worth five verl d'or into the attendant's waiting palm. A confident smile tugged at his lips as he spoke, that depends on the value of the information you provide. Rest assured, you'll receive another twenty verl d'or, no matter what. The attendant gingerly bit the gold coin, stealing a glance back at the path they had traversed. His voice dropped to a hushed tone as he shared, just as you surmised, the man from the south, in room two on the sixth floor, frequents the company of the most renowned courtesans. He possesses a penchant for pre-ordering his meals, which we dutifully deliver to his quarters every half hour. A southerner with a penchant for famous courtesans and a habit of pre-ordered meals. Room 602. Albus wasn't one to skimp on appreciation. He tossed two ten-verl-door coins, etched with the likeness of a warship, to the attendant. 
Seizing the calmness on Rue de la Mireille, Albus covertly ascended to the sixth floor, concealing himself on the balcony at the corridor's far end. Within mere minutes, the attendant tasked with meal deliveries arrived at room 602, carried by a steam-powered mechanical elevator. A silver-white metal serving cart accompanied him. Carefully, he pressed the doorbell. Albus straightened up, aligning his view with room 602's entrance. His gaze intensified. The door swung open, revealing a man of slight stature, not exceeding 1.7 meters. His attire comprised a pitch-black half-mask, a crisp white shirt, and pale-hued boxer shorts. Removing his trousers but leaving his upper attire on. Concealing tattoos, perhaps? The more Albus observed, the stronger his conviction that the occupant of room 602 matched the likeness of Guillaume Benet from the wanted posters. Abstaining from disturbing his quarry, Albus settled back into a white-paneled armchair on the balcony. From his pocket emerged a grey-furred rat, one of Beast Tamer Christo's pets. Lumian had engaged the services of the rat, his abilities allowing easy communication and efficient coordination among team members. Naturally, Christo served as the intermediary and the translator. Albus tenderly patted the rat's head, signaling it with a gesture, a thumb and index finger forming a ring, with the remaining fingers raised. This signified the discovery of the prime suspect. With a high-pitched squeak, the rat darted from Albus's grasp, off to find its owner at a nearby tavern. Upon learning from Christo's pet parrot that members of the Iron and Blood Cross Order had located the Padre, Lumian found himself plunged into a momentary maelstrom of shock and confusion. Had they truly found Guillaume Benet? Then, who did I see? If the occupant of 50 Rue Vincent is Guillaume Benet, where did the counterfeit they see come from? In the whirlwind of his thoughts, a realization struck Lumian with the force of lightning. Substitution Spell Guillaume Benet must have enacted the substitution spell ritual. It was one of the five specialized ritualistic magics Lumian had acquired as an alms monk. The Padre, now a sequence five fate appropriator, was evidently familiar with it. This ritual enabled the user to choose another person to inhabit their identity for a period upon sensing impending danger. By gaining the genuine or fake approval of those around them and establishing a strong mystical connection, a ritual could then finalize the switch. If the substitution spell succeeded, the stand-in would be indistinguishable from the original in the eyes of others, although their self-awareness and performance might be compromised to a degree. Nevertheless, their core identity would remain. When the substitute faced imminent disaster, the one who cast the substitution spell could alter their own fate, thus avoiding the impending calamity. Of course, this hinged on the substitute being kept unaware of the impending danger. While this ruse could prove effective on other beyonders, Lumian was well acquainted with the circumstances surrounding the substitution spell. Thus, he couldn't be easily deceived. For Lumian, the paramount issue at hand was this, which individual was the true Guillaume Benet, and which was the substitute? To deal a decisive blow to the Padre and apprehend him with minimal casualties, Lumian needed to consolidate his forces and make a choice. He couldn't attack both entities simultaneously. Gardner Martin had merely agreed to assist in locating the prey, without extending further support. Consequently, the majority of individuals dispatched by the Iron and Blood Cross Order were low-sequence beyonders or even regular people. If Lumian opted to solicit Gardner Martin's aid, it might take hours for the Iron and Blood Cross Order to assemble sufficient reinforcements. Guillaume Benet didn't possess limitless endurance, and the courtesan wasn't a demoness of pleasure who could allow an extended encounter. He would definitely be gone by then. The question remains, what decision would Guillaume Benet make? Would he have the substitute remain at the residence to divert danger while he ventured out for personal pursuits? Alternatively, would he dispatch the substitute to showcase his characteristic behavior, drawing danger away from himself? Lumian found both scenarios challenging to dismiss. After deliberation, his gaze shifted to the green and white parrot. He addressed it, locate Red Boots Franca and ask her to divine the authenticity of the Guillaume Benet at 50 Rue Vincent and the one present here. The parrot stared at Lumian as if questioning his sanity. I'm just a parrot. What I said is too complicated. 
It can't understand or memorize everything. Lumian swiftly arrived at a decision. Guide me to Red Boots Franca. Actually, first lead me to Cristo. Time remained on their side. The individual at 50 Rue Vincent couldn't elude them. The team responsible for the mission could convene briefly, exchanging essential information. In the shadows they lingered, while their foes roamed in plain sight. As long as they didn't startle the targets, they could afford to wait. Of course, they had to conclude before Guillaume Benet's deed with the courtesan reached its conclusion. After all, tailing an individual posed inherent risks, especially when dealing with the Padre and his array of bizarre and unfamiliar abilities. In a narrow alley near Rue de la Mireille, the afternoon sun cast its radiant touch upon the mostly dismantled barricade, while even the breeze seemed to take a momentary pause. Franca, now garbed in an assassin's attire, and Jenna, disguised as a female mercenary, rendezvoused with Anthony Reed, still clad in his military green attire, and Lumian, sporting a cap, a black vest, and a white shirt. Lumian delivered a succinct briefing, omitting details about the substitution spell due to time constraints, referring to it merely as a form of witchcraft capable of generating lifelike substitutes. Before Lumian could inquire further, Franca retrieved a mirror from her possession. As her fingers grazed the surface, she intoned an incantation. Soon, an aqueous luminescence radiated from the mirror, accompanied by an aged voice. They are both real. Both real. Franca turned to Lumian in surprise. The witchcraft responsible for creating the substitute proves potent, resembling the original down to appearance and fate. Conventional divination methods stand powerless against such deception. Both real. Lumian had anticipated this response and had already devised an alternative course of action. Sensing his silence, Franca drew a deep breath, hesitatingly suggesting, Do, do you need me to consult another source? She aimed to seek confirmation from the entity renowned for unerring divination. Yet, this approach risked unveiling a question that could render her socially deceased before Jenna, Lumian, and Anthony Reed. She envisioned the other party asking, do you often entertain the idea of doing the deed with Jenna? How would she navigate her future interactions with Jenna? Lumian shook his head, asserting, no need. I have a plan. Turning his attention to Jenna, he directed, conceal yourself in the shadows diagonally across from room 602 in Dill. Keep a vigilant watch on that Guillaume Benet's activities. If he concludes his affairs and prepares to depart, but we haven't arrived yet, refrain from impulsive pursuit. Instead, discreetly monitor his movements from a distance and deduce his chosen path. Understood. Jenna nodded, mentally rehearsing her upcoming task. Lumian shifted his focus to Franca and Anthony Reed. Let's proceed to 50 Rue Vincent together. I'll directly confront Guillaume Benet. Franca, maintain invisibility and follow me closely. We mustn't launch an attack until we're certain of his authenticity. Anthony, secure the perimeter outside. If the Guillaume Benet on Rue Vincent proves to be counterfeit and we hasten to Dill, covertly monitor the madam there, tracking her movements. In case Guillaume Benet manages an escape, she could serve as a pivotal lead for subsequent pursuit. If the 50 Rue Vincent counterpart is genuine and a skirmish erupts, approach discreetly and provide reinforcement. Franca harbored no objections to this arrangement. Aware of Lumian's teleportation abilities, she grasped that once he confirmed the Rue Vincent Guillaume is fake, he could facilitate swift transition for the primary combatants to the opposite location, preventing the two Guillaumes from exchanging information. Assessing the calculated risks, Anthony endorsed the plan, confirming his willingness to execute his designated role. 50 Rue Vincent, near the beige three story building. Observing Franca's seamless invisibility, Lumian raised his right hand and swept it across his face. In an instant, he transformed into a man in his thirties, attired in a black uniform with an inspector's epaulette. Me's face! Satisfied with his condition, Lumian proceeded to the designated building and pressed the doorbell. The door swung open, revealing a man garbed as a butler. His gaze landed on Lumian as he inquired with a touch of confusion, Officer, how may I assist you? 
I'm here regarding a missing vagrant case linked to this street. I'd appreciate a conversation with your master, Lumian nonchalantly fabricated. A subtle shift occurred in the butler's expression. Please wait a moment, officer. I shall inquire with our master. After a brief pause, the butler returned to the doorway, addressing Lumian, Officer, our master invites you to the small parlor on the ground floor. Lumian offered a slight nod and trailed the butler into the abode at 50 Rue Vincent. The living area exuded spaciousness, hosting a bluish-gray cat huddled in one corner, its presence accompanied by the ceaseless chirping of caged birds. Positioned in the aisle, a black dog, reminiscent of a hound, remained seated, its gaze unwaveringly fixated on the unfamiliar entrant. Circumventing an elegant sofa, the butler led Lumian into a parlor towards the rear. There, a man with midnight hair, azure eyes, and a slightly hooked nose reclined in an armchair. He sported a dark-hued shirt and black trousers, his demeanor one of relaxed arrogance as he gently caressed the head of a sizable brown fur dog. Officer, in what way may I be of assistance? The man inquired, rising with deliberate languor. It's him, Guillaume Benet. Padre Guillaume Benet. Lumian's pupils contracted, closing the distance to a mere five meters. Then, he parted his lips and voiced, Ha! Action was the sole path to distinguishing the genuine from the imposter.